he's a uh, you know, he's running for one of the two uncontested seats other than, you know, unless uh, we have a large riding campaign, which doesn't usually occur. And then we have uh, Katie Kester, who is, uh, I think I saw here this morning. She's over here, Robert. And uh, I'm going to give uh, her a chance to just say a few words about uh, introduce herself to the group here and uh, talk a little bit about her interest in the board. Thank you. I was told to keep it to 60 seconds, but please don't time me. I want to tell you a little bit about who I am and a little bit about why I'm interested in serving on the board of this great organization. Uh, so I'll start with who I am. My name is Katie Kester, and I'm the Engineering and Public Works Director for the City and Borough of Juneau. Uh, what I love about my job is we're the Department of Doing, Building Things, Fixing Things, and Getting Things Done. So we have Streets and Fleet, Capital Transit, uh, Water and Wastewater Utility, and Engineering Division that does a lot of the uh, projects that you see in the capital city. Why am I passionate about Southeast Conference and joining this amazing diverse group of people getting things done? I really believe that government should play a role in providing the basic infrastructure that uh, business needs to thrive. And I think that the artists across the state and especially Southeast Conference do a wonderful job of bringing us all together so we can make that happen. Um, I uh, do have experience serving on the on KPED. If any of you met Tim Dillon, who was here yesterday, he's the executive director there on the KPED board and getting some fun stuff done on the Kenai Peninsula when I lived there. So I'm excited to uh, bring that experience uh, to a new region and uh, really appreciate your support. Uh, thank you, Katie. So, uh, so those are two uh, public northern seats. Dennis Gray and Katie Kester are, uh, and both seats are open. The uh, for our southern private seats this year, we have on the ballot uh, Marco Shear, who is uh, uh, in a current board member and may or may not be here already this morning. He's been seen, and we'll hear from him a little later. So we'll torture well, he, him. Yeah, I think we're going to hear a little bit from Marcos later, and many of us know him already from being on the board. And I think he was president last year. the uh, The other uh, person on the ballot for the southern private seat is Gracia O'Connell. Well, good morning, everybody. Did you have enough coffee? I'm only on my first cup. Well, my name is Gracia O'Connell, and I grew up here in Southeast Alaska. And then as many of us do after graduating high school, we said, I wanna go to the big city. So I've lived up in Anchorage for about 20 years. And then two years ago, during a pandemic, I decided to move back to Southeast Alaska. And if anybody wants to move to Southeast Alaska during a pandemic, my recommendation is just don't do that. It's, it's already a logistical nightmare to relocate to this area, as I'm sure many of you are aware, and adding a pandemic is just, it, I guess what it really means is I really wanted to come home. And I worked hard to do that. Today, I am very proud to be serving as the Vice President of Operations for Tongass Federal Credit Union. If you're not aware of the wonderful things that we are doing at Tongass Federal Credit Union, we are in these small communities, in some of our most financially vulnerable communities in Southeast Alaska, bringing financial services and education. I am very passionate about financial service education to some of these small communities because I grew up there. I want to serve on this board because I want to bring a lifetime of experience of living and playing and serving in this region and bring that lifetime of experience to a seat at the table. All right, thank you. Thank you, Gracia. All right, so I think at this point, uh, uh, rather than me taking up too much time here, uh, if you guys in the back, if you're able to poll up, we have a video address from uh, Senator Sullivan, and then uh, and then we'll move on with the agenda after that.
Hello, Southeast Conference, and hello, Ketchikan. I was with all, all of you in one of my favorite cities in all of America, let alone Alaska and Ketchikan. But, uh, we're back at work here in D.C. I don't know if that's good or bad, but I want to give you an update. But first, a shout out to Robert Vener Venerables and his whole team. Robert, thanks for the great job you and your team do. Uh, Southeast Conference is such an important organization for so many elements of not just Southeast, but our whole state. Keep up the great work. So let me give you a little update. Um, I was just home uh, for the last several weeks during our August recess. Spent a fair amount of time down in Southeast and Ketchikan and Juneau, Metlakatla, and um, a lot of important things happening. First, uh, very importantly, infrastructure. You know, uh, we were able to pass the delegation, our infrastructure bill last year, the bipartisan infra infrastructure bill. A lot that's in there that I think is going to really help the state, our state, all the different communities. Let me just mention two. Um, first, over a billion dollars over five years for new for a new essential ferry service program to serve isolated rural communities and to construct ferry boats and ferry terminals. This is a huge win. It's written in many ways, it's directed right at our state. So we look forward to working with you on implementing that important, important element of the infrastructure bill. And then next, something that I think every Alaskan can agree we have an opportunity with, and it's what I refer to as 21st century infrastructure, not just roads, ports, bridges, harbors, but broadband, internet connectivity. And we have a tremendous opportunity right now in our state with the infrastructure bill, with the Federal Communication Commission's, the FCC's Alaska plan, with the USDA Rural Connect plan, uh, with the NTIA's Tribal Window Program, we are gonna have enormous resources billions literally of dollars coming to our state uh, in the next five years with the goal of connecting every community in our state, every single community in Alaska to broadband connectivity, high-speed internet. Uh, I held a summit in Anchorage about four weeks ago, brought up all the leadership from the Federal Communications Commission, the commissioners, two of the four commissioners, all the NTIA commissioners, all focused um, on the deployment of broadband uh, federal dollars to our state. It's gonna be a great opportunity. We all need to work together, tribes, communities uh, represented by South, the Southeast Conference, so many um, other communities, the private sector, ANCs, all of us working together uh, we have this great opportunity to really connect our state once and for all in terms of internet and broadband. We look forward to working with you. The summit that we held in Anchorage was a way to kick that off. Um, the other area that I always think is a huge opportunity, but I think even more so today, there's finally an awakening in D.C., believe it or not, on the importance of critical minerals for our economy for the renewable sector of energy, for the national security and weapons that we need in America, for our de Department of Defense. All of these are things that unfortunately over the last several decades, we have become way too dependent on foreign countries for these critical minerals, especially China. That has to change. And nowhere is there more critical minerals in our country needs than in Alaska. Southeast, of course, has enormous potential in this regard, whether it's UCOR, uh, whether it's other projects in Southeast, uh, other mining uh, 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 projects that are already up and running, or projects like Donlin, Graphite Creek, Ambler. These are things that are gonna drive our economy throughout the state, but also importantly, uh, drive our national security. Uh, I have recently, held meetings with the top Department of Defense and Department of Interior officials, mentioning UCOR, mentioning these other deposits as critical to America's national security 
We're going to continue to press that, and we think there's a very uh, likelihood of great opportunities now that most of the country, most of the elected officials, Democrat and Republicans in Washington, D.C. have finally awoken to this issue of the need for critical minerals and Alaska as a storehouse of these minerals. Finally, I just wanted to mention one final thing. Um, you know, during the recess, we brought many federal officials, some senators, uh, cabinet officials, and officials in charge of our oceans, uh, the top NOAA and NIMS administrators, the top NTIA officials, as I said, for telecommunications. We brought them all over the state. One of the things that I'm very excited about when we were in Juneau, I had the head of NOAA, Dr. Spinrad, um, touring Southeast Alaska, but I made the pitch that the new Marine Debris Foundation, which is part of my Save Our Seas 2.0 legislation, proud to say that's the most comprehensive ocean cleanup legislation in the history of our country. It has a foundation that we think should be headquartered in Alaska. We made the pitch to Dr. Spinrad, the NOAA administrator while we were in Juneau, that Juneau could be a great place for this. We think that would be enormously important for our economy, for keeping Alaska the superpower of seafood, as I call it, and speaking of superpower of seafood, congratulations to Southeast Conference on your recent success for the incredibly large, almost $50 million grant from EDA and the Department of Commerce for Alaska's mariculture industry. What a great opportunity. Congratulations on that great work. We look forward to working with you on that. And then finally, you know, we just had another anniversary in terms of the September 11th terrorist attacks. And I just wanna say every time I'm in Southeast, regardless of the communities that I'm in, the patriotism that you feel in Alaska, in this part of Alaska is so strong. I was recently in Metlakatla, had the honor of attending a dedication to the new VA cemetery for our warriors and their families in Metlakatla, a community that really knows military service it was so humbling to be there, but such a great representation of Southeast Alaska. So many veterans, so much patriotism. So thank you for that. Have a great conference. I look forward, and forward to seeing all of you soon. We really appreciate the work of our delegation, Senator Sullivan, Senator Murkowski. Um, and today's the first day we've got a full compliment with uh, the Congress. Uh, I have to figure out if it's Congress person or Congressman or how we refer to uh, uh, our representative. But, uh, and she's planning on beaming in tomorrow for our candidates forum. So we're looking forward to hearing from her. Really incredibly grateful to her and grateful to um, you know, the champions that have really paved the path. And you can hear about some of that because, yes, we're celebrating some, some awesome, awesome successes. They didn't happen because, you know, those of us who just kind of showed up recently decided to toss some ideas out there. It happened because a lot of hard work went into years of planning, dedication from just champions that uh, we don't forget. Congressman Don Young is one of those uh, strong, strong supporters that uh, we certainly uh, do miss. This past year, we, uh, we also lost uh, past president, uh, Rosemary Hagevig. Uh, and uh, a strong champion for, for our communities. Just recently, um, we also heard about the passing of Carrie Sykes, who was uh, very instrumental in economic development for um, many of our rural communities. And, you know, those are the type of passionate people that really leave a mark that we want to not, not forget. Would you help me honor them by standing for just a moment of silence? Thank you.
It's truly an honor to carry the banner for so and I, I know there's others that we've lost along the way, the way as well and we, we certainly cherish the contributions and the way that they've opened doors for us. Uh, and that's all it's all part of the celebration and they they champion causes that were near to us and we continue to champion those causes. Uh, and now I'm going to invite the panel to come on up. Um, I'm so excited about this panel because it's all about investing in you, your communities, your priorities, our collective efforts over the years and developing a path forward for the region. And so we're just honored to have, I know they're coming this way, here's, okay. There's two of them, there's three of them and uh, looking for, there's, a, there we go. All right, so um, um, Mr. Gillum, yourself, and then, um, and I, and we like to we like to to lead with the private sector. It's really more than symbolic. So the private sector is really where that 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 capital and that investment uh, gets put into play. That's risks that um, the public sector's resources are targeted to help de-risk and put a playing field there that can be built upon. But even these successes that we see uh, with the Mariculture Grant and the other things that you'll hear about tomorrow, those are just kickstarters. Uh, then we want to make sure that the private sector continues to invest to carry those on. Otherwise, there's not sustainability. And so those are the sort of things that um, we need to understand. We can't just go up to any of these um, powerhouses here and say, can you write me? Well, so I'm sure people do all the time. Say, can you just write me a check? Um, but, you know, there has to be an investment to uh, invest in. And so what does that look like? What does that mean? What, sh what do we need to do to be ready for that? And again, if I read all of their bios, we, that's all we would do today. And we want to hear from them. The QR codes um, tell you all about them. They each have a very accomplished history. And you can see on the agenda there. But we're going to kick things off with Mr. Gillum, who's the CEO for McKinley Capital. And um, please welcome. This is your first uh, annual meeting. I think it's the first annual meeting for, the, for, for both of our, our next guests. So please welcome Mr. Rob Gillum. Good morning, and thank you, Robert, for the uh, short introduction. Always the best. Um, and congratulations. I guess we all have 49 million reasons to be excited for Southeast Alaska and Southeast Conference. So thank you for having me. Really excited. Congratulations again. Um, excited to be here. Welcome. Good morning. Excited to share the panel with uh, this group. Uh, really amazing. Um, I have been accused from time to time of being bullish on Alaska. Guilty. And I'll tell you why. A couple of years ago, a reporter came to my office in the middle of the pandemic and said, kind of aggressive as reporters can be from time to time, and said, you know, what? everybody's taking their money out of Alaska. What's wrong with you? Like, why are you not? Why are, why are you doing the opposite? And was pretty aggressive and said, you know, why, why in the world is there a reason to be positive, to be optimistic? And I kind of shot back a little bit grouchy. What in the world are you talking about? We live in the most beautiful place on the planet. We have the most abundant resources and the most resilient people. Of course, I'm optimistic about Alaska. And he kind of laughed and he said, I guess that makes you bullish. And it stuck. So yeah, I'm bullish and there's a, a reason. And what I'm gonna try to do here in the next couple of minutes is share a little bit about why uh, and what that means in terms of legacy for our kids and our grandkids. Um, what is private investment and how can it help drive economic growth? Why do outsiders, outside money, outside investors care about Alaska, Southeast Alaska in particular, and why do they care now? Some of the key ingredients that drives that, some things we can focus on, um, some details specifically about the local economy here in Southeast, and then a little summary of the work underway. So with that, let's, let's get started. So Alaska has this unique opportunity to power feed connect, heal, and protect the world. Not Alaska, but the world. So that means that investment today, unlike 30, 40, 50 years ago, isn't an investment on 700,000 citizens or 73,000 citizens here in Southeast. It's an investment in the world. It just flows through Alaska. That's an important distinction. I used to get questions in New York all the time. Why would I invest in Alaska? I got more people in my neighborhood than you have in your state. Right. This is about some of the things that the senator mentioned. 
There's some other reasons. Premier energy transition market, like why would we buy oil and gas from places like Venezuela and Iran? We can do it here in Alaska and create jobs for our friends and our neighbors. Same with critical minerals or natural resources. We are the resource bank of America for sure. And that includes uh, renewable resources. And I think that's pretty important. Critical minerals, yes, but renewable for sure. Then of course, there's a, there's a focus right now in the world on the Arctic, focus on the Bering Straits, and the Northwest Passage, and a lot of money flowing into that. And that's gonna benefit everybody around our state. And I'll give you a couple of examples. But here's what's really important. Anytime you make investment, anytime you create economic growth, you better be thinking about how this is gonna work for the next generation or the next 10 generations. What is the legacy for our kids and our grandkids and their kids and their grandkids? We have to create something that's healthy and sustainable for everyone. We have to meaningly, meaningfully engage all Alaskans. We cannot bifurcate our state into haves and have nots. We can't do that. And last but not least, like it or not, it's getting warmer. We have to be thinking about climate change and what we're gonna do. So private investment can sometimes be considered a four letter word. I hear it all the time. Oh, you're one of those money people. You're one of those capital guys. You're one of those private investment guys. It really isn't the plague, really. So it's integral to a growing economy and you'll see some examples here in a minute. Not only do you sometimes get money or investment when you're talking about private investment, but you can get operational best in class expertise as well. That's important when you're trying to run companies and you're trying to develop business and strategy and to do it more efficiently. It can come from inside Alaska, of course, as many of you in the room clearly know, but it can also come from outside of Alaska. It can be a public private partnership. My hats off and thanks to Vigor. We got a great tour yesterday, a great example here in Ketchikan about a public private partnership with Ada and the borough and Vigor, um, really amazing shipyard. It can be brought together by anyone, an outsider, someone in the room, someone from Alaska who's kind of the curator of bringing capital and investment expertise, operating expertise all together. Everyone wants to have a point person to sort of blame when things get a little rough or to focus on managing things. Um, it can often require a translator. Let's be honest, us Alaskans, we do things a little bit differently than they do on Wall Street. Wall Street doesn't necessarily speak our language and we sure as heck don't speak it. So sometimes having somebody to help translate that is, is really important. There has to be a recognition and a knowledge of regional economies and culture and people, really super important. Us Alaskans, we don't like people coming in from outside and saying, hey, this is the way things should be done. And just to be clear, I'm fully aware, I'm not from outside with a capital O because I was born and raised in Alaska but I am from outside Southeast Alaska, so maybe I'm outside with a little low, right? I think we all wanna make sure that we have local support. And last but not least, private investment can create jobs. Why do outsiders have appeal for Alaska? So I was talking about this uh, on the airplane coming down here with my friend Shireen sitting over here. Do you know what the uh, translation from Arabic for the word Alaska is? or Mandarin, German, Italian. It's Alaska, that's it. And it conjures exactly the same image, no matter where you are in the world. We have the best brand, use it. Number two, diverse investment opportunities. Any industry that you're interested in practically exists in Alaska. And we have some really cool new ones. Again, 49 million reasons for a really new one. Robert has said, we're gonna be generating $100 million a year. Dan is smiling because he's speaking later. $100 million a year in mariculture in two years, three years maybe. I'm giving you a hard time. I'm giving you a hard time. There isn't very much competition. I don't mean competition in Alaska. I mean competition for money coming into Alaska. I was in New York all last week and every single investment opportunity there has 20 people lined up trying to put money in it. It's really hard for investment dollars to chase projects because there's more money chasing fewer projects. It's the opposite in Alaska. A lot of our projects are under finance. Hard to get money for small businesses. Counter cyclical to the rest of the country. We are awakening after a five-year hibernation here in Alaska. It's about time right? Not so in the rest of the United States. And obviously you can earn higher returns, emerging market returns here. And what do all investors want? They want the security of the United States. 
Austin, help me out here. Next slide. Usually it's me, but. All right, one more, there we go. Why now, why do people put their money in Alaska right now? Of course, everybody's talking about the Arctic, not always for good reasons. Of course, we have some pretty horrible things going on in the world with the country just to the west of us. Lots of federal money, lots of focus on national energy policy, energy security, national security. Here's a big one, declining state spending means we need more private capital to fill that gap. That's really important. Non-existent infrastructure, I'm reminded about the bridge to somewhere down here that was proposed a few years ago. Technology now exists to help solve some long-standing problems. This is why people are interested now. Pat Pitney speaking a little bit later. I don't know if Pat's in the audience, but you know, I was reading this research paper the other day. There's a group in Fairbanks that has invented this goop that eats PFOS, which is a really nasty chemical that's all over a lot of our airports around the state. Pretty cool technology invented here in Alaska. And of course the pandemic created an opportunity for remote work and other kinds of things. I don't know if I was writing code and I worked for Amazon, I'd sure as heck rather live here than commute 70 minutes on the freeway in Seattle area. Next slide. So key ingredients, Robert, thank you. A lot of the panels cover these subjects here. You cannot have investment if you don't have these ingredients. You can't have it. You gotta have power. You gotta have workforce and housing. You gotta have transportation. You gotta have healthcare, education, broadband. If you don't have these things, it's like missing sugar when you're baking a cake. It doesn't work. It's really important. Next slide. So Southeast specifically. So first of all, we're the tourism capital. I could have gone on for 10 pages on this, but in the interest of time, um, 2 million people come here every year. This is the first place that people get to arrive in Alaska. Everywhere I go, it's a bucket list place. Oh, you're the guy from Alaska. You know, I took my family there 14 years ago. I can't remember what I did 14 hours ago. 14 years ago, and they're talking about the great time they had in Alaska. That's the impact that you have on the world, on tourists. Renewable resources, there's a long list. Did you know that in California, they just passed an $8 billion amendment to buy water? I don't know, I see a little bit of water around here. Um, Ice-free base of operations, it's really important. Anytime there's a lot of money coming into a place, Alaska, even if it's not for right here, there's this trickle down impact. The shipyard's a great example of that. I'll bet you that they're a beneficiary of what's going on up to the north. My special thanks to some of the facts that I learned yesterday from SEPA. Thank you, guys, I really appreciate it. Did you know that Ketchikan has the lowest cost of power in Alaska? It's about a third the cost of power on the rail belt where I live, a third, not a third less, a third of. It's 20% less than the national average and you have a dedicated broadband connection where you're only using 2% of your capacity. Like, I don't know, I'd take out an ad in the Wall Street Journal. I mean, that's pretty awesome. Now there's some things we gotta focus on, right? We gotta focus on the cost of freight. We heard over here about moving to the Southeast, a little bit difficult. I bet it wasn't super cheap either, right? So there's some issues we gotta deal with. Variability in cost of power, not in this community, but others, it's an issue. Net loss of population, it's an issue, right? Lack of housing, it's an issue. Some great subject matter for some of the panels a little bit later. But here's a really big one. And if there's one thing and only one thing you remember about what I say today, please remember this. Us Alaskans, we're a little skeptical of outsiders. Tell me I'm wrong, right? Raise your hand if you think we live in a crappy place and you're ready to move. Thank you for not raising your hand. But here's the thing, the other day, about a month ago, I had dinner with six other CEOs and everyone was talking about what was going on in Alaska. These are big companies in Alaska and they were all saying, oh, you know, I'm moving operations and I can't get workers and this problem and that problem and the next problem. And the last person at the table said, boy, we sure got to convince our young people to come back and work in Alaska. Well, who the heck would work for you guys? It was all negative. I wanna make one thing very clear. There's not a single dollar from outside of Alaska that's ever gonna flow into Alaska if we don't invest in Alaska. Would you invest in France if people in France aren't investing? Would you invest in North Carolina if the locals are investing in Tennessee? No, if we don't do it, nobody else will follow. But if we do it, the world is long money. 
and they are looking for exactly what we have. Don't forget that. Next slide. So there are some things that are already happening. These are kind of investment in the ingredients. Obviously, we've already talked about these great awards. It's really beneficial to, to creating some momentum behind these industries. There's a lot of work and research and economic development and tourism and seafood and uh, fisheries in general, aquaculture, mariculture, et cetera. Cultural tourism. I had the incredible experience, thank you, Anthony, of going to celebration earlier this summer and the dedication of the Arts Plaza in Juneau. It was absolutely incredible. I know there are similar uh, activities around Southeast. Again, this has got to be the world's greatest attraction. Have you ever heard of the Polynesian Cultural Center? You know, they make $25 million a year where people come to learn about the culture of Polynesia. $25 million a year. Like imagine what we can do with our amazing culture here in Southeast Alaska. Power opportunities, alternative transportation, electric ferry, some really cool sort of 21st century things going on. Next slide. Last but not least, conferences are awesome. It's been two years. I can tell you're a family. Robert says he's gonna introduce me to the crazy uncle amongst you. I'm not sure which one of you that is. But it's really interesting because We've been away from one another for a couple of years now, right? And you come back to these conferences and you go to all these things and you learn all this stuff and you go back home and you go right back into what you were doing before. So I want to make you a homework assignment. I want to create a challenge for you. When you get home, don't do that. Do one thing, one, just one, one thing different from something that you learned here. I'll give you a monetary example of one thing different. If every single person in Alaska spent $2 a day on something Alaskan, we would generate a half a billion dollars in new revenue in our state. $2 a day. That's one less latte. That's a half a latte in Anchorage. So let's not be victims of going to a conference and talking the talk. Let's come to a conference, learn something, and go home and walk the walk. Thank you. Well, one thing this room has brimming is optimism. So we'll check that one. Thank you, Rob. That's great. Uh, next, we have uh, also new to Southeast Conference and to the, the Northwest where she's the EDA's uh, Regional Director for Region 10. It's exciting to have her here with us and even it's just exciting to have you here with us and I hope uh, I hope all of you have a chance to to meet both of these uh, these individuals but um, Sheba person uh, Whitley is uh, is no stranger to economic development but she brings her her passion and perspective and the whole portfolio of, of EDA to us and uh, we're just really pleased to have her here so please give a warm Southeast Conference welcome to Sheba person Whitley. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. So not only is my first time at the conference, it is my first time in Alaska. I got here yesterday. I literally took the ferry, then took an Uber and came straight here, stashed my luggage and hopped in immediately to observe and absorb and to learn. So I'm so excited to be here. Everyone's been so friendly and we are really excited. It's an exciting time. I am fairly new to EDA. I started in December. So I am still getting to know the lay of the land, but we have a phenomenal group of people in um, the what we call the Seattle region. So it is all the Western states um, and the Pacific Islands. So it is a huge uh, region. And we have our wonderful Shirley Kelly in the back. I have to give a shout out to Shirley. If you wanna wave your hand, Shirley, and stand up so people can see you. So I think a lot of people already know her, but she is a rock star within EDA. So typically our structure, we have one rep per state. Um, the two exceptions being California where we have three reps and Hawaii and the Pacific Islands where we only have one person to represent all of those different um, territories, US territories and federated states. So we are advocating for more assistance to Shirley. She literally um, does the work of five people. She's been phenomenal. So I just wanted to take a moment to say, thank you, Shirley, on behalf of everyone in this room, because without you, we would not have this wonderful announcement. Um, if we can move to the next slide, please. We are so excited 
about the $49 million investment that EDA announced last week for Build Back Better Regional Challenge. <laughs> Waiting for that. So, yeah. Um, I know that there's been a lot of talk about collaboration and regional economic development and planning and doing everything at the community level and from the ground up. And so I think this is a culmination of years worth of experience um, that led everyone to this moment to be able to successfully compete for this award. We are so excited. Build Back Better Regional Challenge was a Herculean task, not only for Southeast Conference as the lead coalition, but all those partner um, projects that are going to be a part of the um, ultimate investment here, and also just understanding the amount of work that it took to, to get to this place. We are so excited. It was very, very, very competitive process. Next slide, please. We had 529 applications for Build Back Better. So just for context, we had just under $1 billion worth of funding available, and we received billions and billions and billions of requests. And we narrowed that 529 down to 60 finalists. Southeast Conference was one of those 60 finalists. And then we got to award. And so there are 21 coalitions that have been awarded. And so you had your have your lead coalition, and then you have all those partnerships and component projects that fall within the coalition. It really is an example of true regional economic development. I do think that's something that is critical critically important to us. We re recognize that regionalism is critically important. It's really about locking arms together and thinking about what are their strategic competitive advantages that a community has? How do they get there together? How do you leverage people? How do you leverage those partnerships um, to get to you know all tides, uh, all, excuse me, all boats rising with the tide? Because I do think that's critically important. So we are really, really excited to have Southeast Conference um, be one of those 21 coalitions. It was extremely, extremely competitive. And I do think it is going to be a catalytic type of investment for mayor culture um, in Southeast Alaska to really focus on you know, fisheries, hatcheries, um, seaweed production, I think is part of that as well. They've got R&D built in there. They also have a revolving loan fund built into the um, project as well. A tremendous focus on tribes and indigenous communities as well as rural populations. Next slide, please. So just for context, I thought it would be handy dandy to see the map of where those 21 um, coalition awards are going. And you will see that a couple of them, the, the circle is in the center and that's where the coalition is actually going to serve multiple states. Um, I do think this is one of those opportunities for us again to really double down on regional efforts to really understand well, what are the advantages that we can bring in making strategic investments. I do think long-term planning is critically important. Um, we can all have all these great ideas, but we also need to know where it is we're trying to go and how do we get there in the most effective and efficient manner. So I thought that would be helpful for you to understand um, where those investments have been made. Next slide, please. So um, this just breaks down a little bit, and I'm not going to belabor on this slide, but it breaks down where the types of industry investments have been made. I do think it really speaks to um, EDA really partnering with community. Um, we are the type of agency that always says it is not our job, and nor is it appropriate for us at the federal government to come into your region, into your community, and tell you what you need. We really truly believe in place-based economic development investments, allowing the community to tell us what it is that they need and how we can partner to help them get there. So I think this gives a, a really great example of the types of industry investments that we've made through this um, Build Back Better Challenge. Next slide, please. So um, of course we have other things beyond Build Back Better. Um, I came in December and I like to say that federal government is like acronym alphabet soup. We have all of these different names for all these different programs. And so Build Back Better was a part of the American Rescue Plan Act, or as I like to say, ARPA, ARPA, ARPA. Um, I do think you have to be of a certain age to understand that reference. I've said it in rooms with millennials and they just stare at me and I feel awkward and weird and old. I'm like, you don't get the Brady Bunch reference? <laughs> What's happening, people? So we have all these wonderful programs beyond Build Back Better that we were able 
to fund um, through our programming at EDA. So we had the Build Back Better Regional Challenge. We had the Good Jobs Challenge, Economic Adjustment Assistance, Indigenous Communities. So we were super excited at this fiscal year. We had a $100 million carve out specifically for Indigenous Communities and Tribes. We had Travel Tourism Outdoor Rec. So that was in response to the pandemic and COVID-19, recognizing that the impacts of COVID were not equally felt and shared, that the tourism um, and outdoor rec industry, as well as the respective occupations within those industries were disproportionately infected. I mean, how can you get to where you need to be when you have shelter in place orders? And we understand that we couldn't travel for a reason. It was about public safety, but we also recognize that there were tremendous impacts felt by the um, tourism industry as a whole. So we did have a specific funding opportunity for tourism, which allowed us to be more creative. So for example, historically EDA wouldn't fund destination marketing organizations. And this funding opportunity allowed for them an opportunity to actually compete for funds. So that was um, a great program we've had. We had um, co-communities and we had our planning. And so I do think planning is really important. We heard a lot yesterday about the need for strategic plans. Um, how we've been able to do that is through our economic development district, Southeast Conference and others. It's been so important that we have districts that come together, they can work on the comprehensive economic development strategies. They understand you know, what the community needs. They're using data to drive their decisions. They're using engagement, hearing from the community to really do that planning. And so it basically prepositions organizations like Southeast Conference and other economic development districts to effectively compete for funding. It's very difficult to compete if you don't even have a roadmap that tells you exactly what it is you need and what type of investments are gonna be transformational in your community. Next slide, please. So the Good Jobs Challenge was um, an interesting one that we did this fiscal year as well. Um, so just for context, typically EDA, we have a budget, annual budget for the entire country and all the US territories and all the federated states around 300 to 350 million per year. That's it. This year through Congress, through ARPA, we had 3 billion just for this fiscal year. So that was a tremendous amount of work. It gave um, an opportunity for a lot of organizations to compete for funds that maybe historically hadn't had an opportunity to do that. Um, so that's, gonna, that's been a lot of work and our fiscal year in September 30th. And we are super excited about what we've been able to do, but it really has been a tremendous amount of work. And the Good Jobs Challenge was a workforce um, challenge that we did and we had about 500 million carved out specifically for that funding opportunity. We received over 500 applications um, and we have made 32 awards. So next slide, please. So we're really excited about the Alaska Primary Care Association. They did receive an award of over $9 million through the Good Jobs Challenge. And so part of this is really about sustainability. We heard a little bit about that from Rob earlier. It's really understanding, well, what investments do we need to make that's really going to help the community, not just now, but in the long term? And what we knew throughout the pandemic is that Alaska was in a position where they were forced, as a state, you all were forced to recruit um, all these medical professionals from the lower 48. And so that helps you in the acute short term, but that doesn't help you out long term when you really think about well, what is your what is your true need for healthcare professionals. And so this is going to allow for apprenticeships and, and training opportunities and job placement opportunities um, to help support the healthcare industry because we do know that's critically important to, to the state of Alaska. Next slide, please. So this is just a breakdown of where those 32 awards were made. It was 31 states and one of the U.S. territories. So we're we're excited. Um, I will say this: I acknowledge that there's never enough to go around. In the, in our case, we had 500 million, which is significant, but the need is so great. So we it is our hope and our desire that this is just the first step um, to continue to make these types of investments, specifically in workforce. Um, because we know workforce has been critically important as we've thought about recovery from COVID. 
and what the pandemic has done to our economies um, and to our labor force. We wanna make sure that all of our citizens are in a position where they are trained and skilled and could have good jobs, not just any job, but a good job that pays them a livable wage, that gives them benefits, that um, helps them balance work life. So I do think that's critically important. And we always want to inc include equity in what we do. So a lot of uh, our work, it really centers around well, who are on, on underserved populations, our rural communities, our indigenous communities, our communities of color, um, communities that historically have been left behind. And so this type of work is so critically important to allow for pathways for people to actually be trained and to be effectively able to compete so that they don't have to leave Alaska and go somewhere else for um, job opportunities. So I do think that's critically important. Next slide. So in closing, I would like to say, again, congratulations to Southeast Conference and all the other component projects in your coalition. I do think it is a culmination of so much wonderful work. I also, um, again, congratulations on the investment around healthcare. I do think that's critically important, but that's not the only thing that we've been doing. As I mentioned, we have a ton of other programs. So outside of the 49 million and the 9.7 million, we've invested $32 million in, in Alaska since last January. So I, I think that, um, you know, we're here to stay. We continue to make those investments, continue to partner. If you don't know Shirley K Kelly, I would recommend that you get to know her. She is the backbone of what we do here in Alaska. Anytime anyone wants to apply, that's where you go. She's the person that will help you navigate the process, what I call demystifying the black box of government to make it more accessible. Um, she is phenomenal. So please, we're here. We wanna be supportive. We want to continue to make these types of investments and we really appreciate the partnership. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, as we get a little closer to home with uh, both uh, Anthony Millad and Commissioner Sandy, well, actually, we are home for Commissioner Sandy. And it's ex so exciting to, we were really thrilled to see her appointed to the Ada board and finally have some you know, influence from the region there because Southeast, sometimes we feel like we're not always, um, we're kind of the big O sometimes to the rail belts is that we're really outside the box uh, and outside of considerations, but uh, then we're absolutely thrilled when she was appointed uh, as commissioner of the Department of Commerce. So please uh, welcome to the podium, our own commissioner, Julie Sandy. That always makes every single time and it makes me sad. I, I Someday I, when I grow up, I long to be somebody that's tall, but uh, good morning. Um, I'm just excited to be here in person. And I know yesterday when I was speaking to some folks, the energy I think is contagious. I don't know if it's just that we're so happy to be through these last couple of years that I know have been really, really hard, but I don't know if it's the sunshine um, or just the excitement of all of the recent announcements, but it's a great time to be uh, here. And I'm just proud to be, uh, yes, from Ketchikan. I'm a Southeast girl. Um, but for those of you that don't know me, my name is Julie Sandy. I'm the Commissioner of Commerce, Community and Economic Development. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with that, there's six divisions, eight corporate agencies. Um, some of the divisions, Division of Insurance, Banking, Securities, Corporations, Business Licensing, among some of the a few. Um, and then uh, of the eight corporate agencies, uh, we have ADA, Alaska Industrial Development Export Authority, Alaska, Alaska Energy Authority, AMCO. The reason I'm trying to uh, not hit you with too many uh, of those, I, I, I laugh a little bit because my previous career was in healthcare. And I can tell you that DNR in healthcare is very different than DNR in state government. And so I try, I try to, whenever I can, uh, spell things out for folks. And I also just wanted to compliment all of the speakers uh, yesterday because I feel like everybody did a really good job of not hitting the audience with too many acronyms, which I really appreciate because I'm constantly trying to do that little switcheroo in my head. So anyway, so those are the corporate agencies, but um, and I, I just, before I forget, I want to recognize we have uh, the Commissioner of Commerce, Susan Bell, ex-Commissioner of Commerce here as well. So she's sitting over there and I, and she's one of the resources that I use. Um, the folks in this room have been so 
kind to me personally and such a support uh, to the department. And these are all of my phone a friend folks in this room, but we have a wealth of, of knowledge and resources. And I love that uh, people have been so supportive and I'm really grateful for that. So I grew up in rural Alaska, um, more rural than Ketchikan even for those of us that are uh, here from outside. So logging uh, camp in, in pretty remote Alaska. Um, so uh, some of the things that we're doing under commerce right now, like uh, broadband, we stood up the Alaska Office of Broadband. That's really exciting for me personally because I grew up in remote Alaska and I just know what a, a lifeline that can be in terms of bringing really good quality healthcare, but also opportunities for jobs. And so those are some of the exciting things we're doing. When I first started, and, and by the way, this was my very first speaking engagement. I wasn't able to do it in person, but I did it via Zoom at the last Southeast Conference. And it was my very first speaking engagement as the brand new Commissioner of Commerce. And I look back at that time and I think, I I mean, talk about ignorance is bliss. I didn't even know all the things I didn't know. I actually said to this group and the deputy commissioner is gonna shake her head at me, but I think I, I actually said out loud to, to you guys that I hadn't yet learned where the bathroom was. And, and that was my only goal for the week. And, um, but I'm nine months later, um, I can tell you when I first started and chat, I talked to some of the folks in this room about the challenges at DCCED, um, Representative Story, Senator Keel, uh, Representative Ortez, they do a great job of representing uh, their constituents. And, and we talked about some of the challenges that were facing the department. When I went to work, uh, started to roll up my sleeves and tried to figure some things out besides where the bathroom is, what I found was the solutions, just like in healthcare um, at the Pioneer Home, the solutions are often closest to where the work really is, right? So we could sit around in a boardroom and talk forever about how to uh, solve a problem. But the reality is if if we just left the boardroom and went to where the work was being done, so often the folks doing the work already know the solution, right? So that's been a huge relief for me because I don't have all the solutions, but a lot of the folks on the team um, at DCC or ED are working really, really hard for Alaskans and they have a lot of the solutions already. So I can tell you, I'm very proud of the team, but I'm also um, really proud of the work that we're doing. Um, and before I forget, Laura Vaught and Michaela Fowler are in the room. If you guys would stand up, hopefully they're in the room. They might be, I might be busting them. Yep. So uh, Laura and Michaela uh, are uh, work for the commissioner's office and Michaela is the deputy commissioner of commerce. And I can tell you, she's a rock star. But the reason why I wanted both of them to stand up is because um, it's really important that you guys know the faces behind the work. And they really are working so hard along with the rest of the team um, on behalf of Alaskans and Southeast Alaskans. Um, so uh, a couple of the wins recently, though, I just wanted to give you some examples. So um, at AMCO, Director Joan Wilson, um, who had just started, was really um, instrumental in helping solve a problem at the beginning of the season. And these are all of those things like the we live for the wins, right? And so this is one of those ones where when she first started, we were absolutely aligned and doing the right thing for Alaskans and especially Alaskan businesses that we understood had really been suffering. And so right at the beginning of the season, she was able to help provide licensure in really quick order. And, and by doing so, we were able to have some ships come to Ketchikan, which would have other, or to Southeast Alaska, which would have otherwise been diverted. I think that those efforts after hours, long hours sometimes where you're really trying to figure out, okay, how do we solve this problem are part of the story that folks behind or folks out there don't really see, but it's the behind the scenes work that I think is really important um, to call out. Um, ASME is doing a great job. We've got folks in the room, I think, from ASME, but Jeremy Woodrow is really doing a great job with ASME, and they recently announced that partnership with Holland America Princess, where they're providing the um, uh, Alaska-grown uh, seafood on the ships. It's one of those things where it's like, gosh, why, why haven't we been doing this forever, right? And I think HAP just celebrated 75 years in Alaska, which is a pretty big deal, but I really appreciate all of those efforts. It's, it's the right thing uh, for the industry, and it's the right thing for visitors. And we heard that a lot yesterday in the visitors uh, industry panel where, you know, what we really want to do is create an experience and an experience where people want to come back. But more than that, being born and raised in Alaska, I'm so proud of what we have here. 
you know, uh, just like Mr. Gillum, I, I couldn't be more bullish or excited about Alaska. And um, it's really an honor for me to be in this role because Alaska is my favorite thing to talk about. And so being able to advocate or represent our state is something that makes me very, very proud. But I love that ASME um, in partnership with HAP did exactly what they should have done in terms of providing a really good quality product for the visitors and hopefully a much better experience for the visitors. So I love that. Um, you know, mariculture, we've heard a lot about, and I don't want to hit on too many things that are um, where we're saying the same thing over and over, but we can't help but be really excited about that $49 million through the EDA. And thank you very much. I, I couldn't be uh, more excited for the industry. And having been a part of the industry for a while now, I know for, you know, it's, it's, um, it, it takes some guts to have a vision, I think, and then to be working really, really hard towards that vision, a lot of times when nobody else believes in it, right? So I can remember the likes of Julie Decker at the very beginning, um, uh, 10 years ago, talking about the vision for mariculture in Alaska, you know, and that, that takes guts to be working so hard and pulling in a direction when other folks might not believe in you. So I'm, I'm really proud of the Mariculture uh, group and, and the task force, and they put a lot of thought into the, the re final report and to see some of those improvements happening. And then now this $49 million makes me really proud. Um, in terms of permitting though, I can tell you at the very uh, start of the report, you'll see that permitting was one of the number one challenges. And you know now we can say we've got some of the fastest uh, permitting in the nation. And those are improvements that came from feedback from people like in this room. So I would encourage all of you to, to stay involved and keep providing that feedback because through the feedback, we can provide the fixes. Um, so, you know, in closing, I guess what I would say about charting uh, the course forward, I was thinking about it a lot. And um, I'm embarrassed to say all the things I didn't know about my own region, even though I would constantly say, I'm so proud to come from Ketchikan. I'm so proud to come from Southeast Alaska. But one of my favorite things about this job is that I get to go out and meet Alaskans and I get to go out and, and take tours of things like KPU and broadband and uh, seeing where uh, the, the little wires actually plug into things, right? And so that, I'm a visual learner, but I, I was really proud of that. And I didn't know before I took this job that we have that hard link. I also didn't know before I took this job that we have some of the cheapest power, uh, not only in the state, but in terms of the national average. When I go on the energy authority, I can tell you folks in the rail belt would really love to have uh, the cheap energy that we have here in Ketchikan. So when I think about moving uh, the ball forward, I think I, I couldn't agree with uh, Patty more yesterday when she said, you know, we have to come up with a marketing plan. We have to be able to tell our story better. And I think that that's absolutely true. I think we also can collaborate better and, and really build partnerships where it's not always efficient for every single person to have their own processing facility, but we could certainly uh, partner and share equipment and, and uh, help promote each other's businesses and each other's agencies. And I think that uh, collaboration is going to be key. And the final thing I'll, I'll say is, you know, we've heard over and over and over common themes, workforce, housing, childcare, the cost of shipping. But we have some really great wins already. And I think if we ha take the opportunity both to collaborate and share each other's stories, but also build off the work that we've already been doing. And so uh, Michaela won't tell you uh, this about herself, but she's really a homegrown uh, success story, certainly within the department, but we're lucky to have her. But I think there's lots of folks like that, where if you capture them early, um, you're able to uh, uh, get their interest and get them inspired. And so I really am encouraging uh, and grateful that Pat Pitney is going to be here. I think she's got a lot uh, to talk about with that. But I think that we can solve our own problems and bring uh, young folks into the fold and keep them fired up and excited. And they'll be serving us and serving the state for many, many years to come. Um, so, uh, the last thing I wanted to say was, uh, Mr. S Mayor Smith is here from Metlakatla, uh, sitting right here in the front. And I love this because I have lived in, in, in this region for uh, most of my life. And I had only ever been to Metlakatla maybe one other time, but recently his group was kind enough to give us a tour, the governor and I and our team. And we saw some really amazing things in Metlakatla and, 
it's just a hop and a skip away. And I thought, how crazy is that, that I've lived my whole life here. I can see it from here. Uh, and I've never uh, spent enough time there. So I was really grateful for that opportunity. I'd encourage folks here to spend some time there, but also I, I thought of him and I brought this up. I, in, I was in San Francisco last week and I was meeting with the uh, folks from Germany on international trade and they were sharing the challenges they're having with energy. Um, and so I was, they were talking about trying to move the mark and how do you really do that? And I was able to share with them the story that he told me about when they were needing to conserve water in Metlakatla. Uh, they, they couldn't move the marker, but then they went to the schools and they educated the kiddos and they told the kiddos why it was really, really important to save water. So then it was the kiddos, right? That were telling their grandma and grandpa to save water, right? So I was just sharing that story with the folks from Germany, but it's those kinds of building relationship pieces that I think the folks in this room do really, really well. Um, and, and I can't wait for us to, um, you know, keep building on those relationships and really um, help each other out. So thank you all so much for being here today. It's been um, a really exciting day yesterday and I'm looking forward to more today, but um, thanks very much. Thank you, Commissioner. And now, Mr. Malat, who's a, a regular contributor in our agenda and uh, has such uh, uh, incredible insights on investing in the region. So um, no stranger to Southeast Commerce, but please welcome Mr. Anthony Malat. Robert, really appreciate the chance to speak with you today. Uh, about a week ago, I said, oh, great, I'm on the panel. I don't need a PowerPoint presentation. And then everybody brings their PowerPoint presentation. And then I forgot, the PowerPoint presentation helped me remember what I'm going to talk about. So we'll see how this goes. I am going to steal, if, if you can pull up McKinley Capital slide six, I'm going to steal one of your slides. So thank you. <laughs> I I hope I've I've been coming here and being repetitive enough about what Sea Alaska is doing in terms of our commitment to our values, our commitment to our communities, our commitment to the voice of our people and listening to them and creating both an investment structure that invests in stocks and bonds that will provide benefits for generations in perpetuity to come and also global businesses that bring income back to see Alaska. So we do, we, we invest globally, both on the stocks and bond sides and their business portfolio. We do it with that core focus on values. What do our shareholders care about? They care about envir our environment. They care about their traditional way of life. So we wanna protect our oceans and that's, that's what our businesses do. So I've spent a lot of time just, just repeating those mantras of what Sea Alaska is focused on and how we're doing our business. And, and our values create this opportunity for us to be problem solvers. Our values give us a chance to be long-term thinkers and in, in investing long-term. And we take, there's two sides of our house, so I'll get to the, uh, the other side of our house. We take that same concept of the long-term strategic thinking on the global business side, the problem solving, the commitment to values, and we bring it back to Southeast Alaska. And every dollar we ever make, when we talk about investing in Southeast Alaska, every dollar we ever make can only be invested in our people and in our communities. So we will be investing in Southeast Alaska for thousands of years to come. Last year, we had 54 million in shareholder benefits. The bulk of that was in dividends. Our shareholders do care about dividends. You know, Our corporate dividends and our 7J distribu distributions were over $40 million. That's a lot of money into Southeast Alaska. But then our, our communities care about so much more than that. And when we think about the two sides of our house, 
the global business, the investment portfolios, the natural resource management, and the dollars that they create, our, our thesis is business success leads to community success. And even better, we don't have to do it by ourselves when we think of community success. And so the value set includes the concept of working together in collaboration. And as I walk through kind of how we invest in, in Southeast Alaska, you'll see the, the partnerships that we value so much mean we don't have to solve every single one of these issues. And I'll start with power. Um, I joined Sea Alaska in 2006. I think we had our fifth straight, uh, what's that, 16 years ago, our fifth straight economic summit. We used to do economic summits with all our tribal partners. And I sat through it and there was just this push and struggle. Of ideation all crumbles when you face 65 cent kilowatt hour energy. And at the end of every single one of those conferences, it was don't even try economic development until you fix energy. You know, just year after year, that same concept. And what are we 16 years later, Cake, Huna, and Goon, Yakutat, they still have 65 cent kilowatt hour if you have to have to run a business there. So that we have partners like IPEC who work on that. They 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 hit the ground and try and find money for hydro projects wherever they can. And and that's something that just has to continue. And if they can find other partners that realize the the difference of seven cents. Here, 12 cents in Juno and 65 cent running a small mill in, in Huna paying 65 cent kilowatt hour, running a fish plant in Huna paying 65 cent kilowatt hour. That's a tough, tough way to do business. Um, workforce. When we made the decision to get out of logging and we, we tried to represent the why of that, the real story had to be told on Principal Ailes. And so we committed to transitioning every single one of our employees, which we have done, but we committed to talking with our communities. And we went in and we started talking with our POW communities. We started in Heidelberg. Heidelberg said, I have 18 open positions that I can't fill. We went to Craig. You know, we have the UCOR contract and I can't get anybody to go out and service the contract. And the Hollis Mine is hiring every week and they can't find enough people. We went to Klawak, we can't get enough people. We want to start a grocery store. The, the workforce is going to be the issue. We have no contractors on the island. Plumbing, heating, whatever you, whatever you need was lacking. And so the island didn't need more economic development. They needed training, workforce development, reskilling. So the island population could start taking some of those open jobs wherever it could be. And so the first thing we did was just, it's COVID time. So let's just, you know, stop gap things. We just provided an incentive, a hiring incentive uh, in Heidelberg that got nine jobs filled just by putting a, a thousand dollar hiring bonus, another thousand at six months, and then 2000 if you hit a year. That commitment to staying in a job for that time period is important. So just that's a blunt tool, though. And incentivizing is a pretty blunt tool. What, what you really have to commit to is workforce development. And, and I'll talk about when you think of the global investing side, you invest a dollar, and if you make 20%, you're, you're a pretty darn good investor, right? When we give Sea Alaska Heritage Institute, $1.8 million, and they go out and get 18 million in additional dollars for educational program. What's our return? Like 10 times? We could put that 1.8 million in a business and look for that 10% return, but we're getting a tenfold return by putting it in a partner like Sea Alaska Heritage Institute that can go get outside money and bring, just leverage our 1.8 million into something so much greater than that. Uh, spruce Root, we give Spruce Root 500,000 annually to support small business. They go out 
and they get three and a half million in additional outside money. Again, that 500,000 is an investment. It, it shows up as an expense on our financial statement, gap financials. We, we don't care. It's $500,000 that brought three and a half million into Southeast Alaska. And then $10 million to support the Sustainable Southeast Partnership. Our 10 million was leveraged to get $11 million in outside money that cares about our communities just as much as we do, the fact that they're underserved. And so our 10 million was doubled right off the bat. And so that's a different way of thinking investments. It's not the hard dollar investments, it's investments in our people, it's investments in our community, it's investments in our environment. We have three forest partnerships. In, in Southeast Alaska, we started in Huna, and the Forest Service has been such a great partner. All these partners that work down this list, IPIC on power, the Cloak Boke Tech on workforce, uh, T&H housing on housing, you know, all of our tribal transportation, we have, we have all these great partners out there. So we commit 250,000 annually, 250,000 total to the Huna Native Forest Partnership, and that partnership has gotten $5 million in outside money to do the things that Huna cares about. Restore our streams, protect our salmon runs, enhance our deer population. Where are all our blueberries? Can we do natural harvest? $5 million doing all these field work that, that are creating sustainability for that community. Cake is the same thing, $200,000 to cake, and we leverage that into that same $5 million. And now Cloak is starting a forest partnership, and they're hitting the ground running. There's so much stream restoration work to do in, on POW Island. And that's, that's, gonna, that's an investment that you could measure in centuries, an investment in there. Sam, I'll mention this one, this one story. Something that guides us is, is this 100-year vision. And when you think of 100 years, you get to really go out there and say, what do we want 100 years? Just like those energy conferences, you'd all have these conversations back and forth, and they would land on one spot. We want health and wellness for our people and our communities. Just lands on that spot every time. And, and one of the concepts was that we had a 10-year-old uh, a from Yakutat. And he, we wanted a youth in the room and he was asked the question, what do you want in a hundred years? And he goes, I want to go to the sea tuck and be able to catch a salmon a hundred years from now. And so being able to do stream restoration in Kloak means Ed's great grandson can, can catch sockeye on the island a hundred years from now. And so those are different, different types of investment thinking that, that we work on and we try and problem solve because these are not easy. When we think of internet, um, so lucky to have Clinkett and Haida, just a fantastic, they, they took all the broadband initiatives and they worked with everybody in all the native organizations who had access to the broadband dollars. And you should see the money going to POW, Cake, Yakutat, Huna, Angoon. It's, it's, just, it's just fantastic to see those dollars coming for education, for healthcare, for business. It, it's, it's, it's really nice. Um, healthcare Search, again, just a fantastic partner that we have. Uh, and on education, the I don't think we could put enough dollars into education for our youth. There's, there's a performance gap that we don't even like talking about with our, with our Native students. Um, I don't look like, like looking at the statistics, um, but it gives us a lot of upside if we get it right. And there's a lot of upside in just building pride and respect in, in terms of who we are, investing in our language, investing in our culture, investing in uh, a future that they can be excited about. And so that the, the building of that 100-year vision is not going to be Sea Alaska. It's going to be Clinkett and Haida right beside us. It's going to be our communities, our local tribes, expanding that 100-year vision and doing their own investments into the things that they care about in their communities. 
and I'll just I'll just mention one because it's it's so important to me, and I I think there's these disparities that when we talk about catch a can with seven cent kilowatt hour, and then we have to say, well, look at Angoon cake backed at at sixty five cent. We have the same issue with fisheries. Look at look at Sitka Petersburg Wrangell with our fishing fleet, and look at Cake who has in 25 years went from 105 commercial fishing permits to 24. And if you looked at the graph, 105, 80, 70, 60, 50, I call it the pathway to zero. There's no stopping. Every five years, those permits just keep on going down. I, I don't, if Cake had those 105 permits and the million pounds in halibut IFQ that they lost, a million pounds in high IFQ that they had 25 years ago is gone. That's six and a half million in community economic development that Cake has lost, that's gone elsewhere. The same story, Angoon's gone from 104 permits to four. It's, it's stark data, but we have partners when we, when we talk about what is the value of the SSP, we have partners that are hearing our story of collaboration we have the federal government talking about underserved communities, and we have very underserved communities here in Southeast Alaska. And those numbers define, the educational performance gap defines, the loss of, of commercial fishery access defines underserved communities. We need everybody investing in those communities. And an SSP partner, Alaska Longline Fishermen Association, based out of Sitka, industry, they, they see it. Sitka has benefited. These small communities have lost their way of life. When you lose a commercial fishing boat, you don't only lose a, a cash economy, you, you lose the, the vessel that you went out subsistence harvesting on. You lose the vessel that transported family from Cake to Angoon or Cake to Huna. You lose transportation. And so Alpha with SSP has, has said, okay, we get it. And now we're going to design all our programs working with the SSP to target these underserved communities and work one by one to get to stop that path to zero and start getting permits, IFQ, economic development, lower cost energy, more housing across the board in these underserved communities. And so when we fix everything, we'll invest all our dollars in Southeast Alaska you know, we have a long, a long time window to think towards that. But right now we're getting the best use of our dollars by investing in our people, in our, in our communities and our partners. And we're going to keep on doing that. So good night, Chish. Thank you. What great perspectives on investing. So you're not going to get access to these four like this. Well, it's going to be tough to do that. So we got time for some questions and answers. I can certainly, you know, I've got, I've got a list of them, but I'm going to see if there's any ones that's... Okay. Angie, you got a quick question? Um, thank you all for a wonderful panel and all of your hard work in... I believe I work part time at Southeast Conference and part of my time goes towards um, healthy food because I believe good economy and good communities start with good health. So I thank Sea Alaska for investing in, in restoring the fisheries. But I, you know, a billions of dollars infrastructure bill and all these money, but I see no support in supporting small farmers local farmers, local food production. And I know from uh, being in that industry, when COVID hit, it was a hit or miss where we, whether we can source our food to, at the grocery stores. And for local uh, food producers, it's just so expensive to transport the food within Southeast and all around the region. So how can we bring some focus to local food production and healthy foods to our children? Come on, Juno, kids had flooring instead of milk. How sad is that to give flooring to our kids 
with her, her future. So I want to hear your perspectives on how do we bring focus to healthy foods? And that is the biggest um, protection against COVID or any other pandemic, any other virus that's coming our way. Thank you. Who wants to take that one, Commissioner? Green light. This one working? Okay. Um, I can tell you it's one of the governor's priorities as well. Um, so I appreciate you asking the question. The governor stood up the food security task force um, in, in part because during COVID, we really, he really could see how vulnerable Alaskans are. Uh, when there was discussion about the port of Seattle potentially closing, you know, with 95% of what we consume uh, coming from the outside, it was really a vulnerable uh, place to be. And it, it really Really, uh, inspired him to find solutions. And so we have a, a task force assembled and much like the Mariculture Task Force, we hope to produce a report. I think it's really gonna just be a jumping off point, but it's going to really um, highlight where some of the gaps are and then also highlight where some of the solutions are. So procurement is one of the challenges um, just within the procurement rules we've seen, you know, I think it was in Kodiak where they produce enough milk there to be able to provide to the, um, the school, but because of procurement rules and testing facilities, we're not allowed to allowed to access that, right? Well, it makes no sense. So I think we're everywhere we're, where uh, we can gather information, first of all, like that's what we're doing. But I, um, I, I get really excited when uh, folks on the task force come up with solutions. And I think that's where we're going to end up. So it's sort of having that strategic plan first. And, and when the governor was here just a couple of weeks ago, he was able to tour around and just meet people. And we stopped and we were speaking with um, Julie Saniker, and she was talking about some of the challenges she faces in producing seeing uh and access to a commercial kitchen was one of them well over and over and over uh, across the state we're hearing the same thing so where we can provide those economies of scale where we can simplify and have gain efficiencies um, we want to make sure that we can do that and 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 there's plans also in place we've already done the work in previous reports where we could provide those commercial kitchens so i think that's really exciting too but thank you for calling that out because i couldn't agree more Want to add, you know, food security is um, the SSP, the Sustainable Southeast Partnership, has a few food security catalyst because that is so important to our communities. A again, the disparity, food security in Juno is different than food security in Cake or Angoon when you hit January and the store shelves are empty. And so the the food security for our communities is our traditional way of life. And the feds and the states have not gotten it right in in any respect. And so what we're working on is just continued, a continued step towards co-management of access to our resources um, because it's it's critical. You're not gonna live in your traditional community if you can't practice your traditional way of life. And the system is not easy, does not make that easy right now. So we're gonna be working on that for a long time. I think I might think I might say one other thing here. There we go. Um, so first of all, thank you for the question. There's a lot of ways to attack the problem, but if you think about just at its base level, a lot of farmers or people who produce small amounts of food are business owners. If you can't get capital to run your business, you can't expand, you can't provide transportation. So I think there are a lot of programs in the country, like within the USDA, um, we have to bring capital to small business in Alaska, particularly in you know remote communities. That's a really important part of the equation. You hear some other important parts, but it takes a lot of ingredients to make a to make a cake. Great, and we're going to do a deeper dive into that tomorrow as, as well. So we've got time for just another question or two. Hi, uh, Jody Mitchell, CEO of IPEC, and I know many of you in this room know that I, IPEC has been working really hard to address the disparity in the cost of energy in our small communities. And so Anthony, thank you for bringing that up. Um, I have been beating the bushes for most of this year and before trying to find grants for um, energy projects. And unfortunately the infrastructure bill does not include money for new hydro construction. And I'm, I just can't believe that. Uh, we have two projects that are shovel ready, but we have no funding for them. Um, but it is a serious issue. You know, Anthony brought up how 
you know, how are you going to have fish processing? How can you have sustainable uh, businesses in small communities when they can't afford the price of energy? And not only that, we just had $6 a gallon diesel. And we, we bargained for that price. Um, you know, we have a special contract for that. So um, and one thing I, you know, I guess this is more of a statement than a question, but I also, there is a question in it. Um, I read somewhere, I think it was the CEQ or the Justice 40 initiative, and I'm not sure if that's under, um, under any of your watch, but that Cake Angoon and Huna and Kluckwan were not considered disadvantaged communities. I don't know how that can be. I mean, in my opinion, any community that is dependent on diesel for electric generation should darn well be considered disadvantaged no matter what. Not only that, but the problems with transportation. I don't know if you all heard, but Huna is gonna not have any uh, barge service for about, looks like about six months. Um, so anyway, it's a real serious problem in our small communities. And, um, you know, I don't know if, um, I forgot your name. Uh, if you have any um, knowledge about how they decided who is disadvantaged and who is not. Oh, Sheba. Um, I don't know how that happened or how, how they determined um, what who is disadvantaged and who is not. So if you have any knowledge about that, I'd like to know. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of that is done through official data that comes out of U.S. Census. So we look at things like persistent poverty. We look at things like what the median cost of living is, uh, median income. But all of it typically is looking at the specific official data out of U.S. Census. So I'm happy to have a deeper dive conversation um, and certainly, you know, be a, a connector to our um, team up in headquarters to, to look at that because we are cont continuously looking at data. We recognize that, and I will be the first to acknowledge the federal official data, there's always a lag in it. And that lag um, doesn't always reflect what your lived experience is on the ground. And so anytime we get an opportunity to hear from people to understand, well, here's where we think there's a gap in your data. Um, how do we you know, do a better job at using that to make those distinctions and those designations? So happy to have an offline conversation, but the official place that we get the data from is primarily from US Census. Good morning. Albert Smith, Mayor of Malakau Indian Community, Rhode Island Reserve. We are <clears throat> the only reserve in the state. Um, I, I appreciate what you guys all had to say this morning. I'm, uh, I'm excited. I got a lot of ideas rolling around with uh, a lot of the stuff that you guys have talked about. For us on economic development, first and foremost, we need more power more water, more infrastructure to, to handle growth. And uh, a lot of what uh, Mr. Gillen was talking about, I, I got a list of stuff. To, hopefully we could arrange a, a time to sit down and talk about it before you go. And, uh, and I'd like to uh, thank Commissioner Sandy for uh, talking about Metlakala and, and anybody that wants to come the invitation is open to to anybody. Just uh, reach out, and uh, we'll set up a, a visit. It's a beautiful island, as I'm sure everybody will say. Uh, their home is the nicest place there is, but uh, I, I, I I do believe that. So, um, um, Yeah, broadband, connecting with the broadband is, is a big deal. Uh, so there's a few things for development for us, power, water, and broadband. So uh, I will be trying to connect with you guys before we, we all leave. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, Commissioner Sand, do you think there'll be another round of the... Uh... Alaska ARPA business relief programs, or is that? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. All right. Um, so before we go, I'm going to, I want to introduce a couple of folks that have been doing a lot of, um, I'll, I'll get to just a uh, um, 
uh, we've been doing a lot of investments uh, in the local regions because they've traveled a little ways. We've been meeting on Wednesday mornings. I know um, the um, executive directors for Prince William Sound, uh, Sound is Economic Development District was not able to make it, but our other two executive directors are here. Would you join me up front for a minute? I'm gonna catch this question here and we need to, to move on, but I wanted to um, have you and Shirley um, Marquardt and then um, Shirley Kelly, why don't you join us up front too? I want to uh, introduce the faces of those. A quick question. Yes, hi, I'm Ginger Yeshatulu McCormick. I'm Alaska Native Brotherhood Camp 14 Vice President. And I also sit on our way of life committee for Ketchikan Indian community. My question is, is the Mariculture programs nice and it's expanding and you guys are promoting it in Alaska, which the Lummi tribe down in Washington also as well has their oyster farming going and is doing great for them. But our water levels here in Sanya Pond and Tonto Pond here are a little toxic. So I'm wondering where you're going with that. And as well for subsistence, my family's been harvesting seaweed off of our shores in a little ways out via skiff. And there's a lot of your plots that are I looked at online that go over different villages harvesting areas. So not only will you consult with Sea Alaska or Flink and Haida, but maybe the individual tribes that you're close to their islands. Are you doing that type of consultation? Because already the plots that you guys have plotted out online and have access to, I feel like if you can access them in a skip or a small boat, then they probably shouldn't be accessed or purchased or released out for the year. I don't know if Anthony would respond. We'll probably yeah. dive a little bit more into that this afternoon. When we talk about Mariculture. We can get a little more information, but uh, response? Yeah, we, we, we're we a partner in the Mariculture Grant, both Sea Alaska and the Sustainable Southeast Partnership, and, and very excited that Southeast Conference and Julie Decker and all the decades worth of work has culminated in, in these dollars. But um, uh, a contingent of them were on POW a week ago. And so our job is to connect them with the conversations that need to have happen. So Craig Tribe, um, Cloakinia, KCA, HCA, all the entities, they went to Heidelberg, uh, they toured the fish plant. Uh, they're having the conversations like that that need, that need to happen because uh, it, it shouldn't affect a uh, traditional way of life. If you have the conversation early, uh, it, it sh we should be able to work things out and I think the whole entire Mariculture Task Force has committed to that. Uh, the, the farms that are kind of, you know, you see the, the plans. Uh, I don't know if all of those will be developed. I think those have to be re-looked at. Uh, and I think the community input still matters. Thanks. And we're going into these communities' ears first. We're coming to listen. Uh, we talk to the folks from Kassan, uh, and we want to make sure we're going to do, we are going to do individual consultations. So to answer that and be happy to follow up with you as well. But can I introduce uh, Tim Dillon? I'm on the front here, Tim. Uh, my counterpart uh, in the Kenai, Shirley Markport, um, you know, uh, my counterpart at Swampsea, and of course, Shirley Kelly, who's been already been recognized by, but you know, we, we just represent nine different statewide organizations called Arters, but four, there's three of the four um, economic development districts that works with, directly with EDA. Um, Tim, you got uh, something quick to say? Yeah, while we have everyone here, the busiest and hardest working Alaskan is with us today. Over the last couple of years, a lot of these monies would not have come to Alaska without Shirley Kelly. And with her right here. And It's, it's amazing, but whether it was six o'clock in the morning on a Saturday or 1130 at night on a Tuesday, I was getting emails and texts back from Shirley in response to a lot of the questions and things that all four of the uh, economic development districts were working on. Um, 
we have a very close knit group between Robert and Kristen and Shirley and myself. Um, but there's also, we're the four federally recognized districts. There technically are nine statewide organizations also that we play a part of. But we just wanted to take this chance to, to recognize Shirley um, and present her with a, just a small appreciation um, for leadership and economic development, for above and beyond support to the economic development districts, the Alaska regional development organizations, tribes, and communities throughout Alaska. Shirley, thank you for everything you do for us. <laughs> thank you so much. I didn't expect this, but you know, when you become a public servant um, to the federal government, um, it, it's just something that you do. And I got the, um, and I don't know, quite know how to say this, but my father was my greatest example. Um, he was in the military. He also was the longtime postmaster who delivered mail from, um, Naknik to Yagashik by dog sled. And, um, and then he worked in a post office once it was established, but he was my mentor and my example. When you're a public servant, you do what you can do to make sure things happen for improving um, Alaska's lives. <laughs> Just real briefly, um, some of you in this room have worked with Shirley Kelly before, but most of you probably have not. But I guarantee you, every single one of you in this room, your communities, you have been touched by Shirley Kelly. And um, she helped uh, very small communities in my region who had difficulty with you know, understanding the NOFO, working on narratives. And I could send Shirley an email with a paragraph and say, is this what they're looking for? And Shirley, being a professional, won't tell you what they're looking for, but she would say something like, no, <laughs> or, or yes. And so we knew we were on the right track, but um, honestly, if people, you know, I, Shirley Kelly, um, her ability to get funds out to communities that just would not have been able to go through the process successfully was absolutely tremendous. And it's just been a real pleasure working with her and, uh, when she leaves Alaska, we are gonna we're gonna suffer, guys. I'm gonna tell you. She's she's pretty small, but she's got really big shoes to fill. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And would you please give another round of applause for our stellar panel for Shirley Kelly? Thank you, thank you all. Uh, that's truly the type of investment that we want to honor, appreciate, cherish, nourish with the capacity. Could I have the, the broadband uh, panel folks come on up? But Shirley Kelly invests in capacity building at every single level. And I so appreciate that. Um, so good morning. So we, we don't have a lot of time to touch a lot of these topics, uh, but they're all very, very important. So I'll just go ahead and take a, a seat here. We want to engage uh, each of you and, and, and just kind of see where we're at, what's going on, and uh, what, what the future looks like move, moving ahead. So uh, it's really, really exciting. Um, and I'm, I think we'll, we'll start at the far end because I think KPU, our host community, has done some amazing things. You heard reference to uh, this metric of 2% of utilization. Um, so why don't you just take a moment to introduce yourself uh, and what's going on there, and, uh, and then we'll move on this way to, to Mike and some of the incredible projects that uh, are helping to fill in the gaps so that other communities, too, can have this. And then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll hear from Chris on the, uh, on the tribal uh, initiatives as well. So, and then we'll go to break. So don't everybody escape here. And the rest of you that are getting your coffee refilled, let's, uh, let's do so quietly so we can uh, stay connected with our panel. So good morning. Yeah, come on, come on up front here. Oh, good morning, crew. 
Uh, Dan Lindgren, I'm with KPU Telecommunications. We're the broadband provider in Ketchikan. And I thought the best way that I could relay some of our success uh, or where we're at with broadband is just kind of relay some of the successes that we have accomplished through the last years and just kind of uh, where, we, where we started and where we are now. And before I do that, if I see Mayor, uh, past Mayor Sieverton here, but all the city council members, past, present, and Lacey, if you guys could stand up just real quick. So I would just say that they, they deserve a great round of applause because none, none of what I'm gonna be able to share with you today would be possible without the support of those folks. Um, I, I was thinking about how I was gonna present this and I, I thought back to when I was in my early thirties and my first time that I connected to the internet and I had a buddy that's like, oh, have you been on the internet yet? And I said, yeah, I've heard of the internet, but we haven't really done anything. And so I, I had, he brought me this Netscape disc and this was the browser that we we're gonna use. And there was a group of us and we're all huddled around the computer and we, we load our software and we dial a number on the phone and you get that, that dial up connection, right? The, the screeching of the modem that uh, you're connecting to the internet. And I thought, it, it, there, and then we did, there really wasn't much had that happened after that. We went on a couple of blog sites and it's like, oh yeah, whatever. And so that's really where this industry was 20 some years ago. And I've, I've been with KPU approximately that long. And when I started there, we were just uh, launching dial up internet. And that's where we started. There really wasn't a lot of worldwide connectivity at that point. It was mostly voice communications. And so we, we went through and we launched dial-up internet and then we started DSL. And our first iteration of DSL was, it was a slow, you know, 128 kilobits per second or 256 kilobits. Our, our high speed ones were three megs and five megs. And at that time there was really only one transport network in Southeast Alaska and that was AT&T's microwave. And that network's still there and, and operating operating today, uh, but then in, a, in we started upgrading our services. And so we launched a TV service, IPTV, where you're uh, doing linear television over, over internet services. It was the new thing and what the industry was doing. And it didn't take us long to realize that there was a lot of limitations to what we were able to deliver in our little town in Ketchikan. So if, if somebody was out the road quite a ways and they wanted to have two set top boxes, so they wanted to have, be able to watch TV in their bedroom and their living room, well, that was a challenge for them. So we decided that we needed to really up our game. And there was a lot of in the industry that didn't really, they thought, what the heck's KPU doing? So we, with the approval of our, of our council and our city management, we started putting fiber optics throughout the town. So we, with, with our own internally funded capital, we started running fiber up and down every street that we could in Ketchikan. We didn't connect every home to that, that fiber net, network initially. And as customers ordered services that required those higher speeds, we'd, we'd give them a fiber connection. And we've been doing that since 2007, 2008 type timeframe. And now we're to the point where we're fairly well saturated with all our fiber the home network. Well, in between that period, we did get a significant, uh, one of our competitors brought subsea fiber into Ketchikan. And that really, it was, a, it was a great thing for the community. It really introduced competition and made KPU grow quite a bit in our competitive offerings and, and what services we were offering. But it was really expensive, right? So we, we bought capacity on that subsea fiber uh, network and we still do today, but it's expensive. It just really is expensive. But it, it started to get that to where you were putting out higher speed services and you just had to always keep up with the competition. So I think that was a, a really good thing for our town. And some of the other great things that, that we were doing at the time, because of that high cost, we decided we need to get 
start having our own facility. So we engineered a microwave route, our own microwave route from Catch Again down to Prince Rupert. And we had a long a long term agreement with uh, City West down in Prince Rupert. It's similar to us where it's a city owned telecommunications company. And so we partnered with them and built this network from Catch Can down to Prince Rupert. And it's microwave uh, and, and it, it has a limited capacity though. So it, there was, it, it moved us forward, but it, there was still limited capacity. But it gave us enough connectivity to where we always just kept looking for new opportunities in the marketplace. And one of those was Verizon uh, offers a program they call it's an LRA partnership program, LTE in rural America. And we were able to participate in that program where we built the wireless or the cell tower infrastructure in Ketchikan. And then Verizon provided all the core infrastructure from their location down in Redmond Ridge, Washington. And that allowed us to have really good 4G service in Ketchikan through Verizon. And that only, only was possible one because we were progressive in looking at new service offerings, but also because we did have that transport link that gets us down to the lower 48 and the rest of the world. And that kind of brings us to our latest big project. So we, we, we just continue to try to get more bandwidth and more bandwidth and more bandwidth. And our latest big project was uh, a subsea fiber facility that we built from Catch Can down to Prince Rupert. Again, we've had that long-term relationship with them. So with the city council and their approvals, and we went to the voters, passed a bond, uh, had a bond passed to get funding for that project and built that, that fiber down to Prince Rupert. There's 48 fibers. On each two fibers, you can do 2.4 terabits on, with the current technology of the electronics. And you, you just think about the capacity where we started and, and where we are now. It's just really is mind, mind boggling. I, I did a couple stats just because when that first dial up connection was a 56 kilobit per second connection. Now with the, with the, with the catch can one subsea fiber, we now offer gigabit service in Ketchikan. So anybody in Ketchikan can order gigabit services, which, was, which is quite incredible. And then when I ran the numbers, it's 17,000 times faster than that dial-up connection that we had 20 years ago, which is pretty incredible. And the capacity that KPU utilizes for all the customers in Ketchikan, all the cruise ship passengers that connect to our LTE network, that's 6,500 times more capacity that we are of, of digital capacity that we're bringing off island onto uh, the world. And it's just amazing. And it's only going to grow. I mean, you, you think about what the new technologies are bringing. You, you look at meta, you know, what Facebook is doing now with their meta and that. And I can picture these kids with, you know, their VR glasses and they're, they might be fishing or hunting and, and people will be able to do that from anywhere in the world. And I, for any communities that, uh, that aren't as well served as Ketchikan, I'm hoping that this just gives you a kind of an evolution in some of the, the projects and things that we were able to do to move our community forward into this digital economy. Thank you. It is truly incredible what, uh, what you've been able to do here in Ketchikan. And, uh, you know, I'm really excited to have at and CEO with us again and to share some of the ways uh, at and kind of got a, a, a knack for going into the communities that have been kind of left behind and uh, getting in there with uh, internet and phone service and then slowly bringing up uh, the quality and the infrastructure but you guys hit the fast forward button here recently. So I'm excited to hear, uh, hear an update. So Mike, welcome back. Doesn't sound, oh, there it goes. Thank you very much, Robert. And those at Southeast Conference for giving us the opportunity to share what we've been doing. Um, 
I don't know how many of you, you know, know everything about at and and I can't necessarily share everything, but hopefully I say some things that, you know, you didn't know and you learn about at and So I'll start off with that. Um, we're not very creative in names, so at and uh, is uh, Alaska Power and Telephone. That's what it stands for. And some people have asked us, well, why do you have telephone in there? Shouldn't you change it? And I go, well, they don't ask AT&T to change their name, and that's telephone and telegraph. So I think that one's a little older. Um, but we're, we're a company that's employee-owned. Uh, we serve throughout um, Alaska, and sometimes I'm envious of our our friends and neighbors in Ketchikan because all of their customers are in one community. Uh, we serve above the Arctic Circle, Bettles, Alakakit, Latna, um, through Toke, Dot Lake, and Tetlin, down through Skagway, Haines, Petersburg, Wrangell, communities on Prince of Wales Island, um, Metlakatla, Hyder. So it's, you know, it's 1,100 miles from tip to tip. So that's like flying from Seattle to Denver. And as we all know, it being in Southeast Alaska, many of the places have challenges in transportation. Um, but I did, uh, before I give the presentation and we'll only be focusing on telecommunications, uh, we are a power company. So in that key ingredients uh, slide that they have, our purpose for existence is for two of those. And that's energy and low cost energy, renewable energy and providing broadband service, which, you know, it, it's not new to us in the industry, but going back in the past, you know, that meant plain old telephone service or an acronym they used to use called POTS. So, uh, but we wouldn't be able to be able to be doing these broadband initiatives without uh, you know, partnerships and the uh, the support from Murkowski, Sullivan, and God rest his soul, Don Young, uh, our, the community relationships that we have and the tribal partners that we have, uh, USDA, uh, you know, they're all part of the, the partnership in, in providing broadband service going forward. So next slide, please. So, I apologize for the uh, resolution on these these maps. I mean, it's kind of critical to take a look at these maps and to understand, you know, the logistics that we're trying to solve. Uh, you know, it, people that look at these maps all the time, yeah, I could just talk and you know, but uh, lots of times a visual presentation is is a little bit better. But, but as I would think that my uh, illustrious panelists would agree to provide good broadband service, you have to get to the world. Well, how do you do that? And what, well, you know, what do you need to do to get to the world? Well, you need to connect to internet service providers that provide a peering point, and at least in Alaska, the lowest cost peering point, Anchorage. Uh, it's pretty hard to get to Anchorage from Southeast Alaska. Uh, there are some uh, uh, companies that provide that connectivity, but then next in regards to price is Juno. Actually, if you could get to Seattle, that's typically the lowest cost um, source of internet uh, content and connectivity. And then next, uh, a little bit higher in regards to uh, where you might be able to get connectivity to the world is Ketchikan. So our network, uh, prior to the things that we are doing now, we had submarine fiber from Juno, Skagway, and Haines. And what's not shown on this map is a microwave network that we completed in 2009. It goes from Metlakatla up to Skagway. Right now, it has about three and a half gig of capacity or gigabits. Unfortunately, I wish it was only 20, well, if it was only 2% filled, then we wouldn't be doing a very good job. It's 100% filled and it's, uh, we just don't have any more capacity to provide broadband service to get to those points of uh, connection. Uh, we've built out fiber to the home and Skagway and Haines, given the connectivity with fiber. Um, and we've done that in other areas in Southeast Alaska, particularly on Prince of Wales Island, but uh, giving the, uh, the challenge of getting to 
Juneau or to getting to Ketchikan or even Anchorage, you know, uh, it's been harder for us to provide higher speed broadband service. We use technology where there's not any fiber, it's called you bond copper pairs together. So it increases the capacity that you have, but it has a great deal of limitations. Distance from the central office or CO, uh, it just caused uh, challenges with the older technology. So getting into what we're doing now, if you could move on to the next slide. And you'll see what's changed in this slide is a green line going from Juneau to Prince of Wales Island. But uh, this is uh, our round two reconnect project called Sealing. And the primary focus is to provide broadband services to an underserved or unserved communities. So the focus in this uh, grant award was to build fiber to the home to Kassan and Kaufman Cove, uh, who will be directly affected, but the other communities on Prince of Wales Island will also be indirectly benefiting from this project. So there'll be uh, subsea fiber from Juneau landing in Petersburg, crossing Metcalf Island and heading uh, and terminating in Kaufman Cove. We're about a year ahead of schedule and uh, we'll be laying the submarine fiber this October, November. We've been able to work with uh, you know, either competitors or customers, depending on what uh, the hat that you're wearing, GCI, they're building fiber in the Aleutians and we're using some of the same ships to build this infrastructure. But primarily too, Kaufman Cove and Kassan, when we're done, probably in 2024, you know, we'll have fiber to the home. And now I think they have 25.3 provided by um, Alaska Communications, but you know, to a certain extent, it, it's been spotty service. So moving on to the next slide is uh, a grant award that, uh, well, we were awarded from USDA in round three, which just recently closed. And that will bring fiber to the home in, sorry. Uh, fiber to the home in Cloak, parts of Craig, Hollis. It will help um, rebuild some of the terrestrial fiber that we have on Prince of Wales Island. And one of the things that you can see by this uh, map is that there's a connection from two points on Prince of Wales Island to Ketchikan. So with these two reconnect awards, we've been able to get a connection to Juno, which is a low cost peering point, and Ketchikan, which is the next lowest cost peering point. And um, if we uh, move to the next slide, and I, I should go back as a second. I mean, you don't have to move the slide, um, but in the round two award, our investment portion of it is $8 million. Um, there's a $20 million grant from the USDA. In this round three award, We'll be investing $10 million, and there's a, about a $28 million grant from the USDA for that. Uh, this slide shows two things. One is a round three application that we filed uh, with the USDA that has not yet been awarded, but it will help us build out in the haynes Klaquan area and parts of Skagway, which are, you know, the Dai area, if you're familiar with that, it's hard to get to and remote, um, but also help build infrastructure between Haines and uh, Klaquan and the border. But additionally, what we are planning to do is go from the border to Haines Junction, which uh, will enable us to interconnect to Northwest Tell, which can uh, carry us back to Seattle, which actually has fairly low cost uh, peering point there, and also interconnect with fiber that goes back to Anchorage um, through uh, Matanuska Telecom Association's facility. So in essence, if, as we get this done, we'll be able to create, create a, new a new low cost broadband peering point and connect with um, Anchorage and, and Seattle. Uh, that project that's going to go to Haines Junction is about a $15 million investment. 
And uh, certainly there's no grants for that. If we are awarded the round three uh, in Skagway and Haines area, so that's a, a $10 million investment on our part and another 20, about $28 million grant from the USDA. So, you know, that, that's part of our, our main focus, but we aren't done yet. We're, there's a round four. And I guess before I talk about the round four, the early on before we were very or successful with any of the USDA grant awards, we had noticed, you know, there's just a have and have not, particularly on Prince of Wales Island, where we may have been building out our network in Craig, for example, but in, because we were the well, local exchange carrier elect, but traditionally where we provided telephone service, and potentially in Cloac, they had very little service. And we've been trying to find ways to, to eliminate the, the haves and have nots. And through round two and round three, we've done a good job with that, but there's still been a couple of communities on Prince of Wales Island that um, still lacked infrastructure or been able to realize any benefit from the grant opportunities that are available. And in our focus for round four, which applications are due in November, we want to try to focus on the last few communities that we feel that we can get to on, on POW, so Whale Pass, um, Heidelberg, Thorn Bay, uh, those are going to be our focus yeah, in, in round four. So we think that kind of, if we're able to be lucky enough to be awarded a grant there, we'll eliminate at least the haves and have nots in areas where we feel that are our home and the communities that we serve. And so that's kind of what we're, we're trying to do. Uh, thank you again. I appreciate it. And so filling in the gaps, uh, there's been over the last couple of years, some uh, some infrastructure bandwidth made available to tribal um, uh, entities. And Chris, you kind of got the, the, the overview on that to kind of fill in the, the pieces there. So walk us through what that looks like and how that's going to really position our tribes and tribal communities for, for economic benefit in the future. So right. thank, thank you very you. much. Um, upset the audio guys here. So uh, my name is Chris Cropley. I, I know some of you, I'm meeting a lot of you for the first time and I am a tribal citizen and employee of, of tribal um, Clinton and Haida's broadband program title network. I've been at quite a few of these speaking events. It's, it's still very new for me, but this is one of the best audiences ever. So thank you all very much for being such a good audience. It's very appreciated being, being on these uh, panels. Um, we have a, a great opportunity to work together here, and it's one thing I'm learning. It's, it's all about partnerships. We're partnering with uh, ap and GCI, um, and taking all the different pieces that, that, are, that are becoming available to us. Um, wireless spectrum is, is one of them, um, but it takes the backhaul. It takes the cities and industry leaders to, to build that out. So I'm not, I'm not going to get technical at all today. So. Um, I'm going to talk about more uh, high level on, on what we're doing. So our, our leadership had a vision before all of these grants came out and, and decided to hire me and some other people to um, fill in the gaps where it hasn't made economic sense or there wasn't uh, money available to industry. There's billions coming to the state for broadband and we have uh, dedicated millions so far from the CARES and ARPA into uh, starting a pilot program in Wrangell and Sitka to build out uh, wireless broadband um, where, where people have been unserved, almost a, a food bank, if you were. Um, so that's, it's, it's been slow, you know, we're, um, I think we've all, all, are all facing the challenges of supply chain and, um, permitting and all those fun things. So we are, we are working hard on that. Things are really coming together nicely. Some really cool things I will hopefully be able to talk about next year if you have me back. Um, we are um, hiring local contractors. 
service providers, creating jobs, and uh, sorry, without, uh, you know, try not to get into the, ac the acronym soup, right? And it happens with, with technology and grants, and this is really a, a, a meshing of them both. Um, but with the ACP program, we're looking at offering a free service, and I'm throwing that out there, hoping somebody will will come and talk to me about that and, and how that affects our communities and how it's available for um, most providers are providing a program like that. And the uh, I hit on earlier, the digital equity piece, which is the new, the new buzzword digital equity, um, is something that we have been dealing with um, before it was digital equity and we called it digital literacy or, or uh, all kinds of names around it. I think that's that's the real future. I mean, we can talk about fiber and low earth orbit and fixed wireless and all these other fun things, but it really comes down to getting people to use the internet. You know, you have a nerd like me who's always on the internet, always using it, looking up the program and doing this and that sort of thing. We take it for granted. You know, there's a lot of people out there where um, they can leverage it to improve their lives, their business, healthcare, education. And I think that's that's going to be the future. So we do have a consortium of of six tribes right now for a fifty million dollar grant that we'll hopefully get. We, um, if we get that, we will be building out in twenty two different communities in Southeast Alaska. And everybody has a couple questions that I'll answer now, and that is, oh, competition. How are you going to compete with GCI, AP, and T, et cetera? We're not. We're, you know, we're looking where they are not providing service to providing service. So can you run a fiber optic to a boat until the first storm? You can. Um, what about to fish camp? Are you gonna run a fiber optic to a camp of 20 households that's there six months out of the year? Um, the future of wireless is bright. Um, I think we've all seen, uh, incredible leaps and bounds in technology. And I think the future is, uh, is bright when it comes to wireless, low earth orbit and starting to get fiber to, commun to the communities that we haven't had before. And then leveraging that uh, with the education equity piece. So um, I won't get into answering the questions. That's what I got here now. So I'll, I'll leave those alone. So thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, and it's really incredible to see the progress that is, is being built. And I, I want to do a little bit of a shout out to the Denali Commission, too, because they worked early on um, with uh, Central Council to host all the tribes uh, for that initial convening for those conversations that helped kick off uh, this coalition and some of the work that uh, Central Council is carrying on and some of the work that is happening in other parts of the region, providing some technical assistance because these things are way, way complicated. Uh, and you have to understand a lot more than the acronym SOUP in order to really um, make it happen. And so congratulations to uh, each of uh, each, you and on behalf of the region, because our economies and communities can't grow in this global economy unless we have good broadband. We heard that from Mr. Gillum and others as well. So um, you heard him use the word free. So uh, make sure you go and, uh, and talk to him afterwards. Uh, and we uh, hopefully if we have time during the energy uh, panel, we'll uh, touch base with Mike on some of the other projects that are happening in the region. But uh, kudos and congratulations to uh, Ketchikan, just phenomenal uh, beacon of, uh, of what we all want for all of our communities here in the region. So we're gonna go to break uh, till 1030, where we'll come back and talk about Mariculture and the exciting things there. So please, uh, oh, one more thing. Thanks to all of our sponsors. Um, and there, today's swag uh, out there on, on, on this uh, compliments of search, wonderful mugs there. And uh, we want to appreciate the support that we get from each of our sponsors. But so thank them and our panel, please, as we uh, take our break.
All right, let's uh, come on in here and sit down and get ready for some great news and some details. So, all right, one minute warning. Podium one at a time. You got that all figured out. Okay. Now, once upon a time, we had. Okay. Now, let's start over again. Welcome back from the break. Yeah. Yeah. So you you guys get better and better and better all the time because we had to do the whistle yesterday. We had to do the drum beat on the mic uh, yesterday, and then now you guys just coming in. And it's like you know what. We might as well just sit down and get ready for the panel because otherwise Robert will just get more and more obnoxious, keep talking longer and longer and louder and louder because I can do this for a very long time. I have the capacity and the will. And um, so the only thing that will stop me is you being quiet and ready for the great information that we've got on this panel that we're so excited about. There's only three tickets left and Chelsea Galger's got one and uh, Priscilla Morris and Mayor Smith. Oh, look at that, you got three right there. One, two, three. All right, these are winning tickets. Because the worst case scenario is that you're enabling a young person, a student to be better educated at our wonderful university system. So now, yes, and we, got, we got a shout out from the chancellor over here. We're gonna get an update from them later on today. And you know, the, the whole thing about Southeast Conference is our partnerships. And I'm just so, so incredibly proud to see this, everyone here together, the fact that we're just networking like crazy. And so, yes, we're going to unplug for, for this incredible adventure. And I'll tell you, I am the most optimistic person that I know. And uh, most of you know that to be true as well. I try to manage expectations. So when people come with ideas, I'm like, okay, uh, let's just think about this. Let's be realistic. Do some simple math. You know, the United States government says, I got a billion dollars, I'm only gonna give it to 20 of you, and we're gonna get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of applications. And um, uh, what's Alaska really got? You know, the, uh, the odds of Alaska, Southeast Alaska, you know, just do the math, do the math. It's a lot of work. The, the, this application was eight different components. Each one of those was a separate budget, a separate scope of work. And it was like an inch and a half thick. Is that an inch and a half thick? It just felt like that. And we had to redo it like four different times, uh, which gave us hope. It, it drove my CFO nuts, but it gave us hope. It was like, well, if they want that much information and changed it, uh, they must be serious about this evaluation. But at the end of, it wasn't even a year ago, Haynes, annual meeting. I'm doing what I'm doing. And all of a sudden, the godmother of Mariculture uh, as, as we uh, refer to Julie Decker, says, come outside. And I'm like, oh, okay. And she's got a gang out there. So now I know I'm in trouble. She's like, it's our moment. We need to do this application. I'm like, Julie, come on, do the, do the math, you know? Um, but what do you say to Julie Decker? You say, yes, ma'am. You say, yes. And that just began an incredible journey. The, the work that, uh, I know there's a lot of people behind what she's done, but 10, 10 years, I don't know, when did you first give your first Mariculture uh, presentation to Southeast Conference? 2013, almost 10 years ago. And that's all I ever knew about Mariculture was whatever Julie told us at then. That, that's been the face of Mariculture for me. Um, they'll, they'll talk to you about the incredible coalition that came together on very short notice to do an incredible amount of work um, but I'll, I tell you, I'm just so, so very, very proud. And um, Juliana, who, if you haven't met, uh, you should, especially if you have Miracle to Interest, she is our, 
our, she's our point person in managing and facilitating the Mariculture Program. Dan Lesh, you know uh, from McKinley Research, um, uh, the incredible resource that they are on so many different topics, but fisheries and mariculture, uh, it really helped us to, to bring the, uh, the work of the Mariculture Task Force into uh, the data that we needed to put into this application together. So I'm going to get off the stage and turn this over to uh, first, uh, well, I don't know, it's their panel. So please give a hearty welcome to our Mariculture panel. Dan, take it away. Um, well, my slides are coming up. I, my name is Dan Lesh. I'm a senior consultant with the McKinley Research Group. I'll point out some of my colleagues in the room. Uh, Susan Bell's over here with her hands, Heather, Heather Brandon and Simon Marks. Simon's our newest, newest member of our fisheries and mariculture team. Um, you met Rob earlier. That was a great talk about being bullish on Alaska. That's for the fisheries uh, presentation. Sorry, for mariculture, I have a set of slides that were emailed through Juliana. Um, so McKinley Research Group, we formerly known as McDowell Group, celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. Um, <clears throat> very, very exciting. And this has been being involved in the mariculture industry over the last decade or more has been a really a, a highlight of our firm's work in supporting economic development. It's nice to have a growing industry. That's Juliana's, sorry, that's not the right one. Um, and we, um, we bid on a contract that Southeast Conference had out to support them in the development of their phase two application, which is this 49 million that was funded. So our team at McKinley Research Group led a, a team of eight sub consultants that were providing technical assistance, helping develop some of the projects that went into that grant. Um, and I'll show a little bit more about that, but I'm just killing time here too. You want to say something? Dad jokes. <laughs> dad jokes. It's not funny being a dad. <laughs> <laughs> It's, what's the warmest spot in this room? What's the warmest spot in this room? It's the corner. They're always 90 degrees. Uh, yeah, well, if there's an obtuse angle like Robert in the room, that'd be even warmer. <laughs> I'm going to avoid these stairs because they're always up to something. <laughs> well, you know, we got a lot of compliments on the uh, on this on the roof. Uh, you know, shout out for the natural resource industry, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it may not be uh, the the best in the world, but it's up there. Why don't Why don't bears eat clowns? Because they taste funny. <laughs> okay. Oh. <laughs> oh. Why don't oysters give to charity? Because they're shellfish. Well, when the master's in the room, the master's in the room. We, we may have Juliana go first uh, while they find your... Uh, Otherwise, we could just, oh, you got it? Oh, look at that. So Juliana doesn't want to go first, so she fixed it. <laughs> yeah, that's that's uh, the sign of a, just a truly great staff oh, person. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, okay, we're going to end this foolishness. All right. So with that, uh, back to our, our, our mariculture program. And uh, yes. And then we'll, we'll do the fisheries. We're going to try to end shortly before noon so we can uh, get to the lunch line a little bit quicker. I'm going to try to set up an extra line through there so 
we can get our, um, our gubernatorial forum going as, as well. So looking forward just to action crammed, packed rest of the day so you're not disappointed. So we'll just keep at that. So guys, how are we doing? Uh -oh. All right, here we go. All right. Um, yeah, so I just want to set the stage for the talking about this grant and some of the other work that, that's been going on over the years. You can keep going here. Um, already talked about my firm, Kinley Research Group, and you can keep going. Um, I want to talk about the industry, some of the growth scenarios that are possible over the next 20 years, revisit the projections that and the goals that were set uh, five years ago in the Mariculture Development Plan, um, economic impacts of the grant, and talk about and some of that stuff. Keep going. So there were 18 or 20 aquatic farm applications this year, the cycles in the spring from January to April. And that's a record for past, um, since 2017, when, when seaweed came, start farming started, there've been a lot of applications that dropped down during COVID, but it's, it's rebounded now to just above uh, 2019. So we're still recovering from COVID in the mariculture industry, just uh, a note on that, but we're, we're back at where we were, but not probably not the growth trajectory that was 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 on the way for that. These are maps of showing the, the breadth and, and the depth of the coverage of mariculture sites around the state. These are proposed and permitted. Only a few of these are actually built at this point, but it covers out the Aleutians, Kodiak, keep going. Um, and not just in near the cities, but but spread fairly well throughout the regions. And this is, we're just getting started. These are big dots. The actual sites are quite small in most cases. And, you know, if you permit it for 20 acres, your farm is actually 10 acres or something because it's got to be able to float around and stay within its perimeter. So um, the colors, green is seaweed, purple is oysters and uh, or shellfish. And then uh, there's some mixed orange sites that are both seaweed, permitted for both seaweed and shellfish. And all of these regions that you're seeing as, as I go through, go to the next one, are part of the, the region that's part of this grant. So it's not Southeast Conference, Southeast Alaska. It's, it's this, this coalition across Southern coastal Alaska from the Aleutians down to, to Metlakatla. Um, throughout Southeast, I mean, our biggest farms in the state are near Craig, but the, the the potential is throughout the region, and and not just near urban. This is a lot, you know, more remote. If you're close to a dock, but you're remote, that's probably the best place to be in some ways. Keep going. Um, so 2017, I mentioned that year is the first kelp harvest in the state commercially uh, from a farm, and then that's grown significantly. We we've got eight went from four to eight active farms in 2022 with a total harvest of around 560,000 wet pounds of seaweed. So, and then you add in about 80,000 pounds of wild harvest, most of that going to barnacle and, and forage and found. And um, I don't have their numbers in here, so it might be a little higher. And we've got an additional 24 permitted seaweed farms and 23 under review, and that's you know growing every year. So, this is the bench that is going to engage, and, and and it's not too late, you know, for others. But this is this is the folks that are going to engage in this mariculture industry as it develops. Keep going, and then oysters. Um, you know, we've had this industry has been in the state for a decade or a century. Um, this data only goes back to '92, but you can see a fairly level around a million oysters sold. Um, 1.5 in 2022, but big COVID hit there in 2020 and 2021 with dropping our visitors and things like that. So about 1.1 million in sales in 2022, we estimate. Keep going. And then, of course, um, you you think about maricultures. There's also this. We're starting doing most all the life cycles of these organisms. So there's the hatchery and nursery side of things. And that extends the economic impacts of the industry. So there's four seaweed hatcheries in the state, produced 420,000 feet of seeded string, six um, oyster nursery slash flepsy operators. They're buying imported larvae and, and seed and growing it up bigger and then 
growing it up even bigger and getting it out to farmers. Um, about 9 million baby oysters went into, into farms you know, last year. So in the technologies that, that, that these guys are working with are in flux. There's a lot of you know, a demand for bigger and bigger oyster seed to go into the farms. There's potential for a revolutionary change in, in seaweed uh, nurseries through direct seeding coming in five years or something like that. There's just a lot of innovation and adaptation that's gonna happen, happen throughout the mariculture industry. This is just one example. And then the various other species besides oysters and seaweed. This is the, this sector is really where the, that experimentation happens most um, actively. Keep going. So totals up to about 1.5 million in sales, and we're talking about putting in 49 million just through this one grant. It's a sobering comparison of numbers. I, I don't think you're awake if you're not thinking about this. We have to. It's a big challenge, but there's a really good reasons why this makes sense. But it's important to remember there's so much. So many questions, and it's such a uh, unique situation where you've got this this opportunity, um, but it's starting from a fairly small base. Keep going. Um, you can see as we go project out into the future, if we get if we the status quo growth trajectory, which you know we this was developed by McKinley Research Group for Build Back Better grant application, um, gets us out to. I mean, from 1.5 to 20 million or so sales in 20 years um, with aggressive public sector and private sector uh, financial investment and policy investment and adaptation. Um, we think we can get the larger volume markets to work and technologies associated with them into the state and get it up to 200 million in, in, in sales and 500 million in, in potentially within 20 years that, so I, I think the Mariculture development plan a while ago was targeting hundred million in sales in 20 years. I think there's a chance of doing that within 10 years from, from the start of this, this grant investment and all the work that's been done over the last few years. Keep going. And when translating that into jobs, we're talking about 1800 jobs in 20 years, 325 million in economic output with the potential for a high case scenario. So we're projecting with all these investments, this mid case scenario, but there's definitely a potential for, for higher. Uh, so 325 million to a 850 million industry is roughly what, what we're looking at um, if, if we're successful collectively. Keep going. And, you know, this is the chart that was in our in our grant application showing showing that, and just a note on the, the last column there, the private investment leverage. So, you know, this isn't gonna be built from 49 million in federal money. This is a catalyst for reducing the risk for private investment to come in and, and participate in this industry. And, you know, I think we're sort of willing this industry into existence in some ways, but it's gonna happen somewhere in the world that the needs for, and the, the types of, the utility of seaweed and the, and, and, uh, the need for additional food sources is so strong and, and it, climate change is exacerbating this. It's going to happen somewhere and that we're, we're trying to seize our moment as Alaska to, to be that place where it happens or one of the, the key places where it happens. Keep going. So just a little bit of an example of how we're, we're approaching this, how these, how these conferences approach this. There's a need to build a coalition around the whole state and bring in ideas and technology from out across the country and across the world. They had a technical assistance team I mentioned briefly, but these are some of the names that were on it. We had people from uh, Jeff Hedrick with Lutic Pride Marine Institute in Seward. We had some of our most experienced seaweed farmers in Kodiak. Cordova engineer from Maine. We had Tiff Stevens from right here. And James Crimp from Maine and Washington, Bobby Hudson. So we just we compiled this team with, with like two weeks notice, and then we sprinted it all together to come up with ideas and address questions that Studies Conference and the different coalition members had about you know how much do we need for flipsies? How many flipsies might you know? What's the demand for seaweed seed? What's the capacity of the nurseries? Any, any question or how can, can you develop a a way to help? create more data on seaweed farms so we can figure out what, what makes a successful farm. 
Um, so we just tapped into this team and tried to take a, a very broad perspective. Um, this is over, but these, these networks still exist of, of people. It's been really fun to work with them. Kudos to all those that contributed. And then there's just similar efforts that have to happen. And Julie will sort of give you a taste of some of the networking that, and, and Juliana on the coalition that's happening, but very, it's very much a statewide approach, bringing in the best ideas. Thank you. All right, thanks, Dan. Um, also earlier, uh, that was not an accident distraction, so I didn't want to go first, so side, there's something in there. All right, um, my name is Juliana. I work for Southeast Conference, and I've been with Southeast Conference for the last year and a half or so, and um, like Robert was describing uh, annual meeting last year, we, we were approached by Julie and some of the others in the industry about um, putting this application in, and then Robert told me, guess what, your job is going to be working on Mariculture. And so I've spent the last year um, learning as much as I could as quickly as possible um, so that we could be um, helpful in putting this application together. So behind me, you'll see this is a, a, just a snapshot of some of the partners that we've worked with um, putting this application together. Um, and many of you are actually here in the room. Um, so it's really exciting to be here uh, with you to celebrate this along with our District 10 uh, director and uh, Sheba back there somewhere and, and Shirley Kelly, who you met earlier. Um, it's a really exciting moment for all of us here um, to celebrate this, this new opportunity. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as you've heard uh, from the, um, a few of us already that this is a $49 million uh, project, um, but this does not reflect also the uh, cash and in-kind match from several other uh, partners. Um, and that in-kind match is staff time and facility space, people who have come, come together to um, wanna jump in and help see this project get off the ground. Um, next slide. Um, a little bit of context. Um, you heard earlier from Sheba a little bit uh, that we are, this, this coalition's um, project is one of 21 uh, that were uh, selected to move forward into this uh, phase. And um, originally there was 529 applications, 60 finalists in phase one. And then here we are uh, with the 21. Um, and um, it really is a testament to the group that we put that we pulled together to be able to put this application in about three months. And so, um, uh, actually, on that, um, if you know, if you have questions about, um, hey, our, our name wasn't on there. We want to be involved in this project. We specifically designed the project so that we can still go back into um, different communities and anyone that's interested in. And being involved, there's still plenty of room, and we re we really want to see more more people on that uh, on that board and those partnerships. Uh, next slide. So this is just a really quick snapshot of the projects. We have um, eight total projects, and they're divided here. You can see um, we have a revolving loan fund uh, that's going to be specifically geared towards the financing needs of the mariculture industry. Um, we have a governance and coordination and outreach, um, which represents uh, all of our partners. We really want to make sure that each of the regions and each of the communities are represented in the decisions that are made and the resources that are allocated. Um, workforce development, of course, is a huge issue and we wanna be able to equip um, Alaskans to be able to take advantage of these opportunities and be prepared to really to launch into them. Um, we have a research and devel development uh, component project that Dan alluded to a little bit earlier. There's a lot of research that needs to happen to make sure that we're, we're optimizing um, our existing processes and lowering the risk for folks to be able to get involved and to do so uh, in an economical way. Uh, next slide. And then uh, here we have a marketing uh, program because we really need to get the word out there about what Alaska is doing. Because like Dan said, we want um, this, this new uh, industry and opportunity to happen here in Alaska. So we have some funds going to marketing. We have a green energy component. Um, as this uh, industry is developing, we wanna take uh, the opportunity here in the early stages to find ways that we can um, develop the, the, the uh, industry in as green as a way as possible. And that's um, going into existing farm sites and doing assessments. How can we make your operations more efficient? How can we get you moving away from relying on fossil fuels? And so we wanna have that in integrated into the project as we, as we develop. Um, big ticket item here in equipment and technology. There's a lot of equipment that's needed um, to really get to scale um, 
uh, specifically where there's a project in there for um, DEC to get some uh, equipment for testing for PSP um, in a much more efficient and a broader way. And so that's one exciting thing that will be good for, for everyone. Um, and then the last piece is just the, the management. Um, this is also my plug. We really, we need some help. Uh, and so if, if you or if you know anyone that's interested and excited about Mariculture and wants to get involved in this program, we uh, would love <laughs> any anyone that's interested. So, uh, uh, oh, and the, the project period, it begins October 1st. And then we have a four-year timeline that we're working with. Um, so it's, it's fast, um, but I think with the right partnerships, that we can really make the most of this, this opportunity. Uh, next slide. Um, one other thing too that's really cool about this project is um, we were able to sort of have some flexibility in the way that we um, structured our projects to, to not allocate resources and funds specifically. Um, and so that we can still have time to meet with community members and folks who wanna be involved in the industry and find out you know, how, what does Mariculture look like for you in your community? How do you want it to grow? What are the resources that are available with this project that, that is a good fit for your, your community? So we are really prioritizing having that time to be able to build relationships and trust um, to see that the re resources are um, available and distributed in a way that's um, reaching everyone that wants to be involved. Um, next slide. I think that's it. <laughs> uh, just really brief. I know we're on a crunch. Um, but if you guys have any questions at all or interested in hearing more about any of the projects, please feel free to email me or find me or, or Dan or Julie or anyone. So anyway, thank you all and hope you enjoy the next pre presentation. I know you will. Very funny, whoever that was. <laughs> Um, hi, everyone. Really nice to come back to Southeast Conference. I always feel like I'm coming home. Um, it's like family. I can't remember. I honestly can't remember the exact year that I came to my first Southeast Conference. I think it was 97. Um, at the time, I was one of the younger ones in the room. So now it's time to start recruiting for more, more 20 year olds to come to Southeast Conference. But um, it's a pleasure to be up here at this moment in time. Um, we've been working on the Alaska Mariculture Initiative since 2013. That was the very first time I ever got in front of a group and said the word mariculture. So without ado, we'll, we'll, we're gonna roll through quite a few slides. So next one, please. Um, so the group that I work for, Alaska Fisheries Development Foundation is a nonprofit that broadly represents Alaska seafood industry in the area of research and development. So we work with harvesters, processors and support sector businesses to like address challenges that are you know, bigger than any one company or any one sector or any one fishery. Um, we've been around since 1978, and these are some of the areas that we work in. Oh, thank you. That's great. Um, and the Alaska Mariculture Initiative um, is an area that we started working in at about 2000. Well, it was, it was 2013 in the spring when our board had a strategic planning session and uh, thought about where, where the industry has changed, what were the new challenges, what was what was good for industry, but also communities and the environment. And when we were looking through those lenses, mariculture kept raising to the top. So I always think it's important to be very clear about what we mean by the word mariculture. It is aquatic farming, enhancement and restoration of shellfish and seaweed. Pinfish farming is prohibited by state law, so that is not what we're talking about. But these are some of the species that have had some activity in the state of Alaska, and there's many other types of things also that are, are sort of eligible under this, um, under mariculture. So why were we interested in this in the first place? And I kind of mentioned that in the, the AFDF um, strategic planning session. Um, it's, it's about the benefits and opportunities for Alaskans, and we keep that front and center. This is something that can benefit Alaskans in many, many different ways. And it's kind of like, depending on your interest and even their creativity of, of how you apply this, um, it can be helpful in many different ways. Um, and here's an example. Hump Island Oyster Company here in Ketchikan builds a floating oyster bar at their farm. And so they're taking two industries that are traditionally kind of thought of as conflicting, like conflicting uses, and they're actually putting them together and it's working really well. 
Um, so th that's a really cool example of thinking kind of outside the box um, and putting, putting mariculture to work for you, however that is best. So we recognized at the beginning of this initiative that we had to get a big group of people to actually move the needle. Um, so working together was really important. Uh, and I wanted to say, take a moment here, there are so many people in this room that had a role in this to where we are right now. I see Ed Duville right here. He was on the Mariculture Task Force as well for several years um, during the really not fun, not sexy planning time, you know, and we're having lots of meetings and that's not like fun work, but it was really necessary. And in fact, if we hadn't done that, we wouldn't have been prepared for this EDA opportunity. So really, really important. And many, so many in this room. So I'm sorry, I don't call you all out, but you know who you are and you've played a role. Uh, let me go back. So um, this is kind of just a timeline of different things, steps that we came, gain, steps that we went through. Um, a big one was um, Governor Walker um, getting on board and, and establishing the Mariculture Task Force um, and Governor Dunleavy continuing to support that effort as well. That really gave us the, the legitimacy to sit at the table with state agencies and many other partners in like a proactive, you know, cooperative way. Um, now, in 2022, we've created, to take the place of the Mariculture Task Force, there's a new nonprofit called Alaska Mariculture Alliance, or AMA. Um, they are going to be taking the lead in, in guiding the, the development of this industry going forward, and they just hired an executive director, and they have a Sea Grant fellow um, that they're hosting as well, so now they have two full-time positions, and they are hitting the ground running. Uh, so this was our final report to the governor with lots of, you know, documents and kind of like, you know, all of these conversations for over six years, all compiled into one. Um, but it was helpful to sort of get everybody on the same page. Um, and, you know, there are a set of six guiding principles that led this work. Um, I can't remember them all off the top of my head, but uh, Ginger asked a question earlier today. Um, and compatibility is one of the guiding principles, as well as Alaska Native part, uh, participation. And so it, it is things that we're thinking about. Um, we don't have perfect answers for everything yet, and there will be challenges along the way, but we have commitments to try to work on those issues and try to work together toward, the, toward, toward solutions. Um, so again, I mentioned this, this, some of the critical support we had was some high, you know, high highliner folks here, um, uh, bridging two different administrations, um, as well as congressional support. Um, and we've had, we've got three bill signings up here. Um, these are three separate uh, bills related to mariculture. And um, Representative Ortiz, I think is in the room, but he had a huge hand in all of these. I mean, talk about someone that sticks with something. One of the bills took seven years to pass. Um, so him and his staff were huge, huge help. Okay. And now looking back a little bit and kind of tallying up like what are some of the major accomplishments at this point? Um, these are just some things to call out. This does not represent everything that's going on by far, but you know, the total price tag here, these are funds secured over $110 million. This is really a moment that's going to launch all of those plans that we, you know, we put together. Um, this is really going to enable all of those plans to move forward. So it's really, really exciting. Um, it, as well as at those top bullets are all the different po new positions created. Um, and I know there's sometimes tension between industry and government and people don't want to see necessarily bureaucracy built, but sometimes you need those, those things, those people to help you um, help industry grow as well. And so we have these actually laid out in our plan. Um, we need support within the state, within the university to do training, to do research. And so all of these things are actually going to enable more industry growth. And it was planned that way. So one of the challenges right now is that we need more seaweed buyers and processing. We now have more farmers interested and people are growing seaweed pretty successfully, um, at least some of the species. Uh, so this is these are just some of the documents we've worked with McKinley Research Group and, and others, Alaska Sea Grant, um, to try to enable 
and look at and facilitate people coming to the state and, and processing seaweed or some of our companies within the state starting to process seaweed. Um, here's a couple of examples of other companies that um, are doing things outside of the state that we've been engaged in conversations with about them coming to Alaska. If we have, you know, if we're producing relatively soon tens of millions of pounds of seaweed, that has to go somewhere and we'll never get to that kind of production unless we have companies buying it because people just won't grow it if they're just gonna have to throw it away, it doesn't make sense. So um, we've done some field trips recently, uh, London and Scotland, um, a company called Oceanium is working to develop kind of a new way to process or, or biomanufacture seaweed. Um, and uh, we, I was able to visit their processing facilities and their laboratories. Um, pretty, um, a, a pretty impressive company, I would say. Uh, they're working on, it's hard to see in the one picture with the guy in the lab coat, um, but the other guy is holding like a roll of plastic that's made out of seaweed. Um, there's still a lot of challenges around that. Um, it's great because it's biocompostable, but also you can't put wet stuff with it, like foods, right? Because then it degrades. So, you know, so they're trying to work those things out into what, you know, what things is it best for? And, you know, you can put films on it or additives, but, you know, trying to keep it as natural as possible. So those are all like prototype, you know, product research and development that's going on. Uh, another thing that we need to do is our techniques for growing bull kelp are not that great yet. Um, so we need to work on that. And there's actually a couple of grants funded right now to do that work, but the bull kelp will enable some of our local companies like Forage and Found and Barnacle Foods who are doing excellent, excellent products um, in the marketplace. It will enable them to grow. Uh, Dan talked a little bit about the fact that we're not just talking about Southeast. We're talking about sort of Southeast, South Central and Southwest. Um, and he talked about, you know, farms in each area. Um, so I want to talk just a minute about scale. Um, there are kind of two camps. Some people are really excited about scaling up this industry. And then some people are worried about scaling up the industry. And what, what does it mean? We have started to have some of these conversations within the state, outside the state. Um, I just came from a conference in Maine. It was the first international seaweed conference in the United States. And so these issues are, are starting to be talked about a lot and they need discussion. Um, this is what I showed in Maine though, right? Scale means different things in different places and it needs to be in context. This actually got a gasp by people in Maine. <laughs> and then I went to this slide <laughs> um, and you know, it's, you gotta have perspective on these things and um, it's hilarious to listen to Mainers because they are like, we've got so much coastline. And it's like, you're so cute. <laughs> but anyway, I, I, so the conversations really need to be contextualized, right? And then, and then this is in the EEZ, which is, you know, off 200 miles offshore is the US EEZ. And you can see, again, Alaska, the blue, we have most of the EEZ for the entire country. So. Um, what does that mean? I mean, a lot of people are excited about coming to Alaska, but again, we need to be like thinking about balance and what's right and what we, what we actually want in our communities. Uh, but one thing I found this in a very old presentation, um, the red is the, is the thing I want you to think about. Um, it says the failure to understand fundamental economic issues lies at the core of problems with fishery policy and practice. So you know, and this isn't fisheries, but it's on the water in the marine environment. Um, and I think some of that um, plays into how we figure out our policies going forward. And I think there's gonna be a lot of discussions and things will change over time. Um, but keeping in mind, we need to think about the economics and how it's relevant to how we develop the industry. And then I also, I mean, we're commercial salmon fishermen. Um, I think about the salmon industry as an example you know, it's not apples to apples, it's not the same, but it's an interesting example. One thing is very different, it's evolved over 150 years or more. Um, but, uh, and right now, mariculture is, you know, a very small number of people, and we hope that those numbers grow, you know, of people that are actually actively um, participating in the industry and making money from it in coastal communities. 
but um, you know, it, it can give us some things to look back on, um, some things that were good, done well, some things that had unintended consequences, maybe not so good. You know, so we just we need to be thinking about the past and then where we want to go in the future. And I don't have the answers. So again, you know, we need to be having these discussions as a community. Um, but in this slide, this is a picture of, of Kodiak. There's three seaweed farms here, you know, and amongst the harbor and the boats and things going on, and you don't even see them. Um, so, it, it, you know, how we look at this, again, needs to be rationalized um, and, and, I mean, thought of carefully. Um, but it, we need to think of how we want it done, how it's going to affect our communities. And I keep in my mind um, our kids, you know, like we're doing this so that our kids and our grandkids have new industry that's forward looking, that's additive to what we do already. The next panel is going to be, I think it's the next panel is fisheries or the one after that, I can't remember. But, you know, it's additive to our seafood industry right now. Um, it's renewable, it's just, you know, sustainable if we do it correctly. Um, and so keeping in mind, you know, this is not for us. We're working hard to make something of value for our kids. That's, I think, what will lead us in the right direction. Thank you for your time. So very, very exciting. There's so much we could talk about for so long. I'm going to invite you to do that during the breaks and during the evenings. And you just have to green the, you need the green button. Like magic. Um, I just want to say there was a little bit of revisionist history with Robert's description of what happened last year. <laughs> but I remember him being really grumpy when we were asking him to do this. And he wasn't exactly like, yes, ma'am. So don't let him fool you. <laughs> well, I got there. I got there. <laughs> No, um, I and we will set aside more time during the session summit, and we're going to have a number of meetings along the way throughout uh, the days and months and weeks ahead. Uh, so we we'll just really do invite anyone with an interest to reach out and uh, and contact Juliana. Any, uh, and I'm going to ask the fishery panel folks to go ahead and come on up here. If you guys have final words you want to put out there, go ahead. Yeah, push the yeah, you are. yeah, hello. There was a question earlier about subsistence resources and seaweed and farm siting. Um, I just make a note that you, know, you 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 generally these farms are in 100 feet of water or more, so they're they're not going to be right on top of existing seaweed beds. They're going to be expanding the um, creating new seaweed habitat. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of issues to work out, but I just want to mention that. And we are mindful of that. We'll be respectful of that as well. Um, we are missing our, our fish and game uh, participants. So repeat the question for folks. You, Marcos is saying that uh, mariculture is actually last in line, so it, it all the existing uses of the sites need to be documented and then taken care of first before you can add in a, a mariculture facility. So we have Ashley and uh, Chris <laughs> and Katie. You want to take that? Distributing the the products that are produced. Yeah, that that's all in in development. I think there's there's a focus on higher end, kind of smaller volume products, and initially, um, but we're seeing products developed that are not just dried seaweed. They're they're also using uh, frozen seaweed and things like that. So. Um, seaweed is 90% water, so transportation is a critical topic. So, uh, did anybody touch on the the climate benefits of uh, just the carbon sequestration? Uh, what, what's the what's the fact what you can throw out there? And we'll we'll move move on. Um, so, there, 
you know, there's debate and, and work to like document the research side of this, but in general, um, people do believe um, pretty strongly that seaweed adds like habitat to the environment. It's actually beneficial for fish and, and other creatures. Um, it, it sort of takes up a excess nutrients that may or may not be that big of a thing in Alaska, but it, it's big in other areas. Um, and then it, it, it's possible that it's can be sort of buffering to the, the waters, in other words, kind of reducing ocean acidification. So there's, you know, continued work on that. Um, Dan, do you want to add anything? We, let's keep, let's do we move on, or do you want? Um, I would just say that, you know, one, one of the things we're funding in this is looking, trying to look at an Alaska specific study about carbon sequestration through seaweed. Um, uh, in addition, the products that we're replacing in the in the in, in the marketplace are high carbon intensive products. So we're creating alternatives to those. So um, the, while creating some local benefits for the ocean, you're also offsetting uh, and reducing demand for some really destructive products out there. Yeah, thanks. Um, and I'll say this wonderful fish tie that I just had coffee with. This is Peel's fundraising for the uh, scholarship fund, which we'll be able to do again tonight. Um, my my depth of knowledge on fisheries is even less than Miracle Fish. So I've asked uh, Julie Decker, who's the executive director for the Alaska Fisheries Development Foundation, to facilitate uh, the rest of this conversation. And we want to um, get this, uh, through this as quickly as we can. Because, yeah, can we take however you want to do it. If you want to do it at the table or up, up here, uh, just, just we want to make sure we. we um, I guess you can either come to the mic, you guys, or stay seated, whichever is more comfortable for you. But we're going to start. We have a little slight change. Um, Forrest Bowers from the Department of Fish and Game could not be with us. So Dan Lush is going to give us um, a quick overview of some stats that are relevant to the southeast region. While those are being pulled up, that was that email I sent or the link online. Um, this is some work that ASME, Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute, commissioned um, weekly updates to, on the salmon harvest throughout the state. And those are available on their website. You can also get an email list to get a, get a reminder sent to you each time there's a new one. Um, but one of the services that McKinley Research Group provides under a, a, long, a long, go, long going relationship and contract with ASME. So overall, we're at 96% of what was forecasted for the year, 100% for sockeye. That's that's sort of the big banner year. Um, Bristol Bay leading the charge there at um, more than slightly more than even than their giant forecast. Um, you can see here if you look at sockeye, Bristol Bay, 500. And it's actually I think it's over that now, but um, 60 million plus sockeye harvested. So you can go to the next slide. Uh, th this is where you can see the current year, like for sockeye up in the upper right, you can see these these are stat weeks, statistical weeks. So basically uh, July 4th is somewhere in that in that peak there. And for sockeye, and we're, we're above the five-year average. We're quite a bit. We're above last year quite a bit. Um, and then you look at the other species, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, Coho's is the one that is the farthest off of the recent years, so we're still not seeing the numbers we want there. That some component of that is effort related from the fishermen, but um, also the returns. Pink salmon, you know, comparing to 2020, we came in fairly similar. If you go, but but improved compared to 2020. Um, the five-year average is, is distorted by the, the even odd cycle of abundance. Um, the Kita salmon or chum salmon, we had some strong periods and less of a bimodal peak than, you know, less of a summer and fall uh, differentiation than normal. Um, if you go, can you go back to the previous page? It shows, so for, it were 5% above 2021 for Kita for harvest, 10% above the 2020, which is the last even year. So 10% above that for, for pink salmon, 30% above previous year. You can kind of see how to how to read this chart. But overall, um, a fairly good year for the statewide, but there are um, certainly still issues within certain regions and 
you know, sockeye is booming in Bristol Bay, but still not where it needs to be in other areas. Just trying to set the stage a little bit with some data for other folks here. Okay, thanks, Dan. Um, and in the vein of setting the stage, um, you know, southeast through to this region, uh, the value of the seafood industry is about six hundred fifty million dollars. So, you know, you got to take the comparison with mariculture, a little grain of salt. Like seafood, the seafood industry is still a very big traditional um, pillar, uh, economic pillar for the region um, and the state as well. Thousands of people employs you know, 60,000 people statewide, 9,000 fishermen, um, big deal. It's a big deal. So uh, along those lines, um, next speaker, we have Katie Harms. She's the executive director of DIPAC. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Katie Harms. I feel like my whole tenure as executive director has been shrouded in mystery because I've been hiding and not going to public meetings because of COVID. So here's my face for those of you who haven't met me. <laughs> I haven't met yet. Um, I've worked for DIPAC uh, year round since 2014. My previous role there was tourism and education manager and started as executive director in 2020. So thank you for having me. So um, for those of you unfamiliar with DIPAC, I'm just going to speak briefly about DIPAC and then get a little bit into Southeast Alaska's hatchery program as a whole, and then a brief uh, touch on Alaska's hatchery program as a whole, greater statewide program. So um, for DIPAC in particular, we're a private nonprofit corporation. We have a board of 25 members, um, and our mission is to sustain and enhance the valuable salmon resources of the state of Alaska for the economic, social, and cultural benefit of all citizens and to promote public understanding of Alaska salmon resources and salmon fisheries through research, education, and tourism. Mm -hmm. It's a big mission. We do, <laughs> do a lot for a small company. So a little bit of a horse historical background for any of you unfamiliar. Um, DIPAC started as a small mom and pop hatchery in our founder's backyard on Douglas Island raising pink and chum salmon. So that's what DIPAC stands for, Douglas Island Pink and Chum. Uh, 1976. Uh, so that was just right across the bridge um, on Cowie Creek. And in 1980, Sheep Creek Hatchery was constructed. Um, that's kind of in the Thane neighborhood. Um, it was demolished in 2015 after we added our rearing facility at, um, at Macaulay Salmon Hatchery. So in 1989, Macaulay Salmon Hatchery was built and um, that facility um, now houses uh, King Coho and mostly Chum Salmon. And then in 1996, DIPAC did assume the state operational contract for Snedisham Hatchery, um, where we raise uh, sockeye salmon. That's our Macaulay overview and Snedisham. I'm gonna, I got really overzealous on the clicks here, so I'm gonna click through. So our educational initiatives, I mentioned that was a part of our mission. Um, back in 2012 and um, 2013, we had a, quite a few years of great fish returns leading up to um, our, for our cost recovery and as well as for the fishermen of Alaska. And we're able to invest some money into scholarship programs. So in, starting in 2011, um, our board invested into a uh, scholarship fund where we now um, donate around uh, 60,000 annually, sometimes a little bit more um, for baccalaureate and vocational education scholarships for people interested in fisheries and um, conservation. Um, so to date, uh, just over 70 uh, baccalaureate scholarships and vocational scholarships have been awarded, um, around uh, $720,000 total. As well as um, we do have a fellowship program that was um, instated in two, 2013. Um, so far, uh, three fellowships have been funded through that program. And since 1992, our visitor center at Macaulay Salmon Hatchery hosts lots and lots of school group programs. There's two annual programs. Um, throughout the pandemic, they went virtual, but we're excited to have them back in person again. And we used to have some high school programs as well. We opened up our doors again this year and had a, quite a few visitors, so it was nice to get back to somewhat normal. So just a little bit of a background for those of you unfamiliar. Um, at Macaulay Salmon Hatchery, we do have an egg take goal of 135 million chum salmon. Um, we do 
thermal mark 100% of these fish. So those of you unfamiliar with fisheries, there's a lot of science that goes into these programs to make sure that we are, are supplementing and not replacing wild stock. So this is one of the tools that's used by fisheries managers to determine what's a hatchery fish and what's a wild fish. And so uh, we change the temperature of their water and their incubation tray. It lays a mark down on their ear bone and we can track these fish. Um, so these chum salmon go out every year and are harvested by fishermen. Um, Chinook and coho are raised there as well. And you can see these numbers are extremely different, 135 million chum and around a million king and a million coho. And people often ask, why is that? Why don't you raise more king salmon? That's what we want. Um, but they, uh, they take an extra year in fresh water. You probably know a lot about salmon life cycle. So that's uh, the reason it takes a lot of area, a lot of water, a lot of money to raise those species. Uh, sockeye salmon are raised down at Snedisham Hatchery. Um, we release about 9 million smolt there every year. This is the only sockeye hatchery in Southeast Alaska currently. We also uh, manage a um, transboundary river program for the Pacific Salmon Treaty where we receive eggs and release them back into Canadian lakes as a part of an international agreement with Canada. These are also thermal marked. So this is a little bit about our contribution. I know Julie was talking about just fisheries contributions in Alaska are huge. So I won't get into the numbers too much. You guys can um, ask me any questions after or in the break. So I'll just kind of cruise through these. Um, people oftentimes think that hatcheries are mostly impacting the commercial fleet. Of course, by the numbers we are, uh, but there is great value to the sport fleet as well. Anyone that lives in Juneau or spent time there, they see people, uh, fishing from shore all the time, all around the channel. There's lots of, lots of shoreside fishing access. So getting into a little bit more of the um, Southeast Alaska hatcheries as a whole. Um, so DIPAC is a private nonprofit, non-regional hatchery program. Um, there's also SARA, Southern Southeast Regional Aquaculture here in Ketchikan and INSERA, uh, Northern Southeast Regional Aquaculture Association in Sitka, as well as Armstrong Kita, um, which is on the southern end of Baranoff Island. So this is kind of the hatchery releases by the numbers. As you see, chum salmon are the, are the largest uh, group there. And this is a little bit more of the economic impact of these programs. So uh, the vast majority of the vast majority on a yearly basis is from uh, chum salmon. This is the ex vessel value to the commercial common property fleets. So it's a huge economic driver for the South, uh, for Southeast Alaska as well as Alaska as a whole. You see that dip down in 2020. Um, 2021 was a much better year at ex vessel value wise as well as return wise. And 2022 of course isn't totally wrapped up but we are moving in an upward trajectory again which is a positive sign that year 2020 just really kicked Southeast in a lot of ways. So we're getting back on the right track. Um, this just gives a, well, I should have changed this to McKinley Research Group. McDowell Group did a report for us quite a few years ago of just the sport and personal use um, numbers as well. So quite a lot of value to those people on the, on the road system, fishing from boats and just filling their freezers. I won't get into too much detail on this, it's a little complicated, but I just wanna basically um, just reference the, the various hatcheries and how much they work to make sure what we're doing is a positive impact economically, as well as making sure we're supplementing and not replacing wild stocks of salmon. So um, we do data sharing with other organizations like Sarah and Insura, um, DIPAC, as well as the other hatcheries collect um, samples in season to determine what the proportion of the hatchery fish is in the, in the run, the age class, and all sorts of things to forecast for the next year's um, runs to help processors plan and fishermen plan, and uh, a whole lot of science goes into these programs. And adf &G isn't here today, but I just wanted to mention um, there is a long-term uh, study going on. It's close to $20 million at this point that's been invested in this program, the Hatchery Wild Research Project. Um, this is adf and G organized project to implement and study key knowledge gaps in hatchery and wild interactions. Um, they're getting towards the tail end of this research, all the field work in Prince William Sound's wrapped up and we're working towards finishing up um, chum salmon in Southeast Alaska. Um, I'm not gonna get into too many of the details on this study at this time, but um, it's just kind of an important 
thing to note, um, there's a lot of negative press about Alaska's hatchery programs. Um, and this is one of those projects that's working towards understanding what the actual impacts are of hatchery and wild interaction. So if you're interested in learning more about that, um, there's a link um, and you can also contact me um, after the meeting, I can give you more information. So just a broad overview of where these hatcheries are. In 2021, there are 30 active hatcheries in the state of Alaska. 26 of those are private nonprofit. So you can kind of see where these are in Southeast Alaska. Um, 11 of those 26 are state owned facilities that are managed by private nonprofits. So a lot of partnership going on between the state of Alaska and Alaska's hatchery program. Um, this is kind of just the big picture. You can kind of see a historical perspective of Alaska's salmon fisheries. So this graph goes way back, kind of what Julie was talking about, the economic impact and the amount of salmon being caught. Um, in the 1970s, there was a huge decline in salmon populations across the state. So a lot of things happened then to try to improve the fisheries and create some rebounds. One of those things was the creation of um, the Fisheries Re Rehabilitation Enhancement Development Division at Fishing Game to try to start these hatchery programs and the private nonprofit hatchery program began. Over time, you see the wild stock harvest um, and the yellow bars there has been fairly high and the hatchery harvest in the blue, which is kind of the icing on the cake to help um, stabilize on the years where they may not have quite as uh, abundant wild stock harvest. That's my presentation. Thank you very much. And I will talk to you later. We love our salmon hatcheries. And um, if anybody ever tries to give you a gotcha moment and you know say negative things about our salmon hatcheries, remember we do things differently in Alaska. We have a very precautionary approach. We have systems in place that make them manage very well. And it's why we, are, we can continue to have um, seafood sustainability certification for our salmon fishery. Not just one, but we have two in place. So anyway, uh, without further ado, we're gonna call up Chris Barrows from Pacific Seafood Processors Association. Are you gonna just stay? You don't have slides. So you it's okay yeah, um, if this is working. Yeah, it sounds, sounds like it's working. Now. I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, so I'm just gonna uh, speak a little bit. Um, uh, thank you for that introduction. And uh, uh, thank you for inviting me here. I appreciate Robert's invitation. I, I spoke to some of you. Some of you are familiar faces that I uh, remember seeing in the mid, mid session uh, in Juneau uh, last time Southeast got together. So it's good to be back in front of you again. Um, so my name is Chris Barrows. I'm with Pacific Seafood Processors Association, and uh, we are a small trade association nonprofit trade association that represents 11 uh, seafood processing companies uh, that operate around the state. And uh, in here in Southeast, they're operating in Ketchikan, Craig, Wrangell, Petersburg, Sitka, and Yakutat. So pretty good presence. Uh, they've provided an investment uh, here in many of the communities uh, that I just mentioned and uh, are really have been uh, a pride themselves. Uh, and I've, I've seen them, their association of, of really being integral and, and wanting to be and, and being part of the communities that they are operating in. Um, so that's a little bit about uh, my organization. Uh, my, I myself, uh, uh, Ketchikan actually was the first uh, stop that I introduced my family to when uh, I'm 29 year Coast Guard uh, veteran. And we came up on the Alaska Marine Highway system. So a lot of the conversation yesterday about the importance of transportation and the, the integratedness of, of, of that, I can personally relate to because this is where uh, I, I first told my daughter, see, look at, here's Alaska. Here's where we are, and we saw eagles flying over, and we saw, you know, a lot of uh, marine uh, uh, whales and, and and sea life and different things like that on the ferry, and it was really a, a, an important and I think a, a, a unique experience that I've moved all around the United States. I've moved overseas with the Coast Guard, and I never had an experience like that to be able to introduce my family to. So I'm I'm really appreciative of, uh, appreciative of that, and. Uh, I just thought I'd share that with you. So a little bit about um, Alaska's seafood processing industry. Um, the processors operate at the center of, of really what is a global um, seafood supply chain. Uh, and we enable about five to six billion pounds of seafood coming out of the state of Alaska um, to markets um, here in Alaska, but also uh, domestically and then also internationally. And that's uh, the importance of that and the is really in the value that uh, can bring is brought back into the state. Uh, all the way in, in terms of what seafood processors are able to 
uh, uh, pay to harvesters uh, when they're purchasing that seafood um, to the taxes that they pay on the value of that seafood back um, both from the state of Alaska and also to the communities uh, that they're operating in. So um, that's pretty significant. And uh, in terms of volume, um, that's almost two thirds of the wild capture seafood volume for the United States is coming out of, of Alaska. And I, I'll just pause on that for a little bit because that's just, it's almost unfathomable the amount that that is. Um, and of course, uh, a significant portion of that and an important portion of that, particularly in the salmon context, is coming uh, out of right here in, in Southeast. So that's something to be proud about. So I just wanted to take a note because um, uh, I haven't heard a lot of reflection back on what we heard yesterday on the Southeast Alaska by the numbers. So I, I just wanted to take a moment and, and just uh, restate. The number one private sector, sector industry in the region for the first time since 2015. Uh, for those that weren't here yesterday, uh, I wanted to make sure that you heard that, right? And the total pounds landed were up 145% last year um, in 2001 uh, compared to 2020. So this is the year by year. And the value of that seafood caught nearly doubled. Uh, and the workforce earnings increased by $120 million. So, um, you know, seafood is, is, is not, um, hasn't been the anchor uh, since 2015. I think yesterday they, the, uh, uh, the speaker talked about the diversity of that and the value of that diversity across industries. Um, but uh, I think you all should take a, a really big pat on the back for that because it's not just the harvesters, which are obviously important. It's not just the processors to be able to buy from those harvesters and getting it to market, but it's also the supply chain um, the integratedness in terms of the transportation folks, the supply support folks, um, uh, to be able to use that and, and have that cold storage, to be able to get the products and the, and the, the um, all the infrastructure that it takes to be able to allow for that supply chain to operate, to be able to have that kind of a result for 2001. So give yourselves a pat on the back and, and, and uh, thank you very much for all that with the interconnectedness. Um, so uh, I think that's important to recognize. So I appreciate you allowed me to do that. Um, but uh, so PSPA's members, they buy fish and process in their plants. Uh, they're located close to the fishing grounds um, and uh, they employ tens, tens of thousands of, of, of people in, in these processing plants and generating um, all those jobs. And, and those jobs um, uh, and that process, I think, is really based on the stability that the different processes, uh, whether that's from a government standpoint, whether that's from a fisheries management standpoint, whether that's from a business or an industry standpoint, or the support structure that supports uh, uh, the specific industries of, of the harvesting and the processing, um, it's really the, the uh, um, stability of that. And so a couple of questions that we were asked from a panel perspective is, well, from an infrastructure perspective, what does that mean? You know, what is your highest priority from an infrastructure standpoint? I don't know that there's one uh, with respect to uh, seafood, uh, the seafood industry, um, housing, we talked that was heard yesterday, certainly double down and say that that's important. We need, you know, all that infrastructure that that allows for people to be able to live in the places that they work is important. Um, of course, uh, with the issues of um, of uh, uh, variable timing of runs, um, and the amount and the volume that comes in from, from those runs. Uh, Bristol Bay is kind of the classic example of that statewide, but that exists here in Southeast too, in terms of uh, volume of fish coming back. <laughs> they need to be bought when they're, when they're harvested, right? And then they need to be processes, processed after the, they're, they're purchased um, to be able to have the freshest and the most uh, appropriate uh, uh, value-added processing that can be done to be able to try to uh, uh, make the most of that in the different markets that they go to. So the stability in that, in that process um, from housing, energy, uh, um, infrastructure like that, certainly important. But I think I'd, I'll highlight the, the uh, associate uh, aspect of transportation in that. The Alaska Marine Highway Service used to be, um, in talking to many of the companies that I represent, used to be one of the primary methods um, before the pandemic, before um, some of the, the cuts to that, that service, uh, to be able to uh, ship product, um, whether it was in fresh form or in other different uh, uh, forms, um, out, out of the region and, and to areas uh, and to different markets. So with the, the lack of stability in that particular program, and I know there's a lot of work and we're really excited about the work and the investment that's going into that, but um, uh, that, that, 
that was hard and, and seafood processors had to find other mechanisms. They had to change product forms to be able to maybe go into less valuable product forms to be able to provide some sh um, shelf stability to uh, be able to get to those markets. But these are important aspects that seafood processors at least are taking into account. They're, they're, in just that particular type of an issue in terms of access to that transportation mode and that one type of transportation mode changed their operating process in terms of how they were able to operate. And which then the, all that rolls down the, the line, right? In terms of, well, do I need more cans if I'm gonna move to can form? How do I get those cans? Um, um, how do we get them and order them to, to be up here if we're not gonna, if we need to sh uh, shift from uh, fresh product uh, to, to, to a more shelf stable product like cans to, to facilitate uh, different types of shipments and modes. So that's one. One, and, I, and I highlight that just because I think it's so important, the inf infrastructure and the investment that goes into all these aspects of interconnectedness that uh, also affect the seafood industry. Um, so another aspect of that, I, I think uh, uh, that I wanted to highlight uh, in terms of both infrastructure and, and policy aspects is just teamwork. And that'll be a theme, um, both uh, stability and, and teamwork. Um, harvesters and processors working together, uh, both uh, the harvesters and processors working with the support services, like I've already mentioned. Um, a lot of those folks, uh, Samson Tug and Barge, uh, AML, Alaska Airlines, um, have all been very important components. And, and those are just a few off the top of my head because I've talked to them most recently. Um, but uh, it's all very, the teamwork that's integrated into the planning that they have to go into to support the seafood structure is, is important and very critical. And, uh, um, and that teamwork is, is necessary. And then the, from the industry, uh, the teamwork from a government standpoint with the administration, uh, with the Alaska Department and Fish and Game. We've already heard a little bit about uh, from DEC uh, and uh, uh, the commissioner this morning about ASME's role, which we'll hear about a little bit uh, more. Uh, we're very uh, happy and, and, and very um, appreciative of, the, of what ASME does to help provide that marketing awareness both in the domestic context, but well, I guess we should start here in Alaska too, right? Just telling Alaskans why they should be proud about the industry and, and the, the amount of that industry that they support coming out of the state uh, and coming out of different regions uh, um, uh, uh, from a seafood standpoint. So that's important. And ASME does a huge role about helping to communicate the value of Alaska fisheries and the impact that they have uh, both domestically and then also in an international context. And that directly goes back to the funding that they get uh, from DCCED. Um, I, I never thought coming into this role that I would be um, integrating or, or having so much of a connection to a DHSS from a health and, and human services standpoint, but I, it's, I think it's appropriate to recognize that um, you know, the, the, the figures that we just heard in terms of the comparison, the year by year averages from 2001 to 2020 doesn't take away anything from the fact that we had fisheries and we had an industry in 2019 and 2020 that is able to be compared against. And it, we, that, that, that didn't just happen. It, it, it happened because we had a, um, a governor and we had uh, ADF and G and management structure that said, we will have an industry. We'll, we're going to figure this out. We're going to figure out how we're going to not let COVID rule us, but we're going to manage all this uncertainty that is coming across in this once in a hundred year pandemic that we're now, we all are in together. So I think that goes back to my, my teamwork theme and the stability theme. It was huge, the governor's uh, declaration that we will have a fishery, we're going to keep those open, and we're going to find out a way to keep our workforce safe. We're going to find out a way to keep our state, state safe, and we're going to make sure that we're helping do have policy decisions that support the transportation and all the other different types of support structures necessary to be able to allow the harvesters to go out there and do what they need to do to catch the fish and then help them get help processors get that to market. So I, I don't want to um, uh, minimize the, the 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 just the the huge amount of teamwork that went into and and we all did, we didn't necessarily all agree on every step of the way, but we worked through it together. And um, I think and the reason I mentioned that is because we have a lot of other challenges that are going to need teamwork. Work and it'll need stability going forward. A lot of issues with fisheries management. Um, I think we just heard in terms of the investment uh, conversations this morning, we are in a warming climate that is affecting Alaska. 
It is affecting fisheries that come out of Alaska. And we need to figure out how we're going to maintain the stability and the, um, uh, the, the responsible management that we pride ourselves in. And we highlight to the rest of the world, you should be more like Alaska because with the way that we do it, we can make sure that we're going to have sustainable fisheries moving forward. That is the basis of the entire industry and the entire government structure um, that supports the industry, uh, whether it's on the federal or the state side. And that principle um, is, is really, I think every time there's a fish that exported from Alaska, that principle is being exported with it as, as well. And, and we try to, I think we need to highlight that actually more um, so that people are aware of that. But that's not to say that we don't have warming issues, uh, warming climate. Um, and we need to figure out how in the face of that with stocks moving, with stocks changing, um, uh, how we're going to incorporate that. And, and the reason that I bring that up and emphasize it is because it's gonna take investment at the state side of the house with ADF and G. Um, that investment and that budget resource, the scientists that they employ, um, the resource managers that they uh, hire and the pipeline that they develop um, their people in is really huge. And um, I was so happy to see from a, um, a University of Alaska Fairbanks uh, uh, and University of uh, Southeast, uh, University of Alaska Southeast, they just developed and have put out, um, and you might not know about this, and so I really encourage you to take this back to anybody who's interested in seafood, um, but they developed a master's in marine uh, policy program. This next year is gonna be the first year that it's going to be up and running. They're already taking uh, uh, applications for it. And it's a joint program. It can be done virtually. I think they're going to also have some classes. Uh, I don't know if those classes will be um, centered in, Fair, in, in uh, Fairbanks or, or Juneau. But nonetheless, the fact that they have that program here in state to market to the kids that are graduating from high schools here in state to take advantage of, of the, that outreach that not just DIPAC does, but I know a lot of other of the hatchery programs are, are trying to um, and have programs to get into the community schools that they're operating next to, to provide some of this awareness of, of what they do in that community. And that excitement and that momentum, I'm so happy to see that there's now another step to this in terms of allowing for those uh, young professionals to be able to then go and have some kind of graduate schooling here in Alaska to be able to talk about marine policy, liver marine, marine, marine resources. How do you manage those liver marine, marine resources? What are the economics and a, a lot of the other aspects that go into uh, management decisions or how, we, how we're going to use those liberal marine resources and really kind of grow some of that cadre of, of talent and, uh, um, and education here in Alaska. So I highlight that for you because it's new. If you haven't heard about it, I encourage you to go take a look at that. And really, um, you know, if you know anyone that's in, interested in the seafood uh, uh, space, that's something that I think in the years to follow should be a really good source of a pipeline for, for some of that talent, being able to apply it in uh, for ADF and G specifically. Um, uh, and I'm really excited about that. So what that brings us then to is um, regulatory stability. Um, from an industry standpoint, and we've heard that across uh, the industry panel for all the other resources industry, it's no different for, for any business really. I mean, the more, more things that you can have under your control that you can control and make sure that you can plan for, of course, there's all these other things that you can't, but for those that you can, you, you, you ha that's where the strategic planning comes in and it's so, so important. And for, for us here in Alaska, the resource management, um, it exists on the federal level. Uh, it will continue to exist on the federal level and we need to find a way to make sure that we're having that Alaska voice continue to be part of that um, infrastructure and that, 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 that conversation that's existing for that th those resources and the application of those resources from three to 200 nautical miles, which is in, in the federal context. Uh, it also makes sense that fish don't care what that, you know, what that government line is, that three mile line, they're going to swim back and forth on it. So that integration of, of the, um, the state policy, the po and we have mechanisms in place with the council process under the Magnuson um, Stevens Fisheries Conservation and Management Act. Uh, we're almost coming up, I think, on the 46th year of that of that act. The Stevens in that is no stranger to Alaska because that's Ted, uh, Ted Stevens, who was the one who was foundationally important to that. Uh, Young was also, Don Young was also foundationally important to that as one of his uh, legacies that I, to me, one of his most important legacies. I know he has so many of them, but um, uh, he was important for that on the uh, House side of that legislation. And that has really created a structure that has existed now, a co-management structure of how um, 
how industry is going to be able to provide input, how the public can provide input to the federal council process. There is a council here for the Alaska region. It is the North Pacific Council. The only state that it operates of, out of, off of is Alaska. It's very unique in that regard. Um, but that process is in place uh, for that federal management. Um, and uh, Alaska has a seat at the table. They have five council members out of, out of a total of 11. Uh, with, uh, so they have the large majority of, of that voice. And they've, I think Alaska has done really good. And this particular commissioner with ADF&G and this governor has set priorities that are being discussed at the council and are being um, uh, deliberated. And it is a, it's a, a deliberate, appropriate process. It is, doesn't turn on a dime because though that type of sausage making takes some time for people to have the chance to be able to communicate and then for that to be incorporated for the science to be part of that um, and for for questions to be asked of science and so for those management decisions after all of that process to be taken place for 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 both the public process and the scientific process to come together to be able to have the most informed decisions that we can so i just wanted to communicate that that process does exist it exists at the state level too with board of fish and with adf and g um, and uh, so it's really the integration and the utilization of those uh, of those uh, processes um, and the stability for that that that's important so i think i'd like to wrap up just um in, in saying that uh, uh, the stability that the hatcheries provide, uh, particularly here in Southeast, but just in terms of providing that enhancement to a wildly oscillating uh, fisheries um, uh, returns uh, in general, that's a natural process that's going to happen. Then you, when you put climate change and warming climate on top of that, it just exacerbates um, um, the uncertainty associated with that. And so uh, fisheries management, that deliberative process, but also hatcheries providing some degree of stability for, uh, for the industry and for harvesters and processors to be able to uh, take advantage of. Um, and the long history that that has here in Alaska, I think is, is also something to be very proud of. So I think I'll stop there. Uh, but thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today and uh, for the opportunity to be part of this panel as well. That's great, Chris. You brought up many important topics. One that I wish I would never have to hear about again is COVID. Um, but it's it's important to look back on that and recognize we dealt with a giant challenge by working together. It wasn't easy but we got it done and we can do that in the future too. So thanks for the reminder. Um, our next uh, and last uh, speaker for this panel, uh, Ashley Heimbinger, and she's with the Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute. They are a wonderful organization, statewide organization that takes the Alaska seafood brand internationally and, and nationally all over the world. So thanks, Ashley. Thanks, Julie. Um, I do have a presentation. Wonderful, thank you. And as a, a working for an organization whose mission is to get people to eat more food, I will do my best to go quickly and get us um, on to lunch. So um, uh, first, but first, thank you to Southeast Conference, Robert and your amazing team. Thank you to Julie and thank you to Meilani um, for sharing some really positive um, numbers related to fisheries yesterday that, that Chris brought up again today. It's my honor to be here representing the incredible industry that has come together um, to do incredible things like Julie and Chris mentioned um, and the that we get the opportunity to, you know, take the fish that are being produced by Southeast um, salmon hatcheries and processed by the organizations that Chris represents and then, and then take it out to the world and, and really brag about it. Um, I mean, we have the world's best sustainable, nutritious, delicious quality protein. And, and so we get the, the honor and um, an exciting opportunity to, to represent that around the world. Um, next slide. Oh, there's a clicker. Uh, Okay, so what is ASME? I, many of you are probably familiar, but Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute, we are a public-private partnership between the state of Alaska and the Alaska seafood industry. We are primarily funded through a self-assessment on the Alaska seafood industry. Um, we do receive a, a, some funds from the federal government to fund our international marketing efforts, but it's primarily a, a self-funded endeavor. We were honored to receive some funding through both the CARES Act and ARPA, thanks to the work of our um, the Dunleavy administration and the Alaska legislature to support our industry through some really tough times um, in terms of marketing around the world. Um, this, this last 
uh, sentence here I want to point out. We're directed by a governor, governor appointed board of directors, which includes harvesters and processors, um, and 10 species and operational committees. That's over 100 industry members that guide everything we do. We have direct access to all across the supply chain um, so that we are being most efficient and strategic with the budget that we do have. One thing I want to call out now is if you are a stakeholder in the Alaska seafood industry and you want to get involved, we are always looking for um, new and more committee members to join us and the call for committee um, members and the application is open now it closes on September 30th so let me know if you're interested um, so Chris emphasized the need for stability but but um, I think we all realize that fisheries are by nature dynamic and we had asked me um, especially following the pandemic like all industries have had to be even more responsive and strategic in how we operate these are just a few of the things that can influence what we do obviously harvest fluctuations, um, market conditions, uh, changing industry infrastructure, consumer preferences, and the need for education in the market. Uh, not to get too far into doom and gloom, but there are some challenges that we're facing, um, even following the pandemic. Harvest fluctuations, of course, is one of them. While there was a record-breaking year in Bristol Bay, um, there we are seeing some uh, struggles with uh, crab up the Bering Sea. Um, there's also different changes in product forms, and we have to be aware and responsive to all of these things so that our marketing efforts can support the product that's actually available. Um, market conditions. Inflation is huge. It's impacting all of us. Uh, there was, If there was a little bit of a silver lining to the pandemic, it's that more people were buying and cooking seafood at, or buying seafood at retail and cooking at home. And while that's a skill that you can't unlearn, um, inflation is starting to really cut back at the gains we saw there. We, through August, seen um, 10 to 16% declines in seafood retail sales, and that's in all product forms, so fresh, frozen, and shelf-stable. And that's primarily um, attributed to, to rising prices. The strong US dollar is, is hurting us in terms of um, being a competitor globally. And speaking of competition, just for some perspective, Alaska salmon, while it is, we do produce 90% um, of the salmon uh, that comes out of the United States, that's still only 9% of the global supply, the majority of which is um, is farmed. For perspective, uh, the entire, oops, excuse me, the entire sockeye run from, from um, Bristol Bay is still smaller than um, what's farmed out of just Chile alone. Um, while uh, we there is a, an embargo on Russian seafood products coming to the U.S., our, our major markets are still uh, allowing for uh, Russian product to be imported. So that is competition for us. And then the same industry challenges that everyone's facing, supply chain, um, transportation costs, labor shortages, et cetera. Um, but we turn those around and look at them as opportunities. So for example, Ukraine was the largest market for pink salmon roe in the world. It was um, the 10th largest direct importer of Alaska seafood generally. And obviously we lost that market overnight. Um, so we have invested in market development for Roe here in the U.S. And this is a photo from a, a really great series of recipe development we did with a chef out of the Northwest. Um, with larger harvests out of Bristol Bay and larger pink salmon harvests, we know that there's going to be bigger canned salmon inventories. So we're conducting canned salmon promotions and creating materials to market canned salmon. With, again, larger Bristol Bay uh, sockeye inventories, um, sort of stacking up, we are looking at opportunities for smoked product to give a longer shelf life to sockeye um, and other salmon species. Other opportunities that we're seeing around the globe include a, a growing interest from consumers and customers around the world in the broader Alaska portfolio. So not just, you know, salmon, crab, rockfish, sablefish, flatfish, the other um, lesser known crab species, which is really exciting. Um, industry innovation, uh, the value-added products that are coming out of Alaska. I'll talk about that in a little bit, um, but that's creating new markets and opportunities for all of our products. And then finally, consumer preferences. The, the trend of what consumers want, it's, it's Alaska seafood. It's sustainable, it's nutritious. Um, it they understand where it comes from, it's wild, and um, we're able to offer them a connection to the product. For example, 75% of consumers want to be more knowledgeable, knowledgeable about seafood. I would argue that it's higher now. This number is a, is a few years old, but so we've been working really hard to get out to Alaska's communities um, 
to capture the stories from the source. I think we visited upwards of 12 communities over the last three years. Uh, shown here is uh, Bristol Bay, Juneau, Sandpoint, Kodiak, um, and on Alaska. And we, there's so many more that we could visit and so many stories that we could tell, but it's been an honor to gather some of them and put together some resources which are coming out soon. We're telling this story all over the globe um, through traditional media, social digital media, trade missions, trade shows, um, at the point of purchase on menus, at retail, um, e-commerce, no surprise, has been a huge opportunity for Alaska Seafood, and then through partnerships. And while as a global marketing agency, we have too many um, activities to, to cover, I did wanna share one that we're really excited about that's a little bit closer to home. We've had the honor to partner with um, CLIA, uh, who spoke yesterday and their, their member organizations on a number of um, marketing activities. While they've been serving Alaska Seafood on board for years, um, we heard from our industry and, and in talking with them, and honestly, they've heard from their cost customers that they wanted to know more about the seafood that they were serving on board. Um, people come to Alaska for Alaska seafood, and in many cases, they weren't making that connection to the fisheries, the world-class fisheries that were right outside, you know, their porthole on their on their cruise up through Alaska. So we have partnered with um, a number of companies to get more information straight from the source on board those cruise lines. Um, I wanted, uh, this includes Holland America, Princess, um, Royal Caribbean Lines and other groups that, that are really excited to share the Alaska Seafood story on board um, their ships and throughout the entire experience. I wanna give a call out to Holland America Line who recently was certified by um, Responsible Fisheries Management Certification Program. That is not an easy endeavor. And now they are oops, certified um, sustainable for all six of their ships that are coming up through Alaska um, it, all the way through the supply chain. Let's see if the, this one will work. Through both of these lines, we now have in stateroom custom videos telling the Alaska seafood story. Let's see if I can get the video to play. It looks like it's not working for us and in interest of time, I won't share it, but we did a great project with Princess Cruise Lines where we brought up Jeff Corwin. I don't know if anyone remembers him, but the wildlife biologist and TV personality who interviewed Boris Bowers, who was supposed to be here. And he interviewed a number of Alaska fishermen talking about why sustainability and sharing their product with visitors to Alaska is so important. Okay. Um, in terms of product innovation, there's a lot of new products out there, several of which you guys have tried here at the conference. Yesterday, the sockeye salmon medallions that were part of lunch with the salad, so delicious. Those were actually last year's retail and salmon category winner of the Symphony of Seafood, which AFDF organizes. Um, the wild Alaska wild caught black cod with the miso glaze was served last night at the reception. Um, and then through technical difficulties, we weren't able to serve the Trident product that's featured here, but lots of really fun and accessible products coming out of Alaska's seafood industry. Also beyond the plate, uh, this is a, a pet food product. These are halibut skins, uh, sort of a high-end product for, um, for pet owners. And then a really, uh, the Alaska seafood industry is getting more into the beauty and um, nutraceutical industry as well. I've mentioned, or there were a lot of different companies that were featured on that previous slide and, and all of them are included in this new resource that we've created called the Alaska Seafood Online Marketplace. You know, our goal is to get people excited about the Alaska Seafood brand. And now we have a place where they can go and connect directly from, with companies to purchase the product. So anyone from a very small direct marketer to um, a large company can advertise or can list their company here um, and share their products with buyers around the globe. Okay, finally, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, we couldn't do what we do without the, the guidance from our stakeholders all throughout the Alaska seafood industry in Alaska. Um, so we invite you to get involved. There's ways you can do that. Uh, the clicker's not working, but the um, biggest way you can get involved, of course, is to become a committee member. If you're not able to make that level of a commitment, um, as new meetings are open to the public, we have them throughout the year. They're advertised on our website, or you can reach out to us and we can connect you with them. Um, and so that's always a chance. There's always an opportunity to participate in that way. The biggest one is All Hands on Deck, which is coming up. It's our annual gathering. This will be the first one we've had since the start of the pandemic. Um, it will be in Girdwood in November of 2022. And then finally, just give us a call. I mean, we're, we're 
we couldn't do again, I, I feel like a broken record, but we couldn't do what we do without your insight and input. And so we're always um, here to talk and hear about what you need as an industry. So thank you. What great content and a number of things. Uh, we've got great fisheries experts here. I, I know we've got a couple people from Trident here. I think Silver Bay Seafoods is also in the room. So engage them on fishery issues, the fisheries questions. Ashley, if we can get that video queued up um, in a couple couple minutes, we might just use that to uh, to show folks before, as we quiet the room down. A couple of things. Um, we're running just a little bit behind. We've got uh, gubernatorial candidates to, to engage with. We'll do the same format with the note cards uh, coming up front. Uh, lunch is gonna be a little bit different. Instead of uh, going through the room and being uh, loud and uh, I mean, joyous and, and uh, celebratory, we're gonna ask that you go into through the hallway and then in this way and then back through here. Um, and then uh, continue to do your networking, but just do it a little bit quieter because we will get started in about 10, 10 minutes, try to move through the line as quickly as possible. Annabelle's has got a great lunch for you there. And um, tomorrow, Sea Alaska and ASME has got a special lunch for us then. So we look forward to that. And um, so one final round of applause for our panel, our sponsors, and let's keep on going. <clears throat>
Is this the San Juan, huh? Yes, it is. Welcome aboard. Thank you. How important is the fishing industry? Yes, fishing is very important to Alaskans. It drives our economy. Most all of us spend our money here in this state, and so it's very important. Bonnie, our princess ships, they go around the world, but Alaska is a big priority for us. We will bring millions of people to this incredible state. It's probably really important for them to try wild Alaskan seafood, isn't it? Yes, it's the best. The seafood is the freshest it could possibly be. There is not one fish that's ever been on my boat that I wouldn't want to eat myself. I take a lot of pride in this resource that we have and because I'm extracting from it, it has to be sustainable. The quality is most important when you deliver the fish to the cold storage because that's how it's passed on to the consumer. And that quality is very important to me as well as my fellow fishermen. It really is about continuity and consistency. Yes, it is. Of course, I don't think a lot of folks appreciate how really diverse when it comes to species salmon are here in Alaska. I mean, it's pretty remarkable. It is. There's five species of salmon, pinks, chums, coho, sockeye, and chinook. What they all share in common is that they need a vibrant and healthy wild Alaska to survive. Well, salmon, as you know, spawn in fresh water. So they return from the ocean, spawn in uh, these rivers that flow out of the rainforest. And those marshes are providing rearing habitat for salmon. So they're all interconnected. A beautiful day like this. Yeah. This is why people are coming, but they're also coming for Alaskan seafood. We'll have six ships dedicated to Alaska. And a lot of these folks are going to be eating Dungeness crab, halibut, maybe some rockfish, and of course, salmon. Why should they look forward and participate in the fisheries as a consumer? Well, consumers should feel good about eating wild Alaska seafood because it's sustainable. And they should also feel good about purchasing that fish because of the financial contribution that provides to the economy in Alaska. John, explain what the word sustainability really means. What is the concept of a sustainable fisheries? Sustainable fishery really just means that this fishery is being harvested in a way that's repeatable, that we can keep using this resource year after year to get fish for the population. That sounds like an easy definition. The practicality of it is a lot more complicated. Absolutely. It's different than a farm where you're raising cattle or something like that. These are wild animals living in wild places. There's a lot of variables that go into not only their own health, but how healthy they interact with one another. And all of that plays against each other. You have petroleum, you have right. the timber industry, you have the tourism industry. A lot of this is interconnected. But the seafood business, sustainably, right. why is it so important? You have 62,000 jobs, $5.5 billion annually. It's the largest employer in the, uh, private employer in the state. But it doesn't continue unless we manage it sustainably and have an eye for the future. What an epic day it's been. It's been all about this wild king salmon and this incredible halibut. So, Rudy, what is your inspiration for this mission to present Alaskan seafood to our guests aboard ship? That's a good question. My inspiration is really to bring a wild Alaskan seafood on board Princess Cruises this year to have sustainable seafood on board ship that we know where the fish come from and also support the fishermen in whole Alaska that we know we're looking for quality items on board ship, which is so important for any good chef. 
it's really incredible to think that this fish hours ago was swimming in the wild Pacific waters right near where our, our ship is docked. Why are you doing a great job? You know that? Thank you. You've done it before. I, a few times. Not too bad. Oh, beautiful. So we have our salmon cooking right here. What are we going to add to it? Well, very simple. We keep it very natural because it's so fresh. Normally, when you get a fresh fish from the water, all what you need is love and a little bit of salt. What's missing? The salmon. Hello. Put in the middle, so beautiful. Some fresh herb, Giovanni. We sprinkle it a little bit, lemon butter. Look at this here. Beautiful. Isn't it beautiful? What a color. Well, Rudy, that looks absolutely spectacular. I mean, that's incredible. But Rudy, we've got a table full of hungry fishermen. We got enough food? Yes, let's go. All right, let's do it. So this is just so incredible to be at a table like this with the people that catch the food and the people that make the food. We cook the food. And then we all get to eat the food. <laughs> They're all different dishes, but what they all share in common is that they only could happen with Alaska and with the fishing community that connects this resource. Rudy, for you, what's it like to actually connect with the people that catch the resource, that bring the fish aboard? You know what? It's beautiful. You know, from a chef's heart, do you guys, that what every chef wants to connect where the food comes from. And there's nothing more beautiful as a wild chef to connect to the wild Alaskan seafood. Hello. So as if for any chef out there, to sit here would be a dream to talk to the fishermen, to talk to you. It's interesting you say that there's this big, big effort today to have this farm to table experience. Nothing matches Alaska when it comes directly from the environment to the table. Alaska can't be beat. So this was a great experience. So Rudy, thank you so much, sir, for preparing this incredible feast. The amazing culinary team aboard Discovery Princess. And thank you guys for catching it. Thank you, guys. Thank cheers. you for coming. Thank you. Huh? Cheers. 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 Do I have a live mic? Do I have a live mic here? Testing. Okay, testing. Can we test Representative Guerra's uh, mic? Uh, good afternoon. It works. It works. Okay. So if we can uh, go ahead and bring the, the room to order. Um, like I sometimes tell my kids, don't talk with food in your mouth. They say, I don't have food in my mouth. Put food in your mouth. Okay, excellent. It's a great meal. Really thank you, Annabelle's, uh, for putting on this, this feast. They're actually uh, they're, they're catering tonight's banquet as well. We look forward to that. And we're very pleased to, uh, to have it. At least two. There, there's Governor Walker. Uh, welcome, sir. Can you hear the? Thank you very much. Yeah, I hear you just fine. Thanks, Robert. All right. So apologies for the uh, the time lag. Uh, you're <clears throat> still allow you to participate for the, at least the next 30, 40 minutes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, we will go ahead and get started. Almost everyone's back through, and they've got three lines running through here. So by the time we get done with the uh, preliminary introductions and I uh, want to just kind of put the, the, the format out there for the audience to understand that uh, uh, what we're doing here for sure. Um, and I just want to thank both of you for your considerable public service. Um, many, many years to Alaskans and we really appreciate that. Uh, we have over 300 regional leaders uh, gathered both in person and online. Uh, the media is present and so your, your remarks are closely followed and your interaction is uh, very much appreciated as we uh, take a look at the issues uh, that are on our agenda, on our minds, and uh, the work that we've embraced uh, here in Southeast Alaska. So um, this is not a debate. This is the, the discussion on the issues. Each of the candidates will have uh, time to do an opening statement for, for three minutes. So I have my timer. My timer is right front and center. Um, can you show Governor Walker what that's going to look like when you get to one minute? Uh, no, you don't. This is Representative Guerra. Governor Walker's uh, camera is over there. Can you see that, Governor? Yeah, just fine. Thank you very much. Okay, excellent. So we want to make sure that um, everyone gets a chance to um, 
to have their full time and we can keep keep moving. So after your opening uh, statements, we'll go ahead and uh, go through a series of questions that uh, revolve around the issues at hand. In the middle of the tables are a number of index cards. A few have already come forward. Uh, Karen Peterson is our runner. So just hold your, your card up, we'll get it and bring it up here. Uh, we'll try to get through as many of uh, these questions as we can in the next 40 minutes. And then uh, if we don't get through all of them, hopefully you can raise them individually. And if you don't hear them exactly, it's because sometimes we get similar questions on the same topic and we'll just kind of combine those as we go forward. We'll give uh, each of the candidates then an opportunity to do a wrap up uh, of their own for, for three minutes. We will ask that you uh, keep your responses to a minute. So, um, and if there's a question on our minds, we'll ask you to go a little longer to clarify something, but we, we uh, just a, a lot of issues and we really appreciate um, you prioritizing the time to, to be with us today. So uh, with that, since uh, alphabetically you far outpace uh, Governor Walker, I, as, as a Venables, I, I have compassion for those at the end of the alphabet. So uh, <laughs> with that, Representative Garrett, welcome and um, your opening statement. Thank you, Robert. Thank you all for uh, welcoming me here. There are so many familiar faces. Uh, it's nice to see so many of you. Um, let me use my first three minutes to introduce myself for those of you who don't know me. Um, the, the questions are pretty technical, so um, um, I'll just let you know who I am. Um, uh, my name's Les Guerra. Um, as many of you know, I served in the legislature for 16 years. Um, I'm running because I, I'm concerned about the future in the state. Uh, I woke up one day uh, over a year ago and I said, I, I don't see opportunity in this state for people who are born with little, for people who are born to damaged families, to those who need the chance to succeed. You know, if there is a chance to succeed that, um, that most people will have if they're born to a great family with great wealth, but we have to also be concerned about those who aren't. An opportunity should belong to everybody, whether you're rich or poor. Um, I personally believe that I think very much because of my background. Um, uh, I grew up in a broken family. Uh, my father had an office in Harlem in New York um, where he was very well loved. Uh, but late one night, night uh, when I was six, somebody came into his office and killed him. And, um, and from then on, I grew up in foster care. And I think that has shaped my view on the world a little bit. And that is that everybody deserves a chance in life. That when I was on the house floor and I pledged allegiance and I said, liberty and justice for all, that that should mean something. Liberty and justice for all. But what I see right now are schools that are reeling, schools that are unable to hire teachers, schools that are unable to retain teachers. Um, I've seen the state where people are turned against each other. You're now told that without revenue in the state and you're not getting any revenue, the revenue plan right now is unless Russia invades Ukraine, there's no money in the state. That's not a fiscal plan. Um, you're told that you have to fight between a permanent fund dividend or schools or a marine highway or a university or job training. We should be able to do all of those things. And my plan is to say, look, we should get a fair share for our oil. Uh, former Governor Jay Hamden and I were friends and he would always start a conversation with me by saying, first, you get a fair share for your oil. We give away $1.2 billion in oil company tax subsidies at the same time, we say we don't have enough money for our schools or for mental health treatment or for substance abuse treatment or for a marine highway that this governor proposed cutting by 75% his first year in office, which would have shut down the marine highway. Like in South Central, we have roads, those are subsidized. The marine highway needs to be subsidized. I'm sorry, transportation is not free. It costs something and it costs even more if we don't provide it to people. So these things matter to me, opportunity matters to me. I wanna make sure everybody has a chance in this world for a good job, for a good education. Those are the things that gave me a chance in life. And I wanna make sure everybody has that chance in life. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Governor Walker, your three minutes, sir. Very good, thank you very much. Thank you for uh, accommodating my, my conflicting schedule. I had another, another commitment scheduled before this came up and I, I apologize for not being there in person. It's always my, my preference. Uh, thank you for what you do. I've read your agenda. I think if I was there, I'd probably stay for the whole meeting because it's a very full, exciting agenda. And my congratulations on the $49 million grant you recently received on, on the Mariculture opportunity. So thank you for that. 
Um, a couple things. Obviously, I, I think I know most of, most of the people. I served as a governor from 2014 to 2018. But uh, my running mate is Heidi Dragas. She is um, Fairbanks born. She's uh, lived in Juneau for the last six years, eight years, and uh, married Kevin Sund, who's um, well connected in Southeast with his family and relatives in in Ketchikan. So Heidi is a great uh, a great a great running mate, and and uh, uh, and thoroughly loves living in living in Southeast. You know, I'm I'm running. I didn't actually think I was going. I would run again. I thought we would we would pull ourselves out with what we did as far as the fiscal plan that we submitted. Part of it was passed, but it was not. Uh, we thought that that would be finished up, and, and it was not. You know, Alaska is, uh, in my opinion, Alaska is full of pent up opportunities, but it's imploding with what we see happening with about thirty million dollars in cuts to the marine highway system in the last uh, four years. Uh, we we are seeing the results of those cuts now with ferries being tied up. Uh, in Homer and elsewhere because of lack of crews. Uh, schedules being down to bare bones this winter is probably easier to say where who will have service rather than who won't because that list is shorter than who who will have service. So it's it's a long uh, it's a long sad story of, of lack of funding on the marine highway system. That's a high high priority. 1100 teachers short in our state. Uh, no uh, teacher job fair this year for the first time in 30 years because who wants to come to Alaska to be in any part of the system and doesn't have a retirement system. We are seeing the results of what happens when we don't have a fiscal plan. And so we are focused on Alaska digging itself out. We are 49th out of 50 in the nation as far as our economy post COVID. You know, we are, are, are you know, our, uh, epi, uh, you know, our financial situation is, is one, but the opioid crisis is, is back again. It's up 140% from it was when I issued a declaration of disaster and, and brought those numbers down. So it's a matter of, of working as Alaskans. We are a unity ticket, uh, nonpartisan. Heidi is coming from, uh, from the left. I come from the right. And we are, we are anxious to, uh, to work collaboratively with, with Alaskans and, uh, and get us back on track. So thank you very much for this opportunity today. I really look forward to the questions. And Les, it's always good to see you. Thanks for thanks for being here today. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Okay, well, we will alternate orders if I can remember which order we're going in with two, maybe it'll be a little easier than it was yesterday with three. Um, so the first question, both of you have mentioned the Marine Highway System. You know that's a core, core tenant of Southeast Conference uh, ever since 1958 when we were created as an organization. There's an interesting intersect right now with federal funds that have come in for a very limited time. Uh, there's uh, you know, opportunity to use those, a portion of those for operations, displaced general fund, um, or they could be used to capitalize, modernize, and uh, create a new fleet of the future. Talk about a leading question. So what would your priority be and your path forward? Um, and we will start with Governor Walker. You know, the, the bipartisan infrastructure funds are uh, an opportunity, almost a once in a lifetime opportunity for Alaska. And we will aggressively go after those funds. Some are somewhat earmarked. I know you still use that term anymore, but somewhat designated for the last green highway system. But I think there's always sort of the devils in the details on making sure that the intent is followed through on the actual uh, implementation of that. So we will aggressively go after that uh, as much of those dollars as we can get. Um, this is an opportunity that, that the marine highway system um, we've never seen this before. We need to be aggressive on that. And, and that's exactly what we'll do, working with Senator Mikowski and her staff and Senator Sullivan and his staff. And, and uh, certainly, obviously, with uh, Congressman Peltola. Standing up, I'm sorry. Um, look, um, the federal infrastructure bill, bill is probably a once in a lifetime opportunity for us to modernize the Marine Highway fleet. We've got other problems with the Marine Highway. We, we've, we have 160 fewer workers at the Marine Highway than we did before this administration started. We don't have the workforce. Um, so I think we should focus on using the, the federal funds that are available to modernize a fleet that has 50 year old ships um, so that at least we don't, at least we have ships that run. Um, look, we've got we've to pay our employees fairly. We've got to have a pension. We've got to be able to attract and retain Marine Highway employees, which, which this state is not doing. You know, neglect is not a plan. And right now, uh, the plan on the Marine Highway is neglect. But I would focus on using uh, these federal funds uh, to build, an, a, a, to replace an aging fleet. So the state has the obligation to do the operations. And we have the op uh, obligation to pay our workers fairly 
and to provide a competitive uh, retirement benefit so people will stay here instead of leave. Thank you. Interestingly enough, housing's always kind of been a back back burner issue when we talk about economic development issues and childcare really never even climbed onto our stove top, if you will. But during a, our spring business climate survey where we had over 400 Southeast uh, business leaders respond to what the hurdles were to economic recovery and their vitality, they mentioned both housing and childcare as, uh, as critical issues that needed attention. We'll keep this question separate on those, but we'll begin with Representative Guerra on childcare how do you see that um, that being incorporated as a, a st with state support? Um, look, child care is a crisis. I mean, in part, I've been a believer in universal pre-K uh, since I've been a legislator. I've pushed universal pre-K since I started as a legislator. That is not the full child care solution, but but have, helping students or children enter school ready to read and ready to learn, then you won't complain about third grade reading scores anymore. Child care is expensive. It is too expensive for, for, for too many people. A number of states have found innovative ways to try and um, address the issue, um, including wage supplements. Um, there, there's, a, there's a program in a few states, even Tennessee, called Wages, um, and it helps, uh, helps pay low-paid child, child care workers so that they can, they can earn a wage where they will come into the industry and where that cost doesn't get passed off to parents who can't afford childcare. That is part of it. Um, there are communities, including Juno, that are helping with training. Um, um, we can help with the cost of rent for childcare facilities. Um, it's, it's gonna take state partnership. It's gonna take some state investment, uh, but we should look and see what states are making it work because Alaska is not making it work. And a veto of $4 million from our childcare program this year was not a way to make it work. Thank you, Governor Walker. As Heidi and I have traveled the state in the last over the last year, every community we've been to, every single one, the two basic issues we hear about is childcare and affordable housing. So, <clears throat> what we've looked for is is you know solutions. Who's doing? Who's addressing it in different ways? You know, it's not it's, the issue is universal. The solution may not be. I look at what Juno has done with with the childcare issue with their CARES fund, and I think they've done an excellent job of that. I've I've long felt that those closest to the problem are closer to the solution. I would, I would like to see the local government involved. You know, maybe the state provides the funding, of course, but let the local government decide how to, how to administer the, those funds best in their community to get the maximum benefit out of those funds for child care. It's critical. It is the foundation. It's the footing and foundation for rebuilding our economy. If you don't have, you know, a, a affordable quality child care, you aren't going to put our economy back together again. It's a very high priority for us. Thank you. And we'll stay with you, Governor, uh, on the question of housing. How can the state help municipalities with the housing crisis? We need uh, the, the state needs a land trust. We're one of three states in the nation without a, a, a land trust. And how the land, land trust, Sitka is a good example of, of the Sitka land trust and what they've done on affordable housing. It's, a, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, I've not seen one like it before. So I would, I would, look, I would look at the Sitka example where the municipality provide the land to the uh, trust and the, and the uh, Rasmussen Foundation, others put in the cost of the uh, utilities. And so what they're selling the house for to the uh, affordable housing um, um, purchaser is based upon just the house itself, not the land, the land's on long-term lease and the utility mm. is care of. So there is, uh, there is examples right in Alaska, right in Southeast, of an excellent opportunity for affordable housing. Did a lot of work on this photo on this one. Oh, she said she Thank you, Representative Garrett. Thank you. Um, look, the solution is not going to be the same in every community, but every community in the state has a housing problem um, from, from Ketchikan uh, to uh, Bethel to uh, Seward. You wouldn't think about Seward, but the principal at the high school in Seward commutes two hours every day to Anchorage because he cannot afford a $600,000 house in Seward. The, the problem is different around the state, uh, but it's going to require probably some state participation. Look, I, I didn't. I never ran to do something about getting a fair share for our oil. But if we don't, we won't be able to afford any of this. We have. We don't really have a capital budget anymore. That capital budget could go to help communities identify housing possibilities and help pay for like a, a fire sprinkler system in in a, in a new development. We need to have AHFC be a partner, but all of that costs money. If you want to address the state's problems, you're not going to do it by by waiting for a once every thirty year uh, invasion. Uh, 
uh, yeah. right now. Yeah, I have a birthday for that. That includes job. ending a, a $1.2 billion in oil companies but, that we could use to build a better, anyways. stronger state for everybody. Yeah, so she did a lot of work. Thank you. That. And okay. staying with you, Representative Guerra, um, if a, yeah. what is your what would your plan be to address the high um, energy costs in rural yeah, Alaska? We obviously have haves and have nots. In the well, state. it'll so get better. We help it's rural just Alaska a matter of the more open and honest you are about things, and the more Julie doesn't get scared to be I around her. I wish I had more time to talk about um, the money that we put away into oil company subsidies. Um, we should be equal partners with our oil like industry. They're, they're an important industry, mad. but we should not be junior partners. And right now we're junior up, partners. Look, we need we need to build renewable. Well, no, I don't think she's. This state I, I don't know. I think sense, sometimes I feel like, um, and you know, will sometimes take state partnership. In rural Alaska, it will take state partnership, right? I am proud to have voted for a renewable energy fund that we have in the state, but it hasn't been funded. It was supposed to be funded at fifty million dollars a year. This year, it got fifteen million dollars. Last year, it got zero dollars. Like, we need renewable energy in the state. We'll put people to work. It'll lower energy costs and it'll do something responsible about global warming, right? Like we have a responsibility to the world and to the next generation, but renewable energy satisfies all three of those things. We can reduce the cost of energy, especially in high cost areas. We can put people to work and we can do something responsible for the next generation about global warming. Those three things are very important and it's a trifecta with renewable energy for us. Thank you, Governor Walker. No, there's a number of things. Obviously, new renewable energy needs to be in the portfolio, but we also have to get through this winter and in the next winter. And so we need to have something more, more immediate while still staying on track with renewable energy, which we have tremendous opportunities. The, the hydro opportunities that, that Southeast uh, has is, is been, has been phenomenal in other parts of the state as well. You know, we, uh, we should have the lowest cost energy in the nation, not the highest, uh, because we are the most energy rich state in the nation. So uh, we have a plan we're working on to bring that down uh, it'll require the concurrence with the legislature, uh, but we need to start prioritizing uh, on, on the front burner, bringing down the cost of energy. It impacts uh, commercial fishing, it impacts every, every fabric of our economy is, is the cost of, of energy. So uh, we're working on a, on a plan to, uh, to do just that and to do it on an immediate basis, a midterm and a long-term basis. So we need to bring it down, we need to bring it down uh, as quickly as possible. And they need, there needs to be some relief for this winter. Okay, thank you. So a couple of fisheries questions here. Um, it seems that international fisheries management issues have left Alaskans feeling at the short end of the harvest. What would your administration do to ensure Alaska fisheries has its fair share? Governor Walker. Well, a couple of things. One is on the North Pacific Fishery Management Council, we need to have representation uh, uh, from Alaska's side that uh, uh, represent, truly represents Alaska. And I know there's a there's a tussle back and forth on those 11 votes. We have six; they have five. And in in, uh, in Washington, we need to make sure our six um, know what uh, what uniform they need to be wearing. Secondly, on the bycatch issue, we need to be aggressive on the bycatch issue. I have reviewed proposals that were submitted to the board 24 years ago that were, were still not acted on. So I don't think we need to study the bycatch much more. We need to start have some aggressive actions. And there are some available. Other other locales in the in the world do. Uh, take uh, more aggressive steps on reducing bycatch, and we need to do the same thing. Thank you, Representative. Thank you. Um, oh, excuse me. New new microphone. Um, look, um, we've got two international fisheries councils that we have to deal with as Alaskans. Um, but one of their points is um, uh, our fishermen get deducted what we're able to catch in halibut because they look out in the Bering Sea and they see us dumping a thousand tons of halibut dead to the bottom of the ocean by factory uh, uh, bottom trawlers. And, um, and so we do have to solve that problem, right? I mean, we need to address the excessive bycatch, especially in the Bering Sea, uh, where you kill over 500,000 chums, but people in Bethel can't fish for chums, um, where you dump over uh, 1,000 tons of halibut dead to the bottom of the ocean. And we do get a majority of seats on the North, uh, on, on, on the North Pacific Fishery Management Council, and we should use those seats uh, to regulate that issue so that we don't have to deal with uh, Canada saying, look, you're wasting your fish over there, uh, you get deducted down in Southeast. So um, we should also make sure that we have strong negotiators and strong science in these international commissions so we can get our fair share. People who know how to negotiate, we don't have that right now. So we should pay attention to that uh, both on the salmon and the halibut commission. 
and while you have the mic, the next question follow up uh, related to that is there are a number of international issues uh, revolving, uh, involving the fisheries. Right now, there's uh, a wild fish group uh, suing uh, nymphs and it's dragging the Alaska trollers in. Um, how vigorous would you uh, portray your stance on defending Alaska's fisheries to outside interests? I mean, so uh, difficult question in, in one minute, right? Um, we know that in the Southeast, both the halibut and the salmon commission, um, if we don't represent ourselves well, uh, give too much of a share to Canadian fishermen and not enough of a share to Alaska fishermen. I mean, it is just crucial uh, that we have people who know how to negotiate. It is just crucial that we have a team of people that provide the science to the people who know how to negotiate. Um, so I mean, I believe in Alaskanizing our fisheries. Uh, I believe our, you know, fish bind Alaskans, whether you're a sport or commercial or a subsistence fisherman or woman, fish bind Alaskans. We have to make sure our fish are around here, here for the next, um, next generation. Um, in part, it's, it's, it's doing something real about bycatch, uh, um, which, is, which I think is an abomination. Um, and in part, it, it, it does involve um, having much stronger active representation um, on our international fisheries groups um, so that our fishermen are represented and um, uh, as strongly as the Canadians represent their fishermen. Do, do we hear Governor yep. Walker? Yep. Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> You know, uh, fisheries is one of the was a driving one of the driving forces for Alaska to become a state for us to control our own our own fisheries, <clears throat> and and we're sort of we're kind of back to that again. And then as far as controlling our fisheries, it's absolutely paramount that we do uh, that we do that. And and if we don't, then I think you know the sustained yield is is it, it's a constitutional mandate that uh, that we need need to follow. But it's also a matter of making sure that that we we have. Um, um, we have the tools to work with. And I'm a big believer in science, obviously, and science is very important and decisions can be based upon science and not, not based upon politics or who, you know, who's, who's in office, who likes fisheries, who doesn't. It needs to be, uh, it needs to be based on long-term as well. Uh, Short-term is, is critical, but long-term that, that we don't, that we resolve this in such a way that, that we have generations of, of uh, commercial fishing industries and family businesses and those getting involved in, in, in fishing industry uh, and generational, not just not just uh, uh, what, what's 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 the the fix of the day. Thank you, and we'll begin with you, Governor, with the next question uh, regarding foreign trade. And Alaska's foreign trade is usually Anchorage centric, so really thinking, uh, you know, in here in the region, we're looking at Prince Rupert, you know, the Pacific Northwest, but and markets beyond. Uh, as we look at mariculture and the other natural resources that we have here, uh, what what would uh, your plan be to encourage foreign trade uh, and and help prioritize uh, investment toward that goal? Well, we you know we need first we need the infrastructure and and, and a, a good news is we do have you know hundreds of flights a day coming in from from Asia into uh, into Alaska and, and typically they they return without much product from Alaska. So we need to make sure that we have those. Have those products. I, I led a uh, Opportunity Alaska delegation to Asia when I was governor, and as a result of that, a number of businesses have made significant contact with Asia on our on our seafood. Actually, it was a, one of the beer manufacturers as well. And so it's a matter of, of establishing those relationships, uh, and that's one of the roles of the governor is to be the you know, sort of the the relationship negotiator in chief to sort of create those opportunities for markets to realize that Alaska is uh, has tremendous opportunity and Alaska sells Alaska, it sells itself. Um, ASME put on a, uh, a seafood uh, banquet for us in Asia uh, and, and boy, it was, uh, um, it was one of the more amazing events that we had over there because of the, uh, uh, how much, how much they were, how, how well it was attended and how much they enjoyed the, uh, the seafood that came from Alaska. Thank you, Representative. Yeah, um, like in a minute, I'll focus on seafood. Um, we have the, the, the wildest, most sustainable fisheries in the world. We need to keep them that way. Um, you know, the, uh, one, of the, one of the gems that we have is the Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute. Um, it has seen less and less state support um, over the years. 
um, the less support you provide a, an, an entity that helps build markets for our businesses than helps build markets for our fishermen, um, the, the less you support and society. So I, I think um, uh, manageable, sustainable state support uh, to the Seafood Marketing Institute, I think is important. I think it creates jobs. I think uh, it creates trade. Um, obviously, um, I will be an ambassador for the state uh, in places where we can sell our products. And that will be part of the job, even though it's not constitutionally part of the job for the governor. Um, so that will be important. But I think we should, uh, I think we should focus on places where we've been successful. And ASME has been very successful and is deserving of a little bit more state support than it's been getting. Thank you. And staying with you, um, talking a little bit about DNR permitting processes that um, are critical to the mariculture industry moving forward. As those permits are filed, citizens have 20 days to appeal, but then DNR has no timeline to complete those appeals, which then okay, just always. That, uh, that black hole of time warps that seem never to emerge. So uh, do you have thoughts on how to expedite uh, the permitting process of this resolution? Yeah, so look, permitting can be slow over a DNR, right? And for the mariculture industry, we've heard that uh, not only is it hard to get a permit to start your business, but it's hard to renew your permit. And, and um, you know, we're many employees down in every single agency. Uh, but when, when you run a state that doesn't have employees, the impact um, is seen in places like permitting, right? And we should, we should coordinate our permitting uh, between DNR and fishing game, even the Coast Guard when possible. Um, but there are delays in permitting, even just for, for permit renewals. Um, and uh, you're gonna keep losing teachers and state employees and police and troopers until you come up with a retirement system that's competitive with those that they can receive outside of the state. That means I, I'm the only candidate in this race who voted against the end of state pensions. I voted against the end of it in 2006. I'm the only candidate in this race that's introduced legislation to reinstate pensions so people have a benefit that will keep them in the state so we can attract and retain workers. And that is part of the problem over at DNR. That's part of the problem with the lagging times on permitting. Thank you, Governor Walker. You know, this issue is, is, um, is statewide and uh, government services are being uh, delayed in every, in pretty much every facet uh, as a result of lack of, uh, uh, of, of adequate in, uh, employment in staffing levels. And, and that is absolutely right about uh, uh, when you don't, uh, you don't have an appropriate uh, retirement system, you don't, you're not competitive. You know, we try to be competitive in lots of things, but we're not being competitive what, uh, with state employees and, and, and with programs. So um, this is a this is a, a victim of of continued uh, reductions and reductions, and we need to decide what kind of an Alaska we want to have and how we're going to pay for it. And there's a number of options on that, but let's start with what we want to have. What are our values? Uh, how high do we value government services, education, etc.? And then how we uh, we fit in the uh, the revenues to to make sure that it's it's fully funded. Thank you. And staying with you, Governor, the. Potential value of minerals in Southeast has been estimated at over a billion dollars, and that is with a B. Uh, most of those are federal lands, but how could the state work with the federal government to uh, really map out and inventory those deposits? And would this be a priority of yours to create wealth in the region? It, it is, it would be a pri high priority of mine. We had a chance to uh, spend a over half a day at Sundance Mine on Prince of Wales um, Island a few months ago. And boy, what a, what a project, what a mine that is as far as local employment and just the way they, they've gone about putting that mine together. So there are tremendous opportunities, you know, specifically your, your question. And let me also say, I think it's uh, appropriate to bring back um, coastal zone management. I think that there's an, op I think local input is critical at the early uh, schedules. And, and so we would bring that back. As far as the federal government, you worked with the federal government by sitting down and spending time with them. I probably spent uh, 15 or 20 meetings with Secretary Jewell on some of the permitting issues in Alaska. You, you engage with them, you build a relationship, whether you get along with them or not is sort of secondary. You build a relationship and say, this is what we need for our economy to work. And, um, and I've been very successful in that approach uh, at all levels, levels of government. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Mark Myers has been a, a leader in various positions of the Department of Natural Resources over the years. And what Mark will tell you is that 
instead of just always bashing the federal government, look, I can get a press release any day that I want to bash the federal government, and it just gets me a press release, and it might get me a vote, but it doesn't move the ball forward. In terms of minerals mapping, um, the cooperation between our DNR and, and USGS on the federal level, they have cooperated both on, 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 on uh, mapping on state lands and federal lands. The feds help us map on state lands. We help map on federal lands. USGS does some of the best mapping in the world. And there have been technological improvements with drones and, and uh, look, we need that, right? I mean, you need mapping so you can know, look, is there a deposit, but is that next to arsenic, which is next to a fish, fishing stream? Like mapping is very important. I will say I will not, I will not trade fish for mines, but we do have a responsible mining history in the state. Um, but that's where I draw the line, and that's why I oppose the pebble mine, and Governor Denleby supports the pebble mine. Uh, but we've had a responsible mining history in the state, especially in Southeast. Um, we can have a continued responsible mining history in the state. Mining jobs are important as long as we're not trading one resource uh, for another. So, uh, but mapping is important for that. You get to map where the toxins are. You get to map where the toxins are not. And um, and I think you get to map to find out those those deposits that are closer to tidewater where you won't contaminate a stream. And I think that's important too. Thank you. So the next question is gonna ask each of you if you have a, a, a priority project or industry that you think would be key to support here in the region. And I'll just, just preface that by just saying, you know, with the COVID pandemic uh, really just decimated and put the brakes on every economy, but no region in the state was hit as hard as Southeast Alaska. So we're, we're on, on the rebound. Last year's theme was just getting through to 22. So uh, we did that. We're here. There's a sense of optimism. There's some growing momentum uh, on a number of fronts. But uh, what, what, would, what would something tangible look like that you think that uh, you could give support for, for new economic ventures or expansion of, uh, of the Southeast economy? And um, start with you, Representative. Thank you very much. Look, um, I think startup companies are important. I think uh, we have a, an agency, the Alaska Industrial Development and Export Authority, ADA, and they keep investing in 1960s projects, right? It's a 1960s agency. Um, all they do, it seems, is look for mines that nobody knows anything about and subsidize $30 million roads to mine prospects that we don't know anything about. The latest one, Governor Denleby has spent $30 million to subsidize a road into uh, the upper Susitna Basin to mines we know nothing about. But we should be using ADA, I think, instead to build the next economy, the new economy. Look, I, I'm, I'm pro-mining, but mine should, uh, Jay Hammond would say, a mine should have to pay for its own way or else it's, it's not viable. Uh, but we should be using ADA to, to, to issue low interest loans to help businesses start up mariculture, for example, right? I mean, ADA could do a world of good in, in this expanding industry of mariculture. Congratulations on the $49 million grant. That's amazing. Um, we need to look through to a future economy, not just the past economy. Mining is here to stay, but we need to use ADA also to look towards the future. Thank you. Governor Walker. You know, I've been really pleased with what I've seen happening in the Southeast on the tourism development. I recently sat through a, a briefing on uh, the Hunatona project, a uh, very exciting project, what they've accomplished, what their goals are. <clears throat> That's one of one of several opportunities that, that we're aware of. I've, I've um, reviewed um, Alaska's uh, Southeast uh, Sustainable Plan, the, the Southeast Trust. Um, I think this tourism is, is, is a tremendous, tremendous opportunity for development in, uh, in Southeast. You know, obviously the mariculture, I was thrilled to, to see the $49 million um, grant from, we've come a long way since the creation of the Mariculture Trust in, in uh, 2016. We signed, a, we signed it, I believe, on the Hump Island, the, some tremendous oysters. So I think that the mariculture is, is, a, is a very untapped opportunity. You know, there's most likely some infrastructure that needs to be done. Uh, in addition to the 49 million, I know the state has put money in as well. So, you know, I think that's a, a tremendous opportunity as well as so the mariculture uh, in Southeast and all coastal Alaska. Thank you. So taking a look at unorganized boroughs and the fact that the legislature is de facto the assembly for that local government, uh, here in Southeast, we have a number of communities inside unorganized boroughs, and they have a, a need to try to capture specifically fish taxes. 
that could possibly help um, you know some of the impacts that occur with, uh, with the charter fisheries that, that are there in the lodges, et cetera. Um, is there a way that you see the state could make provision through the fish tax collection to support some of the unorganized borough activities? I'm all ears, right? Um, so, um, you know, the fish tax is important to local communities. Um, I, I don't believe in forcing communities to organize into boroughs. If you're unorganized, um, I don't believe in forcing you to pay for schools that you can't afford and pay for utilities that you can't afford. Um, but I think that is a relevant question of, of, the, of the natural resources that are providing revenue. Should you share in those? And I think it's fair, right? I'm a, it's, a, it's something I would lean towards doing if, if, I, if we could work on a rational proposal to do it. Um, you know, it's, it's almost like we, what we do in, in Western Alaska with CDQ groups. We, we let communities share in the balance of their, of their natural resources. Um, and, and in turn, uh, that, that helps uh, the people in local communities, especially local communities where people have, have, have less income. Uh, you know, the CDQ group in, uh, in Dillingham um, uh, helps helps um, helps people buy back fishing permits or buy fishing permits for so many of them are being sold to out of staters um, so we can Alaskanize our fisheries again. So yes, I mean I think it's something I would love to consider. Um, I'd love to see a proposal, uh, but I don't believe in forced borrowization. I, I don't believe in doing that. We'd have to listen to people in the communities. Thank you, Governor Walker. You know, and this issue has been around for a while. And I actually took a look at, I actually worked as a city attorney for a uh, city of Pollock uh, many, many years ago. You know, part of the, uh, one of the options that was considered is maybe the fish tax would go to communities where the, off where the fish are caught, not necessarily where they're landed. And so that was one concept that was, that was circulated some, uh, some time ago. You know, there has to be a way of connecting our, our, our economy with the, uh, the services that are provided. And the local governments provide a tremendous amount of services to, uh, to that industry, the sport industry, sport fishing industry, and others. So uh, I, I do look to local governments for, for uh, their, their ideas and input rather than, rather than you know, mandates, uh, government mandates upon them. But certainly we would look, uh, look at that. And that was something typically community regional affairs would be involved in. And, and certainly uh, now that's been blended, of course, in you know, the other Department of Commerce. But I think that's uh, something worth looking at. And if, if there's revenue opportunities there, I think it should be, uh, should be explored. All right, thank you. Um, we're not going to get to all the questions, but uh, if uh, in your closing remarks you could kind of address uh, how you're going to pay for things. Um, okay, we'll do one more. We'll leave that as a, we'll leave that as a standalone question. Okay, so we'll um, we, we know you both are on the record as supporting a lot of what is considered to be essential services. So um, if you would answer the question, then uh, revenues versus cuts. How do we have a sustainable budget that? more closely matches revenue in with expenditures out once these federal funds uh, expire. Governor Walker? Well, a couple of things. The year before, I, when I came in, our budget was about 8 billion. So we brought it down to about 4.3, which, which it is today. You know, further cuts are just very, very painful, very painful. And, I, and we're, we're seeing, we've been hearing about that in the questions today. You know, from a revenue standpoint, we need to make sure that we're getting, you know, things are balanced. I, I'm not a believer in looking at just one particular industry, but obviously we need to look, take a hard look at the, the tax credits up on the slope. There's no question about that. We did that when I was in office on the on the exploration credits. And, and I think we need to look at that again on the on the uh, on the production side as well, just to make sure that that makes sense. Um, you know, I think we need to find out, decide if, you know, you know, on a full fiscal plan, you know, it, uh, you know, a governor doesn't make that decision, but the governor provides the leadership for that. That's what we've been missing for the last four years. There's no leadership on the fiscal plan at all. In the legislature, I believe they're ready for a fiscal plan. We submitted a full fiscal plan. Uh, they, they adopted a significant piece of it on the uh, uh, Permanent Fund Protection Act. We're now funding 70% of government, reven government res revenues services are coming from the Permanent Fund earnings on a sustainable draw. That needs to be completed and finished, and we'll do that. But we need a full fiscal plan, and not just pull on one lever or the other lever and say, lever and say we're we're good. So we've got to we've got to look at it holistically and and get our get our, uh, uh, our revenues in order and find out you know how we're going to fund our, our resource. We have a number of options available. It just can take it's going to take working together as a last one to do that. Thank you, and Representative Gear. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, is this no, close? No, no, go ahead and answer the budget question. Budget then, question. Then we'll give you your three minutes. Okay, for, this isn't yeah, closing. Okay, bonus yeah. round. Uh, budget question. Look, 
former Representative Munoz knows this, um, uh, uh, Senator Keel knows this. The easiest thing to say in Juno is that you're gonna cut the budget, but at some point it becomes the dumbest thing you can do. Because right now at this level, you're cutting jobs. You're cutting the future for people to be able to live in the state anymore. Um, the, except for this one year of, of Russian oil money, uh, um, this state has had a construction and community project budget that is 75% lower than it was in 2014. I've talked about oil revenue getting a fair share. $1.2 billion will go a long way, but that means restoring the construction budget so we can put people back to work again. The 75% cut to the capital budget, that's cost 4,000 jobs. That's what ICER estimates. It's cost us 4,000 jobs. 20,000 more people have left the state under this governor than have moved here. And the capital budget is a big part of that. People need to know that there is a future of jobs, a future where they can rely on public education and people don't see either the ability to rely on our schools in the future uh, or the ability to say, you know, there's gonna be a job for my kid uh, in the state five years or 10 years from now. Those things are very important. So while you have the mic, we will now go to closing statements uh, of your choosing for three minutes, please. Thank you. Uh, look, I appreciate uh, former Governor Walker being here. Sometimes I feel like only two of us are running for governor. Um, so we've had seven debates so far. I, I would say I think only two of us care enough about running for governor. That's what I would say. Um, uh, we've had seven debates so far. Um, the current governor has attended, has missed six of those seven. Um, look, if you're scared to share your ideas with people, don't run. If you're scared to listen to people, don't run. I mean, the best information sometimes you get is hearing from people, right? Uh, that's why I'm here in Ketchikan. That's why I've been to every single debate there's been in this election. Um, and if you're gonna duck debates, then I just don't think you're worthy of being elected. That's my personal view. Look, we haven't addressed some issues I think that are very important. Here's an economic issue. I'm pro-choice. I believe a woman has the right to choose and I don't believe that government has the right to tell a woman what to do with her body. I believe you get to marry who you want to marry and I don't get to tell you who you get to marry. And if this state goes the way Governor Dunleavy wants us to go and tells people they don't have their reproductive freedom rights and tells people that he gets to decide who they get to love, these people are leaving the state. And we will continue, our biggest export will continue to be human beings and people. Our biggest export is already people, 20,000 more people leaving the state than moving here over the last four years for the reasons that you've heard, neglecting the management of the state. But if you want, if you want to empty the state of workers and you want to have no future, um, you can go ahead and tell people they don't have, women they don't have their right to, to control their own body and people that they don't get to choose who they get to marry. In my world, I don't get to tell you what you do with your body. I don't get to tell you who you get to marry. These are important things. And I believe that, that those citizens are equal citizens. They should have equal rights in the state and they should feel comfortable about staying in the state. And I don't want to chase our most talented workers out of the state, but this assault on women's rights and this assault on equal rights is gonna chase people out of the state. I wanna welcome people to stay, the state, to stay in the state. I want this to be a strong state. And those are very strong workers, some of the most talented workers in the state. That is important to me. You have heard my other priorities. We need to be able to fund a budget again. We need to make sure that we have money in the state again to do the housing things we need to do and the childcare things we need to do and to build an economy again. And that means not cutting the budget because at this point you're cutting jobs. So um, look, I believe in a strong future. I'm only running because look, I had a chance to survive, to succeed in this world. I, you know, I got to be an assistant attorney general on the Exxon Valdez oil spill case to do the civil prosecution against Exxon. I was proud to do that. I've had my chances in life, even though I, I grew up in foster care. I believe everybody deserves the chance to succeed, whether you're born rich or poor, and everybody deserves their rights, whether you're a woman or you're a man, or whether you're gay or you're not gay. I believe in an inclusive society that, that treats people with respect. Those are my core beliefs. I would appreciate your vote. Um, uh, uh, in November. And I will tell you, I'm going to put Governor Walker down second. He, he's shown up. He's the only candidate who's shown up. So he and I are the only ones. <laughs> Thank you. I, I would ask you in rank choice voting to please rank at least two people. Please, that's the only way it works.
And so I have committed that my second choice vote is going to um, former Governor Walker. My first vote is going to me and Jessica. Uh, I, you know, I, I, that's just the way I feel, right? I, but, but, um, but please, just in ranked choice voting, it does not work if you don't rank at least two people, at least on the state level. Um, uh, so please do that. Um, I can't believe I'm sitting here pitching a second place vote for my opponent, but but he's shown up. I've shown up. You should you should ask yourself: Is somebody scared to share their plan with you, or are they or are they proud to share their plan with you? And I'm proud to share my plan with you. And I'm proud to stand up for women's rights. And I'm proud to stand up for our LGBTQ plus community. And I am proud to say this: that I will never try to get a vote of a population, 40% of whom think about committing suicide at some point in their life. That is LGBTQ and trans kids. 40% think about committing suicide in their life and we've got a governor tweeting about how he wants to discriminate against them. I am not gonna do that. I do not want a single vote of, of, of pushing uh, kids who are already in dangerous circumstances into more dangerous circumstances. I will lead in an inclusive way. I will lead in a bipartisan way, but I will lead in a way that's respectful to people. Thank you. Thank you. Governor Walker, the final word is yours. Your closing statement, please. Very good, thank you. And thank you very much, Southeast Conference, for, for holding this. Um, you are, you're, you're, you've been in existence longer than our state has, and, and uh, I, I applaud and appreciate that very much. Your, your continued passion on the Marine Highway system is, is to be commended. And you are always part of the solution, never the problem. So I, I thank you for the, the hard work you've done on that. You know, both Heidi and I were born in, in Alaska. Um, Don and I have uh, four children. Uh, six of our, five of our six grandchildren are here in Alaska. Uh, Kevin and, and Heidi have uh, um, Olive, who is four and a half years old. We, we, we are doing this because of the life we had growing up in Alaska, living in Alaska all of our lives. And, and we see the path we're on. We are absolutely on the wrong path. We are on the, uh, not a path for prosperity at all. You know, we are not, we do have tremendous opportunities in Alaska, but if we continue to do fight amongst ourselves rather than working together, we're not going to get it done. You know, I think that the federal government is a, it can be a tremendous impediment. Uh, they own and control 62% of our, of our land. We need to work collaboratively with them. And, and I certainly would continue to do that as I did before. That means right on Air Force One with the president, I'll do that. I did that with both presidents, I'll do that again, because you have to sit down and, and build a relationship. You know, as far as the uh, the issue of women's rights, you know, our constitution is absolutely clear uh, about protecting a woman's right to choose. And I will veto any legislation that infringes upon that or gets between a woman and her doctor. I absolutely do not disagree with, with Les on, on that issue and on the uh, LBGT as well. But, you know, it's really the it's really the tone of Alaska that concerns me. And I've just not seen a, such a partisan tone uh, in my lifetime here, and and we have we have brought in with this governor, we have brought in Washington style politics. We brought in three million dollars of dark money, uh, thirty six hours before the law changed. We have, you know, um, you're going to see plenty of ads against me, and and you I'm sure you already have because they realize uh, I'm a threat to uh, to this this uh, uh, the sitting governor, and I will be aggressive in uh, in everything I do. I'll be open and transparent. We won't. Uh, transgressions will not be hidden as they have been in this administration. Uh, it's, it's, we need to get back to being Alaskans again. We need to be a, one state working together and not uh, divided up and torn apart between different fiscal issues. The bipartisan infrastructure bill is transformational for Alaska. It's equivalent to the Afghan highway, it's equivalent to the trans Alaska oil pipeline, but only if we go after it and embrace it and aggressively go after it and compete with other states for that. And that's exactly what we will do. We'll bring every single dollar back that uh, has been, made, been available as a result of the hard work of Don Young, uh, Senator Mikowski, and, and Senator Sullivan. So it's a, it's a tremendous opportunity. I'm, I'm running because the opportunities of Alaska, and we are just absolutely on the wrong path. We need leadership. We need somebody who will show up, not just show up at debates. And, and, and you know that's pretty insulting to this group, but not even to, not even to be on Zoom. And uh, and you know, also we'll show up and work with the legislature. You know, it's a team sport, and I the legislature uh, has a tough job to do. And the governor's role is to sit down and work with them, and not always point the finger and blame them on on uh, when when a person doesn't get what they want. So we need to become Alaskans again and get the job done and make sure we have a prosperous future for our our children and grandchildren going forward. Thank you, sir.
want to thank both of you for participating. When the invitations went out over a month ago, Governor Walker called within an hour to send us regrets that he had already committed to be out of uh, another commitment, uh, but he pledged to be here by via Zoom. So we appreciate that. And uh, Representative Garrett for making the effort to come down here. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to engage uh, those of you that are, uh, are championing the causes that mean something uh, a lot to us. So thank you for that. And uh, we will invite the, the next panel to come forward. We're not gonna, this is not break time. So we're gonna stay in the groove. So don't call it away. The only thing you can do is take advantage of the QR codes, which have been updated on your table to also include the 15% discount on Alaska Airlines. So, Governor, you might get that link too. You might need it as much as you're moving around. And, hey, absolutely. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> and um, Representative Garrett will be here for a bit while this afternoon. So, if you want to step out uh, and have a chat with him, uh, please, uh, please go ahead and take advantage of that. Energy panel, come on forward. One more round of applause, please, for these two great champions. Materials out front. I don't want to lose control. Okay, are we still live? Okay, we, uh, we want to keep moving forward. All right, where's uh, Mr. Mesteg? Check your text. I do. Okay, Alec, where's Alec? Okay, all right, so we, please do, please do. Like Karen's going to sit down and then Alec will join. All right. So if we could close these doors uh, so that those of you that have critical conversations can be on the other side of them, we'll go ahead and uh, keep moving forward. Yeah. So thank you, Nathan, for doing that so on that side. Um, we certainly want to make sure that we bring to you the resources and the people. Oh, so I'm sorry. This must not be loud enough. It's not. Oh, it's like. That? It's still there. It's still there. Oh, I'll, I'll be, I have to get closer to the mic. Don't make him whistle at you. Thank you. Okay. So, one of the most critical resources we have when it comes to energy and advocacy and understanding the issues of the day is a there we go, the trade association known as the Alaska Power Association. And so uh, the deputy director, Michael Rovito, has, uh, has often been here as uh, alternating with Crystal sometimes, but we have a great collaboration and they do a wonderful job representing uh, the industry and helping us understand what some of the highlights and the needs and the issues are and advocating on our behalf at both the state and the federal level. So um, I'm going to turn the mic over to Mike and let him go there, and then we'll continue on with, with the panel. So please welcome Mr. Michael Rovito. Okay, well, thanks, everybody. Good afternoon. Thanks, Robert, for having me. Thanks, Southeast Conference. So my name is Michael Rovito. I'm the Deputy Director of Alaska Power Association, and we are the 71-year-old trade association for electric utilities in the state of Alaska. We are actually, just four weeks ago, we were in this very room having our annual meeting in similar sunny conditions. So it's I don't want to repeat the joke of how I had to come to Southeast to find sun and warmth because I live in Palmer and it's been nothing but cold and rainy for the past couple of months. So I'm going to, to whip through this at a relatively decent pace because I want to get to the panel. And I, as, a, as a fellow uh, conference organizer like Robert, I want to get everyone back on track too. So let's see, go forward here. So there's our, our mission statement. I won't go on this too long, but I want to say that you know, APA is dedicated to helping our electric utility members do what they do, essentially, and that's statewide. And, you know, uh, Trey has said this in the past, and it's actually on the SEPA website. So I, I'm going to quote Trey in the SEPA website. 
Affordable energy, and Trey, I hope I'm not stealing your thunder here. Affordable energy is a cornerstone of economic development and is essential to building sustainable communities. And we wholeheartedly agree with that at APA. So we do what we can through government relations and training uh, to make sure that we support our members so that they can do their job supporting everyone in the state of Alaska. We do have numerous members here in Southeast. Uh, Trey Acteson is our board president from SEPA. Jody Mitchell from IPEC is our treasurer. Welcome, Jody. I see Larry Beck from IPEC's board out here. Uh, AP and T, where's Michael Garrett at? Is Michael in here? I think he's here, but I don't see him. And then who's here from Metlakatla? Uh, there we go. Hey, welcome from Metlakatla is another one I remember. And, and AVAC is Alaska Village Electric Cooperative, uh, which actually mostly serves a lot of Western Alaska, but actually runs the Yakutat utility. And I don't believe anyone from AVAC is here today. So great representation. So what's happening in the industry right now? And, and I'm gonna talk about real quick, these, these two bills we've been hearing about. And actually, I shouldn't really call them bills, but just say two laws uh, that will impact um, electric utilities, both nationwide and in the state. And I put these on here because every electric utility that I know in Alaska and some that I know outside, big and small, are paying attention to these two laws. They're, they're transformational, as you've heard today. They're significant, but they also pose a major challenge to us as well because while there are some formula funding in these programs, and I kind of with the IIJ at the top there, I break out a couple of them that come to the state, uh, the infrastructure, or the, ele the electric vehicle charging infrastructure aspect, $55 million over five years. We know that's coming. There's a process to get to it. And then this good resiliency formula grant program is $60 million over five years. There's also some hydroelectric incentive programs, but a lot of this bill is also competitive grants. And so the state of Alaska uh, the electric utilities in Alaska, they're going to have to come up with a way to go after these grants, uh, mostly through DOE, that is competitive with other utilities in the low 48. And we're already seeing some organization around in Alaska with the rail belt utilities working together for rail belt centric sort of grant applications. We see some of our rural utility members combining forces maybe with the borough or a native association or, or some other groups so that they can be well positioned. From APA standpoint, we've been really disseminating as much information as possible to our members so that they can make a decision on what programs or pro program or programs might work best for them and what the avenues are uh, to attain that. But it is a challenge and it is a significant undertaking. And I wanna remind folks in the room, I know Senator Murkowski has done this before, this is really a five-year bill. And so there's, there's kind of a lot of panic amongst some people like, oh my gosh, we got to do this right now. I will tell you, we were in, uh, in a meeting with DOE back in Washington, D.C. in June at the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations, which is a brand new office established by this infrastructure bill. And they told us that they're trying to hire 300 employees to staff that new office. And they were having trouble finding employees at that time. I don't know if that's gotten any better. But my point is, don't panic if you're a utility or organization that's looking for funding because there is time, but don't rest on your laurels as well. Uh, APA has been very busy responding to comments in consultation with our utility members as they build these grant programs. A lot of these programs, since they're brand new or they're maybe in existence, but now recently funded, uh, there are agencies which are running these programs are looking for feedback about how to structure these programs. And so we've been really trying hard and working hard to uh, weigh in from the Alaska's pers Alaska perspective and to make sure that our, um, our needs in this state, because we are very unique, I don't have to tell anybody in the room how unique we are, are taken care of. The Inflation Reduction Act, I mean, if I went through everything that is in, these, in both of these bills, we'd have probably like a, what, three-day presentation from me up here. And, and frankly, I don't even understand all of it yet. And a lot of people, even who work, worked on this, don't even understand all the yes, so we're still piecing through it. But I just pulled out two of those elements in the IRA, as we call it. The direct pay is, is a huge opportunity, uh, typically not-for-profit electric utilities, such as cooperatives or municipal utilities, were not eligible for investment tax credits because they don't pay taxes. And so a lot of APA's members missed out on some uh, you know, significant and helpful funding opportunities or, or tax break opportunities because they couldn't take advantage of these tax breaks. Well, now with direct pay in the bill, um, you'll have a little bit more leeway with that. And uh, there's a lot of programs in the IRA that do address solar, wind, and other sort of renewable technologies. The other item on there, which is, is, is a big one, is this $9.7 billion uh, USDA assistance. This is still, this program is still being like the kind of the guts of it, the inner workings is still being developed uh, by USDA and, and there are probably going to be some updates on that. 
but that's a big deal. It's a clean energy financing program of various aspects. There are some caveats on it. Uh, you can only finance up to 25% of a project with a max $970 million per entity. So they don't want one giant project in California and New York to eat up the entire, uh, the entire money bandwidth. But uh, as, as has been said here many times, and I won't belabor it, this is transformational, this is huge, and this is probably once in a generation. I mean, in, in our careers in this building, we may never see another large infrastructure bill. I hope we do. I mean, that'd be great if I could, if you could say, boy, Mike, you were wrong. We just saw this again next year. Uh, I don't know if the appetite's out there to do it though. So major stuff happening. All of our electric utility members, big and small, are looking at this at, at various aspects. Continuing on with the industry outlook, we are in, you've been hearing it probably in the news or in, in, in every, on the conferences that you go to, an energy transition is happening across the country and in, and in the state. And it's, you know, it, it looks at a lot of solar, uh, not solar, but renewable, clean energy, uh, new technologies that come in to play. These, these two bills that I just recently referenced on the past slide could help this a lot. Uh, Alaska is, is, is into this big time. I mean, just today, I think it's over now, but there was a groundbreaking up in Houston, Alaska for the largest, what will be the largest solar farm in the state, privately owned by an independent power producer and Matanuska Electric Association, which I buy power from, as my co-op is going to buy power from this. You have a lot of interesting uh, technologies coming to the fore. I know probably, you know, Trey and Jody are looking at this in the hydropower aspect of new hydropower or even uh, expanding capacity of hydropower. There's many incentive programs. IPEC has uh, taken advantage of an incentive program lately, recently and received funding from it. Jody might talk about that. Battery energy storage, of course, if you have a hydro project, it basically is a battery, essentially, you got all that water up there. That's gonna be huge um, coming up. And, I, and just from a personal interest standpoint, I've been watching that closely because right now, you know, the batteries you see maybe at like up in Golden Valley and Fairbanks or some of these battery systems, you know, they're really there to bridge kind of a gap. If, there's a, if a plant goes down, they pick up the load or if there's a you know, brief switch, but there's no existing large scale, long-term battery technology out there that could run 10, 14, 15 hours. But they're working on that. That could that could be a major game changer. Uh, there's a bullet on there about some communities will always require diesel for generation, and that's just a fact. Um, Alaska's geography and, and economies of scale, and in some places, I like to put a little bit of reality in these presentations. In some places, you will just always and, and who knows? Maybe there's the technology out there in someone's brain that we don't know about that could solve this diesel uh, aspect. But uh, again, another thing I hope you tell me I was wrong about. Uh, but it's just uh, the nature of the state of Alaska that diesel uh, will always be an always be a part of some communities, and we need to, to plan for that. But reliability is king, and I, I think there needs to be a, a healthy dose of realism when we talk about the integration of renewables. All of APA's members are on board with renewable generation. They're on board with integrating renewables. They're on board with the lowering cost to clean energy, but they're also on board very much with the feasibility and the affordability and how it can work with their system because there's more than just putting up a solar panel or a wind turbine, there's a transmission system, can it handle it? Is it robust enough to integrate renewable technology? Um, everyone in this room, unless there's someone in here from the lower 48, but if not, everyone in this room lives and has power from a microgrid in some, some aspect. I live in Palmer, so I live in a larger microgrid, which is interconnected up and down the rail belt. But most people in this room are living on a microgrid where that's your main power source. It's not like the lower 48 where there's regional power grids where if your local utility has a problem that shuts down, they can grab power from somewhere else. And so reliability is absolute king. And our members look at that when they're, when they're looking to integrate these new clean energy technologies, because we might hear about it some today. Everything is becoming electrified nowadays. Beneficial electrification is a huge topic. Uh, electrifying heating systems, electric vehicles, you name it. Electricity is becoming... Um, absolutely even more essential and more consequential than it has been in the past. And so I think that, you know, Alaska, we all know we face many challenges due to our location, um, our disconnection from the lower 48, but our member electric utilities, the folks at the table here, they're, they're working on that. And, you know, I mean, when I'm down here, SEPA has had such, such great success with hydro. I told Trey, I, I should just leave my lights on in the hotel because I'm so used to turning my lights off at home, but this is great. You leave the lights on, help Trey out a little bit. He's got Tons of power back there for you. Um, finally, I wanted to put in a slide about power cost equalization because the last uh, couple of years I've spoken down here has been kind of like doom and gloom uh, to you guys about PCE. 
folks in this room who are PCE communities will know in 2019 and in 2021, uh, the endowment was temporarily drained when the reverse sweep failed in the legislature. Luckily, a court case last year kind of solved that issue with the reverse sweep because the Superior Court um, de decided that the, uh, the PC endowment is not a sweepable fund. And I won't go into the legalese of that, but that's good. That makes us feel better in the industry. Um, however, that endowment can still be siphoned off from for other programs, which we don't want it to be. We're opposed to that at APA. Um, and we have a lot of legislators who are supportive of keeping that fund for what it's intended for. But the good news is, uh, when before last session ended, Senate Bill 243 passed, and, and this was a bill sponsored by the Senate Finance Committee and really championed by Senator Lyman Hoffman and supported by a lot of folks in this room. Senator Keel, thank you very much. Um, who and Representative Ortez, I think, is in was in here as well. Um, you know, this what it did is it increased the kilowatt hour, the residential kilowatt hour limit from 500 kilowatt hours to 750 kilowatt hours. So that used to be the limit until. Uh, 1993, if my eyesight serves me correctly here, um, but it was it was reduced. But you know, with inflation in mind, and fuel cost in mind, and also with that beneficial electrification in mind too, in some areas of the state, right? If you have more, um, if you have a higher ceiling on what you can use under the PCE program, maybe you integrate a uh, air source heat pump at your house and get off of heating oil if it's possible in your area. And so this was a really encouraging sign. Uh, from the legislature, they did not, uh, you know, do anything with the endowment, and it also really showed, frankly, that when the legislature uh, wants to get something done, it can because this bill was filed and passed in just a few weeks at the end of session, and it really went through. So, uh, thank you to the legislature, everyone in here who voted for that. Uh, the other thing it did is it kind of changed how the investment requirements are around the endowment. It used to, in statute, the endowment had a the endowment had a percentage target in there. Now it's a prudent investor rule, which gives a little bit more flexibility for that. So. Um, I know there's a lot of communities in here that are PCE communities, and some of our utility members also repeat, receive PCE. We're asked all the time, you know, what's it going to take to get off a of PCE for these utilities? And there's no easy answer to that, unless there's billions of dollars available to, for, for some of these projects that may not even exist that could significantly lower the cost. But our members are working on lowering their costs all the time. I know Jody is working on this constantly. Trey's done a great job down here um, with, you know, the hydropower, but it's, it's, it's a program. PC, and I don't want to belabor this, but I put too fine a point on it. It gives that certainty to folks in rural Alaska that it's there, it exists, that they have um, a way to have some sort of affordability and help their own economies as well. I think that was it for me. So I will stop here and Robert, I will sit down and uh, rejoin the panel. So thanks, everybody. Thanks, Michael. Um, Next, we want to talk about the, the role of beneficial electrification. As you know, that was a, a, one of the top priority, priorities uh, mentioned in our economic development planning and in our work scope for this year is, is, is how uh, you translate that into uh, our renewable energy resources into everyday life. And so we've got uh, Alec here, who has been one of the champions there in, in Juneau, working through AELMP and Alaska Heat Smart. So uh, we'll, we'll kick it off there and then we'll talk uh, with, with Taylor, uh, who's from the Alaska Energy Authority, the state's energy uh, office, talk about some of the ways that uh, electric vehicles and uh, the support systems for that. And then uh, might even ask Jody for a comment on uh, what they're doing with their rate study as, as well. And then uh, we'll circle back uh, to Karen for biomass uh, update and Trey kind of give us uh, uh, some insights on uh, what the outlook looks like in Southern Southeast for, for project development and next steps there. And then uh, we'll see how we can do without running too far behind uh, where we're at, but lots of good stuff that's really worth putting on your radar and, and sharing with the community. So uh, Alec, take it away. I think so. So, um, you know, one of the big, one of the things that we've been doing in Juneau related to heat pump adoption is uh, a, a couple of years ago, uh, a few folks in town got together and organized, uh, created a new uh, nonprofit called Alaska Heat Smart. I've talked about it a couple of times in, in front of this group. And uh, we were, uh, you know, really grateful to the uh, city and borough of Juneau who uh, funded us with a, a grant to get us started. And what we're doing basically is, you know, so with my work at AELMP, um, a lot of folks would call me up and they're really interested in, in learning about heat pumps and what they do, what they can accomplish. And, and essentially the way a heat pump works is 
you, uh, you're using a refrigeration process to take heat from cold outside air and move it into a warm room inside. And in doing that, instead of like with resistance heat, where you're just converting electricity directly to heat, um, you get about, uh, you know, say, say two to three, two to four units of heat uh, for every one unit of electricity that you put into that heat pump. So there's an opportunity to have really big savings. And in Juno, a lot of folks are really interested in learning about that and figuring out how they could put that into their home. Should they convert their whole home? Should they just put in a little bitty heat pump? And it, uh, it really took a lot of work one-on-one uh, -on -one with that homeowner to go from, I want a heat pump to I have a heat pump. And that's what Alaska Heat Smart is doing now. It's just playing that role between, uh, it's a resource where people can call up and they can learn about heat pumps. They can find out what are, what are the costs going to be? What's the best type of insulation for my home? Uh, how, what can I expect it to cost? What can I expect to save by making this conversion? And, uh, and in having that uh, resource there and available to help the homeowner through that process, we really significantly increased, uh, made it easier for people to make the decision. And I think accelerated the amount of heat pump adoption that's happening in Juneau. So in the two and a half, last two and a half years, um, we've done more than 500 home assessments. So one of the key pieces of this is we send energy assistance folks out or energy raters out to uh, the person's home. They go through it with them, uh, learn about the home, look at the utility bills and, uh, and perform a whole assessment. So the homeowner gets a report at the end with some uh, facts and figures about what they're spending now, what they could be spending, and some information about what's the, what's the best idea for their specific home. Uh, so over 400 home or 500 home assessments have been completed in the last two and a half years. Um, and that's facilitated around 300 heat pump installations. You know, some of this work, uh, as we've gotten into this work, we've had other opportunities. So Alaska Heat Smart recently received a, a HUD grant for $2 million to help uh, improve the thermal envelopes and, and indoor air quality in about 90, uh, 90 homes with a, a medium median air income less than 80% or so family home. Um, so that'll get to about 90 homes, we're doing some air sealing, crawl space and attic insulation, things like that. Uh, we have uh, received a grant uh, from Department of Energy that will help us do some additional work to try to, we're going to create an incentive program on a sliding scale based on family income or household income to, to try to just bring down that cost barrier a little bit, that upfront cost barrier a little bit. And then one other program that we did uh, recently was uh, Thermalized Juno. So this is a partnership with the Cold Climate Housing Research Center. It's a contract with DOE where... Um, we put together what's essentially, some of you may be familiar with like a solarized program where it's essentially a bulk purchase program and this time with a uh, four heat pumps. So that project we had, I think about 150 people uh, participate in that thermalized program. So we went out and did uh, or, uh, assessments on all of those homes, had contractors bid on becoming the thermalized contractor, and that facilitated about 100 heat pump installations. And those homeowners uh, who are part of that process saw a little bit of savings because of the volume that we were able to drive to that contractor. So this is a this is a program that we think you know we've done a good job of of building it up, creating a, a, a process to to be efficient with administering these home assessments, and I think it's something that a lot of other communities should should really start to consider because I think as we hear more and more about beneficial electrification nationwide, it comes into the you know we see it on the news, we hear people here locally getting heat pumps installed in their house and and kind of touting what it's done to their heating bills. And, and there's a, a real opportunity to kind of assist people in making that decision at a, at a relatively low cost. And then, and then, of course, the effort that we've been able to put together in Juno has, has really enabled us to bring in more dollars into the community. So it's a, in some ways, you know, kind of like uh, Anthony was talking about earlier, where the city has given us, I think, over the last two and a half years, uh, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars. And, and we've been able to turn that into, you know, a couple million dollars, right, of, of other money brought in to the community to help improve the, the you know, or lower the heating costs of, of folks in Juneau. So um, I, you know, more than happy to talk with anyone who's interested about trying to build this out in your community. And uh, we'd really like to see uh, more of this happening throughout the region because there's a lot of opportunity here. Thank you, Alec. And you know, while you're on the heat pump uh, topic, Jody, why don't you go ahead and comment on uh, what you're doing to encourage those type of uh, beneficial electrification opportunities in your, your areas? 
Yeah, I, I think, uh, gosh, I guess it was a couple of years ago when we were on Zoom, we were talking, just talking about this, about uh, trying to create a heat pump rate for our small communities. And we did do that. And we have about 70, 75 of them on our system now. And with the change in the PCE level from 500 to 750, I think they're even more beneficial. And just another plug for Alec, I got one in Juno and I love that thing. Especially when it got really hot this summer, it was nice and cool in my house. Yeah, no, no, well, for the first half of the summer, it was, anyway, you all know, you were there. But anyway, yeah, it's been really good. Um, because of the amount of diesel on our system though, we have to limit the number of that we can have on our system because it's kind of like, if you have all of them turn on at the same time, um, it's like trying to go uphill in fourth gear. And all of a sudden, you know, you could have blackouts. Um, so uh, we haven't hit that level yet, but um, we are probably going to in the next couple of years. So we need more hydro. Anyway, I'll talk about that later. All right, there you go. So APNT, you're still doing an incentive program, correct, in your service areas as well? And you've got part of that matched even by Sea Alaska for their uh, shareholders, uh, and that's up to uh, 500 and 500, is that uh, correct? So you know, most of Southeast Alaska has some sort of incentive if out beyond just the dollars and cents that it makes sense to, to participate in. So. Um, is definitely get engaged with your, um, your local utilities and give us a shout out if we can help with that. So we know we've seen Juno really excel, accelerate. Oh, that's a good that's a good EV term. Um, not many of you guys are electric car owners or what? You know what accelerating in, a, in an electric vehicle is? It's just like awesome. I love leaving these big old trucks behind at the stoplights because they want to rev, 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 and psh, boom, take it out of mode. So. But, um, you know, Juno is just a, an awesome, hey, we got one high, I'm from Haines. I mean, like, where, where do we get to, to go fast? Um, so it's, a, it's a, an awesome success story in Juno, but it hasn't penetrated, you know, penetrated across the state very well and, and other parts of Southeast Alaska. And I know um, the Alaska Energy Authority is working on some statewide initiatives and rolling out a number of programs. But while we're talking about Alaska Energy Authority, where's Tim? Tim, Tim Sanson. There he is. All right. Okay. So uh, Tim's also one of the project manager, chief engineer, the guy responsible for things, all the uh, all the box D, all of the above. So um, energy issues. If you haven't already found them, they're here through uh, through all three days. But Taylor, why don't you walk us through what uh, what the Alaska Energy Authority is doing for uh, supporting the last uh, for electric vehicles? So, well, sorry. Uh, my name is Taylor Asher. I work for the Alaska Energy Authority. I am a project manager. Um, these days, I have been spending approximately 90% of my time working on our EV program. Um, so recently in the past about four years, uh, AEA was designated as a lead entity to administer the VW settlement funds. Um, and through that program, we started working into the EV world. Um, so again, that was about four years ago. And at that point, we developed uh, a mission statement uh, directly related to EVs, which is to reduce the barriers to adoption uh, in Alaska. So with the VW settlement funds, uh, which some of you may have already heard about, but we focused on the road system from um, Fairbanks all the way down to Homer and Seward. So we had nine sites, uh, no greater than 100 miles apart, um, and about four of those sites are now online. Um, and we expect that the other remaining five sites will be online next year. Um, so because we started working on uh, EVs, we were also designated as the state uh, agency to work through the infrastructure bill as it relates to EVs. So there is something called the National Electric Vehicle Implementation Plan, NEVI for short. Um, and like Michael had said earlier, we're going to be receiving a little bit over $50 million to install charging stations throughout the state. Uh, through the program, the uh, first phase, which is required through the federal government, is to build out the alternative fuel corridor. That corridor is from Anchorage to Fairbanks, and that was designated by the Alaska uh, Department of Transportation. 
so that will be the first phase of the program that will take approximately two years. After that, then we can start working into other areas of the state. Phase two, we have uh, dedicated funds to go towards Southeast, the Marine Highway System, as well as the rest of the road system uh, in interior Alaska. Uh, so it'll be approximately three years before we can start installing uh, charging stations in Southeast as far as those funds go. Um, so we will find out if our plan was approved by September 30th, so here in a few weeks, and then we'll begin uh, rolling out those funds uh, likely in October or November. Um, so we are also applying for a few competitive grants through the Department of Transportation um, and Energy, the Joint Office. Uh, those two, we're applying for just over $2 million. Uh, we have several partners in the room uh, that are helping us put those applications together. One of those applications will be to uh, do outreach and education throughout the state to um, educate folks on how EVs work in Alaska. And then the other one would be to install charging stations in rural Alaska as the NEVI funds are primarily focused on road system. So that's kind of the work that we have been doing to date. Uh, but this is a very exciting announcement that we have that... Thank you. Um, that uh, folks may have not heard about yet, uh, but we have dedicated $125,000 to install charging stations in uh, this region, Southeast Alaska. And so we are going to be giving that to, uh, to uh, Southeast Conference, um, and Robert will be administering those funds for this area. So did you just uh, announce a, a grant award for $125,000 to Southeast Conference? So that is very exciting. It's very exciting. Yes, you know, thank you. Like, I mean, thank you. Place easily. That yes. Probably this week. <laughs> Uh, so there are a few strings attached to that. Essentially, there has to be five years of uh, maintenance and operations. That is just through the program. Um, the charging stations will have to be networked so that we can collect data. Again, requirement through the program. And those sites will have to be competitively chosen. Um, so uh, those are kind of the, the few strings attached, but that's the work that we're doing at AEA as it relates to EVs. I'm happy to hand out business cards and talk to folks. Um, our NEVI plan is on our website, so I encourage you to go online, check it out. Um, it is a living document. We will be updating it every year. Um, so you guys can go ahead and provide comments, feedback, and we have a section at the very back that um, addresses each of those comments um, so you know that we have read them and either chose to, to take your comment under, under consideration or we did not, and this is why. Um, so we are reading every single comment, and I encourage you to go online, uh, read the plan, and then give us your feedback. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That, that really will help prime the pump uh, for when the NEVI funds become available in two or three years to be able to kind of get this rolled out. So, you know, we've got AP and T, we've got, we've got all the communities here, um, you know, represented, Jody, uh, we've got uh, Sika, we've got Wrangell folks here, Petersburg, the communities that really have not seen penetration for electric vehicles. So this will really help get that conversation going and lay out the groundwork for uh, a continued sustained program. So thank you so very much. We're really proud of the relationship that we've got with the Alaska Energy Authority. We've worked long, Tim says very long time with, with, with each other um, and on so many different projects, whether it's infrastructure projects or uh, just program development. And one of those other programs is biomass, which Taylor also is involved with. Um, you want to just say a comment and introduce Karen and let her um, speak to that because you're our, our point of contact there at the Alaska Energy Authority and who are other partners? Maybe you brought somebody else out in the room that's right in front of me. <laughs> so I, I do have a very narrow portfolio in which I do EVs, biomass and energy efficiency, um, but we do have a very strong uh, relationship with Southeast Conference. Been working with them for a number of years before my time. Uh, Southeast Conference does a very excellent job of not only promoting biomass um, in this region, but also helping us throughout the entire state. Um, Karen is an excellent resource. She is the, the queen of biomass. She knows everything to know about biomass. Unfortunately, she will be retiring soon. So we are so, so sad uh, to lose her because she is very, very good at her job. Uh, but we really value our relationship with Southeast Conference and there's no way that we could do it without them. So um, I will hand it off to Karen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody. My name is Karen Peterson. I work for Robert, or I work for Southeast Conference, and I'm the Biomass Outreach Coordinator. I actually work statewide. 
Um, so we've got projects um, throughout the state that I help facilitate. And uh, before I go too much further, I told Robert when he told me I was going to be on this panel that I do not nothing with electrification, right? There is one cogeneration plant in the entire state of Alaska, and it's in Toke, and it's over 100 years old. It's a Skinner horizontal steam donkey that generates all of the most of the electricity for the Toke school. It's pretty darn cool, but we don't have a lot of electrical projects here. So I do mostly thermal heat in Alaska. Um, so what is biomass? It, it can be anything that can burn, and we have a lot of things. In fact, I brought show and tell. <laughs> we'll talk about that in just a second. Robert said I couldn't have any slides, so I thought I'd bring some show and tell. <laughs> anyway, um, biomass for our intents and purposes here is primarily wood. And we can talk about cordwood, chip wood, chunk wood, or pellets. There's a lot of different ways that wood can come to a biomass project. Um, and most of the things that I do circle around the Alaska Wood Energy Development Task Group and the Alaska Wood Energy Development Team. And we um, help people as they are considering wood energy projects, um, help them make the right decisions and help them find funding. Um, we didn't do a lot of work during COVID because one of the things that we do is send engineers to communities to take a look at existing installed heat facilities to see whether there is a good opportunity for a wood heat system to be put in there instead. And of course, COVID shut a lot of that stuff down, but we're back up and running. We just selected three communities in the state of Alaska for feasibility studies and the uh, pre-feasibility studies. And those would be Bristol Bay Native Corporation, um, the Cordova Ranger district and uh, Crossroads Medical Center in Glen Allen. Um, we are actively soliciting applications. If you're thinking that you'd like a wood heat system, it always starts with me and it always starts with a simple little feasibility study so we can go there. We partner with a lot of folks. Um, Robert and I don't have money in our back pocket to pay for for projects. So we partner with a lot of folks that help us fund them. I'm gonna point them out. Taylor with the Alaska Energy Authority is the biomass program um, lead there. We've got Priscilla Morris here, state and private forestry. Um, she manages a number of grants, the Community Wood Energy Grant and what used to be called the Wood Biomass Utilization Grant. And I can never remember the new name. And she's got a couple of more funding opportunities this year. We've got Jocelyn here with the Denali Commission. She doesn't do biomass per se, but she can put you in touch with the right person. Um, we also work with uh, um, REAP EDA. I saw Shirley Kelly was here earlier. She does fund some projects, um, but our biggest fund funding partners have been um, USDA Rural Development Forest Service. And so I'd also like to recognize Dave Schmidt over here as the regional forester. I think Earl Stewart was here earlier. I don't see him right now as a forest supervisor. All of those folks can help us fund projects if you're looking for um, installation. but uh, we heard earlier that reliability is king and that's true for electricity and it's also true for biomass. So we have to make sure that our installed biomass systems have a reliable source of fuel. And here in Ketchikan and in Southeast Alaska, we've been struggling with one fuel source and that's pellets. Uh, we cannot seem to get a reliable source of pellets delivered to Southeast Alaska that is economical. Uh, right now, we've got a few pellet mills in the lower 48 that are bringing pellets up um, by the ton in plastic bags. Um, and it makes it really difficult if you've got a larger installed pellet system. So one of the things that uh, Southeast Conference is doing with par in partnership with the US Forest Service is we are uh, going to install a demonstration project here in Ketchikan that will manufacture pellets. It's called a boutique pellet mill. There's small size pellet mills that come in containers. I know it's pretty cool. and. Um, the intention is for this to demonstrate this technology so that it can be um, replicated in other areas. Uh, we're gonna look at small scale pellet production. This is actually technology that is, wasn't available 10 years ago. Um, so it's all new stuff. So when I talk about pellets, I talk about these little wood guys here. These are what pellets look like. I had them sitting out on the table if anyone wants to take a look at them. Um, but earlier this year, Taylor and Priscilla and Robert and I traveled to the traveled to America, traveled to the lower 48 to uh, look at uh, installed small scale pellet mills. And they pelletize a lot of different stuff. They pelletize um, coffee grinds. They pelletize uh, um, horse manure and 
they pelletized, I was gonna make y'all guess, but we're running short on time, chicken poop. We wanted to look at wet stuff made into pellets, right? Because we know that our wood here in Southeast Alaska is really wet. If they can turn chicken poop into pellets, we can make pellets out of our stuff here in Southeast Alaska, right? Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, she packed that in her luggage and brought it all the way back with her from USA. Yeah, you have no idea because TSA really had a hard time with this stuff. <laughs> at any rate, um, I've got a pile of business cards here. If you're interested in any kind of a thermal heat project um, related to biomass, um, I am interested in talking to you and we can chat later. And that's what I've got to say. Thank you so much, yeah. Karen. And it's, you know, it's a go ahead, give her a round of applause. She has been amazing. The only thing she didn't, I didn't hear her mention was the, uh, the next Wood Energy Conference. Um, because uh, that was my only silver lining with this pandemic is that two years ago when we were planning this one, she promised me that she would stay employed until after the next winter <laughs> conference. And then the pandemic hit and we canceled two in a row. So uh, we might cancel three just to keep her. Right, so uh, I didn't have that on my little note card. Uh, I told Robert I wanted my own panel for a Southeast conference and he says, why? You get your own darn conference. We are planning a wood energy conference to be held in the spring of next year. We are probably going to have it in Whitehorse unless something happens there. And uh, that reason being is we feel that the energy issues that occur in the Yukon and Alaska are similar. So instead of having a conference that brings in people from the lower 48 or um, we're going to focus on what energy issues are common to people in Alaska and the Yukon. Thanks. Yep. So we, uh, we're running a little bit behind, but we, it's really important to, to hear from a couple of our utilities, just kind of you know, where things are at, where things are headed. Um, and Trey, who's also the president of the Alaska Power Association and past president of the Northwest Power, I mean, the guy's connected. He understands, he gets the big picture. And uh, as a CEO here at SEPA, um, so we asked him to kind of lead off with some thoughts about you know where things are at uh, here in his uh, service areas and uh, where things are looking going forward. So, Trey, thanks, thanks Robert, and and thanks for the conference. This has been a fantastic conference, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Uh, and so, you know, every, almost every conversation that's taken place so far during this conference is is there's been an energy element to it and uh as uh, michael read off earlier I'm, I'm a firm believer that affordable and abundant energy is the cornerstone to economic development and you know we are at this very interesting time i think uh my long career uh up to this point you know energy was kind of running in the back you know it was just back there and now it's front and center and it really impacts everything we're doing uh interject all this infrastructure money and things get very interesting um i'd be remiss to to not stay so we're southeast alaska power agency uh, some folks remind me that uh, there might be some folks in the room that don't know what that is we're a regional wholesale power provider and we provide power to Ketchikan, Petersburg, and Wrangell. We own 175 miles of transmission line and two hydroelectric projects. And we have partners. Um, those are the municipalities of those three communities. And my board's comprised of members out of that. And, uh, and they make the big decisions that, that drive the organization and are, and are part of the uh, important um, decision metrics on, on why we've been able to maintain the, the low power rates that we have are fortunate to have here in Southeast. Uh, so one thing uh, with all this beneficial electrification and a, a challenge for utilities is trying to forecast what that need is going to be down the road. And, and we don't do it for the next budget cycle or two budget cycles or so. We're 20, 30, 40, 50 years out that we have to plan for uh, as some people uh, may know, uh, hydro projects are extremely um, time uh, uh, oriented with regard to permitting and implementation, and they're highly capital intensive. Uh, so uh, we're working on a new regional uh, load forecast. And in the past, that's been based primarily on population, and we're going to do a deeper dive and really look at what are the impacts of, uh, for example, 
uh, integration of uh, oil heating loads and transferring those over to heat pumps? And, you know, is there a incentive cross threshold that utilities could be using to incentivize their customers to make that switch? And uh, as some folks have noticed, uh, mentioned earlier that you, you got to manage that, though. You don't want everybody to switch at one time because you not, may not be able to meet that load. And you may be burning diesel in order to do that. So we're going to look at that. We're going to look at EVs. We're going to look at uh, the maritime industry. I think we have a fantastic opportunity here in Ketchikan and uh, throughout Southeast, especially places that have cruise ships, uh, to establish interruptible load contracts. Interruptible load contracts will allow you to build new infrastructure and de-risk those projects. And what that means at the end of the day is the ratepayers uh, will have a lot less risk and they'll have more stability in their rates. And, and one of our directives is to maintain low power rates. And the challenge is trying to figure out how to bring on these new very expensive assets in a way uh, that it doesn't negatively impact our rate payers. So a few things we're doing also, um, we're looking at new the new generation timing. And that's essential because if you bring it on too early, then you potentially have a stranded asset, which hopefully these interruptible load contracts will help reduce the risk there. We're looking at hydro, of course. So many of you, I've talked about it before at several other conferences uh, that we've done a hydro side evaluation for our whole region uh, the, in the SEPA service area. And that'll lead us to the next decision on what's the best uh, hydro there. And there's multiple sizes and there may be multiple projects that build, get built over time to fit into the, the forecast. Uh, we're also looking at green hydrogen and its ability to have seasonal storage. I think this is an important thing to look at for Alaska. Uh, we spill up to 50,000 um, megawatt hours a year on average uh, every year. That's the equivalent of fairly good sized hydro project. And if we could take that energy and shift it seasonally into a different time, we would not spill it. Uh, this is also could spread across the whole state of Alaska. Think about Western Alaska, that they have potential for solar at certain times of the year and very good solar profiles, but they don't have a way for long-term storage to shift, shift that seasonally uh, into a different time of year. It could actually be a solution to wean them off of diesel generation. We're also looking at the potential of solar. The cost of solar in our region or, or just uh, in, the, in the world has come down exponentially. And it's, and it's becoming quite compelling uh, to look at solar as a solution. And some folks, and I always thought it was crazy, and, and Ketchikan's probably got to have one of the worst solar profiles in the world. <laughs> but that said, uh, it's, the price is coming down so far, and it's anticipated to come down further, that you can overbuild your solar because the price is so cheap. And then you also don't have a huge workforce to maintain it. Training is very simple. Uh, so we're looking at all these things, trying to model them and see how they might fit. Another advantage of solar, if you could integrate it into your, um, your generation assets, it is a fuel diversification, right? You have the sun versus wind, maybe diesel, and you have fluctuation in diesel prices. So it might take some of the volatility out of your fuels. Uh, so we're looking at that, and we're going to try some pilot projects to see how they pencil out. And uh, so that's pretty exciting. I'd say one other thing that we're also looking at is, is a fiber interconnection. Uh, there's a product that we can wrap around our transmission line, and we could actually uh, take fiber along it, our whole transmission line, uh, except for the undersea cable portions, and uh, essentially do a, a new redundant fiber backbone from Ketchikan all the way up to Wrangell. Uh, and then over time, as we replace our sub cables that go from Wrangell to Petersburg, we'll integrate fiber into those as well. It could help the city of, of Ketchikan and other potential folks, uh, ap and as well, uh, and gives a, a redundant fiber backbone, plus it also gives us reliable uh, communications to our remote power site. So uh, I'm going to hold off there because I know we're short on time, but really excited about the infrastructure opportunities. Mm -hmm. And I would just encourage folks to um, dedicate somebody in your organization to track that very closely because we're going to miss opportunities. 
and, and we already have actually in some areas. But as they stand up these new offices, it's imperative that you recognize the opportunities when they occur and you prepare ahead of time, know what projects you wanna do, have some cost analysis, put a white paper together, get ready. We'll have multiple bites at the apple, but folks that come in early in the process stand to get more bites at the apple. Um, especially, I mean, say you uh, fund a project uh, portion of it on the early part. Uh, if you're already in the queue, you've already established a relationship with those agencies and stuff, you'll have a better opportunity to be successful. So I'll just leave it with that. Thanks, Greg. Appreciate that. Um, and we've got just very, very few minutes. We're a little over time. We're going to push into the, the, the break as we go around the clock. But as I walk back to uh, get Mr. Garrett's brief update uh, on the Halungai project, because uh, I know that's something that Southeast Conference was very involved with because of Lisa Lang. And uh, one of those type of partnerships, you know, she came to Southeast Conference and said, Robert, I get taken outside a lot, you know, just like you know, she, <clears throat> but you know, it was one of those things between the utility and the corporation who formed a, a partnership and a, and a path forward that um, leads to opportunity. So I'm uh, really proud about that. So I'm gonna walk back that way, but Jody, you've brought on new generation since the last annual meeting. Tell us how that's going and what's, what's next. Okay, yeah, I have a lot to say, but I'm gonna to try to be quick because I know that we're um, running behind schedule. And, and actually I invited myself to this panel because I need your help. I need you guys to help me get money for our next two projects because we have two shovel ready projects, but there's not enough grant funding out there to build them. And unfortunately the infrastructure bill does not include funding for new hydro. I said this earlier and I can't believe it, but it's the truth. Um, we have we have the Water Supply Creek project at Huna, which we need about 10 million for, and then the Thayer Creek Hydro project for Angoon, which we need about 20 million for. And I just want to caution that those two projects, uh, that's without any inflationary adjustments. So who knows? Um, we do have a success. We built two, one in Huna at uh, Gartina Falls and one in Cake at Gunnett Creek. Um, the Gunnett Creek project in Cake was completed in October of 2020, and we had planned to have a big shindig invite invite y'all to come and uh, help us cut the ribbon, but because of COVID, that didn't happen. But I'm proud to say that that project in last year provided 37% of the power for Cake. Uh, that amount will go up as we continue to tweak it. We had to replace the screens because they're a little bit too fine. Um, but we've had a lot of time this year, especially with how much rain we've had, where we've been diesels off in cake, which is the gold standard. And yeah, help me celebrate, y'all. Um, you know, and one thing I really, you know, was keen on is the state renewable energy fund, in my opinion, has been way undercapitalized. Um, there's 15 million in there for this year, I've been told. But last year, they had money in the pro in there, but it was limited to $2 million per project. What can you build with $2 million nowadays? You can't even build a wind tower with that. So my, in my, yeah, well, there's a separate program for biomass. Anyway, um, and then unfortunately, unfortunately, they have limited the amount that go to Southeast because we've been so successful getting funding from that program. And that's really unfortunate. You know, we can't help it that we're successful and we can't help it that we have so much rain that our projects, you know, our hydro projects are expensive. They're very capital intensive, but they last for so long. You know, we won't be back at the trough over and over and over again once we get these projects built. You know, there's projects in Juneau that have been online for over a hundred years. So, you know, we build ours to last, hydros last a long time. So please help me to um, convince um, those who, who have uh, the ability to help um, to help us. Um, and projects, our projects, especially in rural Alaska, need a lot of grant funding because we already have high rates. If we have to borrow and we have debt service and depreciation expense on top of what we are already pay for, then our rates go even higher. You know, I would be tarred and feathered if I did a project that actually increased rates for our people. You know, I, I just can't, I cannot do that. So we need a lot of grant funding. Um, another, you know, I will feel like I've done my job when every community that we serve, which is Angoon, Huna, Cake, 
Plaquan and the Chilkat Valley can afford to have a sustainable restaurant. I don't think that's too much to ask at all. You know, I mean, when you go to Angoon and Cake, you have to bring food. You can't just go to a restaurant and sit down and order a cup of coffee there, you know, and that's not their fault. Um, another problem that we've had is with eligibility. You know, there's a lot of money out there for the tribes and for from, through the Office of Indian Energy, but unfortunately at Electric Co-op, even though we're a nonprofit serving native people, we're not eligible. So I've had to fight that fight. At least we were able to get past the land issue because before that it also had to be on tribal land. Well, just happened to be that your project is on tribal land. That's not that much land folks. So it, it doesn't happen. Um, but thankfully um, Central Council has um, agreed to work with us to help us with the eligibility portion. So I'm very grateful to President Peterson. I don't see him here right now, but uh, but uh, he he ag agreed that they will help us to, to get, be eligible. And I just want to say a little bit more about rates. Um, you know, when you're when you are dependent on diesel, whenever that when, you know, I shudder when I see how much fuel prices are have been going up. Last year, our average price per gallon was two seventy seven a gallon. Guess what it was this summer? Six bucks. When we filled up that cake and that barge came in, we had to fill our tanks with $6 a gallon diesel. That is gonna affect our rates for probably the rest of this year because we have to burn that up before we can buy cheaper, power, cheaper fuel, which, and it's still, it's still really high. So I'm very concerned about our people in the small communities. And so I really hope that you all, as I said before, will help me to um, convince those in, in power and those who have influence to help us. So anyway, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. Mr. Garrett, how are we doing down there in APC land? I'm doing great. Um, uh, Lunga, as you probably know, is a, a power project over on Prince, Prince of Wales Island that um, at t is partners with the Tida Corporation. Um, I saw a couple of our board members, or at least one in here a little earlier. Um, it has a few unique features. Um, fiberglass reinforced, reinforced plastic uh, as a penstock um, and, and others. It's a five megawatt project and it went into operation January 20th of 2021. And typically with a project like this, there's a little bit of hiccups uh, in the first year of operation, but uh, this year it's been running very, very well. Um, we're working through some minor technical issues, but it hasn't been down at all. And on Prince Wales Island, uh, this has been a, a banner year for energy demand, actually the highest peak that we've ever had on the island, over six megawatts. So it, it's doing really well um, from an operational perspective uh, with what Jody and Trey are talking about with financial challenges. Um, we all have those and uh, this project is facing those and working through them. Um, but it's doing well and providing hydro uh, on Prince Wales Island. So uh, looking at the future, we're expecting demand to grow and become a more valuable project as they bring a cruise ship into Kowak and other uh, fisheries, uh, or fish processing and, and mining that's going on there. So doing good. And thanks to our, our partners, Hyde Corporation. Thank you. I also want to recognize Mr. Alvin Edenshaw, who's the board chair for Hyde Corporation. And he and I and Jim Schamberg, uh, we spent many, many a week uh, with Mr. Grimm uh, trying to figure this path forward. Uh, it was quite the, quite the path that we took. Uh, um, I know we're we're all going to pass, but I, I've got to ask Mayor Smith, how are we doing on the intertie? I know that's that's one of the things the Southeast Conference is for from day one wants support. How are we doing? Well, it feels like we're making pretty steady progress, uh, a lot more than we've had in the recent years. Uh, it's been a project that's been decades in the in the working. So uh, we've been working uh, lately with uh, 
KPU and uh, Burrow here in Kitchkan. And uh, uh, I'm excited. Uh, we're still waiting for the award. But uh, uh, if anybody knows anybody with NTIA, I can give them a little nudge. Well, uh, we could use some help too. <laughs> so thank you. Excellent. Thank you. All right. So um, Alec, uh, close us out with uh, from AELMP and the committee, and so we'll move on to our, our health care. Sure. At, uh, so at ALP in Juneau, we've got, uh, like Jody mentioned, we got a few plants that are over uh, 100 years old, and, and two of them are still operating with their original pen stocks. So uh, big steel pipe, hand-riveted steel pipe that's been sitting in the rain for over 100 years, and, and as you can imagine, they are pro they're about in need of replacements. We're, that's kind of our big project over the next few years is to uh, get those pen stocks replaced. We're going to spend uh, on the order of $30 million to do that, and this is one of those things that about hydro they're they're not only are they can be pretty expensive right up front there's a lot of money they have to put in into them uh, eventually they get old enough that you put a whole bunch more money into them so they're also uh, they also can get pretty expensive late in life and uh, and that's one of those things that I think we're going to see a little bit of in in Juno is just having to invest a lot in some of these older plants and without producing any new energy uh, to do that it's just maintaining what we have right and and so that does hit rates a little bit and that's something that we're concerned about so we look at some of the opportunities in the infrastructure act and and again like jody said there isn't money in there for new hydro but there are some opportunities we hope to uh, help bring down the cost of some of these uh some of the projects that are associated with our our legacy plants uh so those are kind of the that's kind of the big projects we have coming up in the next couple of years one thing i will say to folks is that the lead times on electrical materials like transformers is getting really really kind of scary long so if you are building new projects, really talk to your utilities early, let them know what you're thinking of doing, uh, bring them in the loop early, because that'll be a really important factor for ensuring that you are going to have or the utility is going to have uh, what they need to connect you when that project is ready to come online. All right, thank you. And uh, tomorrow, Alec passes the baton from being the Southeast Conference Board President to Lacey. So uh, thanks for his efforts this past year. But at the end of this year, he's going to be, he's been named as the incoming CEO for Alaska Electric Light and Power. So congratulations. Okay, so if you could bring Jared up on the screen. Thank you, panel. Thank you, one and all. Dory, would you come on up? And uh, we're going to take a look at what the impacts have been on the healthcare industry, what that looks like uh, going forward. Uh, and so, uh, Jared's often been uh, available to come down here, but at the last minute, uh, life happens. So uh, he's gracious enough to be uh, on, on Zoom. So we appreciate that. And Dory is right here uh, as the CAO, uh, the Chief Administrative Officer for Peace Health. So um, we're going to go ahead and uh, kind of hear, hear from each of them. And then we'll, if we can maybe take a question, but uh, I really appreciate it. Um, the fact that you know this industry had to be respond well, I think somebody wants to compete with me. You really want to you really want to compete with me with for for noise? I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay, we'll try one more time. And what's going on, Sean? What's going on at your table? Okay. All right. Yes, take a photo of me doing it one more time. Okay, so. Thank you very much. We are very appreciative of these uh, two executives taking the time to explain to us kind of the snapshot of what we've just kind of come through, have we come through it? And what we're looking at uh, um, you know, in, the, in the immediate horizon as we chart the course ahead. So starting at home, um, Dory, why don't you, Jared's gonna, you know, they worked this thing out, so Jared, Welcome to Southeast Conference and uh, the, the virtual screens and floor is yours. Welcome. Great, thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? Dory, can you say yes if you can hear me okay? All right, you guys are at a distance, but I saw some thumbs up. Well, first I wanna thank you guys. My name is Jared Kosin. I'm the president and CEO of the Alaska Hospital and Healthcare Association. And uh, Dory and I were supposed to be there together. I had to cancel. I, have young kids and caught the back to school bug. It wasn't COVID, but it has knocked us down. And uh, today was about the first day I was feeling better and, and I'm feeling pretty drained. So 
I apologize for not being able to be there in person. But yeah, a couple of things I want to talk about. I'm going to provide a couple of broader comments on just kind of healthcare from a statewide perspective and then turn it over to, to my colleague and friend, Dory Stevens uh, from Peace Health and the facility there to kind of talk about her experience on the ground and, and then we're happy to answer questions. Really, you know, I've gotten this conversation or this question a lot lately, you know, what is healthcare? What is healthcare in Alaska? How about the pandemic? You know, everyone's trying to wrap their heads around what, what is kind of the status of, of how we're operating. And really for us, I would say workforce is kind of where our head is at. Um, no doubt that uh, healthcare and volumes and uh, admissions, I mean, there is still a high intensity of pressure of services that are being rendered and needed. Uh, the good news is it's not being driven by a pandemic. COVID is no longer the driver for kind of what we're experiencing in the field. It is a contributing factor because it, you know, it does knock our staff out and, and it certainly brings some patients in, but we're really back to kind of that uh, uh, typical healthcare landscape, but it's intense. And I've heard this from colleagues in other states as well. Our patient volumes really have not come down since COVID. We are operating at a high level of admissions, uh, which means uh, if we don't have enough staff as we experienced during the pandemic, it really complicates our ability to operate in such an environment. And that's kind of where we're at. I know I, I did this last time I was with you guys at the um, mid-year update in Juneau, but to kind of put this in context, really I kind of view it as the healthcare whole. Uh, we have an enormous amount of vacancies we are trying to fill both in our hospitals, nursing homes, and across the sector. sector. Uh, every year, we have over 6,300 openings that we have to fill, and we can't steal from each other. You know, if I was running a facility here or if I came from my old facility at Matsu, I couldn't steal from Dory uh, and take five of her nurses and then feel good about myself because, well, I just took five people from her to fill my vacancy, I just created a vacancy with her. So we have to find other people who are typically not in our industry to come fill those jobs, which means we have to recruit, we have to recruit at home, we have to recruit out of state. One of the biggest drivers in that number is the nursing profession. Over 1,400 RNs uh, are in that hole every year that we're rapidly trying to uh, fill. Now, this is not a, a problem that's relatively static and staying the same. Rather, we are projected to have pretty significant growth over the next 10 years. Uh, we are projected to add over 5,000 new healthcare jobs on top of this kind of hole I just talked about. And so that brings me to how, how do you attempt to fill that hole? You know, I just talked about patient volumes continuing to be very high. How do you meet those needs with such high vacancies? Well, we're forced to deploy strategies uh, to try and fill it. And a, a key component of our strategy, unfortunately, is going out of state. Uh, the good news is there's so many jobs going around. Even when we track out of state people up here, they're not taking Alaskan jobs. That's in the nursing profession. That's in any profession in healthcare. We have so many jobs to go around that anybody that we can bring in, we want to bring in. So right now, about 11.3% of our workforce is from out of state, but only less than a quarter of them stay permanently, which means, as you guys have become pretty well attuned to, we're really reliant on travel nurses and travel workers. I kind of made the point that's okay from the standpoint that we're not taking Alaskan jobs, which is really important to us, but it's not okay from the standpoint that it's not financially sustainable. Uh, just... If you looked at last July, we in Alaska had the largest increase in the entire country in the weekly pay we were paying travel nurses. We saw the biggest increase year over year. If you looked at us this July compared to the July prior and the year prior, we saw a 41% increase in the wages we were paying travel nurses up here in Alaska. That was by far and away the highest in the nation. In August, we're still, I think, the third highest in the nation behind Hawaii and someone else. But the bottom line is that type of wage pressure uh, and the type of numbers we're throwing out there, we can't do it. it, it we already know healthcare is too expensive to be in that environment. Uh, it's not going to work for any of us. So that kind of brings me to kind of two more comments, and then I'll, I'll pass it over to Dory. You know, what do you do? You know, how do you react to this? You know, I threw out those workforce numbers. I did that the last time we were together. 
now I've thrown out these kind of wage numbers. Really, the answer is we need a paradigm shift. And this is what we are working on at our association with our hospitals, our nursing homes, our other healthcare care um, partners across the continuum. And when I, I say a paradigm shift, you know, we're all putting out those job postings, but no one's applying. So that means we have to really look inward and figure out how to train up into these kind of more specialized positions. And so the way we kind of categorize this at the association is we think of it uh, with the three P's. It's pipeline, it's pathways, and it's protection. And when I say pipeline, this is about engaging younger Alaskans to actually start increasing our output of professionals once they become of age to come into the workforce. Right now, we're not doing a good enough job. You know, you hear time and time again, I went to my uh, daughter's kindergarten class last year and people will joke, what are you going to a kindergarten class for? You know, yeah, it was career day, but you'd be surprised by the statistic. I'll leave it to the education people. Young, young kids will actually discount themselves out of a profession by a very young age. They'll say, I'm not smart enough. I can't do that. Well, for healthcare, you know, we know if you want to be a doctor or a nurse, sometimes that starts really young and you're really motivated. Those people are great. We want them. Don't get me wrong. But we want those kids that, you know, are going to finish high school and may not go on to college. We want those C plus students that feel like they may not have kind of a next step future. Because once you come into our facilities, it's an ecosystem. You could go anywhere with healthcare. You just need the training. And that kind of takes me to pathways. We offer specialty trainings to rural nurses uh, for all side types of disciplines so they can train up into these more specialty positions, both in our urban markets and rural markets. But more importantly, we have to get better with apprenticeships. This is something that's used at the primary care level and clinics across the state. It's not something we use very effectively or very widely in our hospital environment. And that's something we're concentrating at the association and among our facilities across Alaska. And then the last thing is about protection. It really, you know, I would spend a ton of time talking about pipeline. You think that's the answer, right? We, if we can just increase our output of people coming in, that, that's how we solve our problem. It's true, but it's not totally true. And, and I went to a conference not too long ago in Washington, D.C., and I think it was North Carolina. And this concept would absolutely hold true for Alaska. But they took that concept of pipeline. And they put it over a projected need over the next 10 to 20 years. And they said, if we took our, our, how many graduates we come in out of our programs, how many people we have entering the workforce, if we increased it by 10 and even 20%, they were still nowhere near meeting the anticipated hole to provide basic services in healthcare. And what that tells us is we all need to be hugging our current workforce and doing everything we can to support them and increase resiliency. Because if we start hemorrhaging more from the current workforce and seeing burnout and people leaving three, we're gonna be in a world of hurt because we know we're gonna have those retirements come in. We're gonna have that natural exit. We cannot afford to have any more than that. And so the last thing I'll say before I hand it over to Dory is, you know, those are kind of concepts I've talked about, we're talking about, and we're doing a lot of this. So there's some grant funding, uh, focusing on apprenticeships and things like that and trainings. But from a policy standpoint, if you're asking us uh, in, a, in the public policy realm, if you ask me the two things that I would want today, the two things that I want, I want Alaska to join the nurse licensure compact. We worked time and time again for the last year to see if there is a way to improve our licensing process, which right now can take upwards of 16 to 20 weeks to get a nurse license in Alaska. When I can tell you we need anybody and everybody now. And it's not because we have some special requirements that make us uh, meet our unique kind of needs in Alaska. We don't, we don't have, we're not unique enough for getting nurses on the ground. We need to be following what everyone else does. There is a nurse licensure compact used by 39 other states and jurisdictions across the country that if someone is from that state, they need a single license to practice across state lines. Alaska needs to join that compact. And that's what we're gonna be bringing to Juno in January. And the second thing I would offer is behavioral health. We made great strides last session with crisis stabilization services and really bringing attention to the continuum. One of our biggest deficiencies in healthcare 
and frankly, kind of has a, a, a service amongst our uh, Alaskans is behavioral health. People are burned out, people are in crisis, and they still have to come to hospitals because there's nowhere else to go for kind of long-term services and recovery. So that's kind of the, the snapshot. I think all those themes hold, hold true for Southeast and frankly, anywhere in the state. We all obviously have our uh, geographical uniqueness, uh, but that's kind of healthcare uh, at a glance. And I'd now turn it over to Dory. No, thank you. No, all right, I'm live now. Thank you, Jared. And sorry you couldn't be here with me today. And thank you for sitting with me. So I'm not by myself at this big table. <laughs> um, I'm Dory Stevens. I'm the Chief Administrative Officer over at Peace Health Medical Center in, in Ketchikan. And I've been there for about two and a half years. And I really enjoyed um, living and being a part of this community. So thank you very much for that. Uh, welcome. I'm going to talk a little bit today. I'm going to give you an overview of the healthcare industry in general and some of the turmoil all of us are going through across the country. Um, but I do want to make a comment based on Jared's last comment related to the nurse compact. Jared's being very generous. I'm a little bit more greedy than he is, and my desires are a little bit bigger. I would love to see a federal licensing agency. So there's one person that we're all getting our licenses from. And we don't have to worry about um, jumping from state to state uh, and moving around. So my goals are a little bit bigger. Would love to see that. Not sure I'll see that in my lifetime, but it would certainly um, solve quite a bit of our problems and reduce costs for all of us, both in healthcare um, and, and the state. So a little bit uh, more greedy than that. But we'll see where that goes. So I will be very happy, Jared, if we even get success with the compact this next year. That's a step forward. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the things that we've been experiencing in our industry and a little bit of the whys behind that. Um, so these are some nationwide statistics that are pretty alarming. And I was doing some research over the last couple of days trying to prep for this meeting here. And it was alarming to me to see some of these numbers. Um, over the last year uh, alone, we have seen 19 critical access hospitals close. The year before that in 2020 or in 2019, there were 18 critical access hospitals that closed. And what does that mean for all of us? That means decreased access to healthcare. The result in that average time, travel time to get to a hospital for people across the country has increased by 20 miles just from those two changes over the last couple of years. 20 miles in addition to what people have been driving in the past can be um, quite a bit and it could be life or death type situation. 20 miles could be 20 minutes depending on traffic, maybe longer. Um, so it's, it's pretty dire, the financial situation that's come up with a lot of these smaller hospitals in, in rural areas over the last couple of years for, for all of us. Um, 441 are facing financial risk of closure um, right now out of 2,176. So there's 400, over 400 more hospitals that are in jeopardy um, at, at this point in time um, because of these, um, these issues. And some of those closures are related to financial performance. Some of them are related to geographical isolation. You know, over the last couple of years, if you're isolated, you can't get supplies. Um, the cost of supplies are going up. Um, transportation of these supplies are going up. Uh, finding people to come and work in these smaller geographical areas is a challenge for these critical access hospitals. Um, typically, low critical access hospitals have lower patient volumes than the bigger city hospitals, and they have um, a payer mix that pays lower. So those are two reasons why um, financial stability for these critical access hospitals um, are in jeopardy. And then there's coverage trends and regulatory barriers. Um, so these are all the negative impacts on health and economic well-being of our real rural communities. And most of our healthcare is delivered in rural health, not so much in, in the bigger city. So that's something I did not realize um, before doing some of this research. The rural hospitals make up 35% of all our hospitals across the country. Um, we've got shortages in many areas. I was just talking with a colleague the other day. It's like, why is this feeling so much worse than what it has? I've been doing this for a number of years, and we've had nursing shortages that come and go. 
and the nursing shortages are devastating for all of us. They, it gets better, it gets worse, it gets better, it gets worse. But nothing has felt like this. And I've been wondering, why is that? Why is it so much tougher for us? And somebody had um, pointed out to me, it's not just a nursing shortage this time, it's an everybody shortage. So usually when you have a nursing shortage, you can support your nursing staff with nursing assistants, extra EVS people, extra dietary people. There's been other people that we've been able to um, rally the troops to help support nursing staff when there's nursing shortages throughout out the country. We don't have that today. We across the country are short of every discipline. We can't find ultrasound techs. We can't find CT techs. We can't find um, nurses, we can't find EVS folks, we can't find administrative assistants. The, the workforce across the board has just been decimated. Um, so there is no support to rally around the nurses when we have these nursing shortages. Um, so that's been the difference, I think, for all of us um, in healthcare is we just have not been able to pull people together to um, help support because all of these roles are, are in um, or in shortages. Um, from a physician standpoint, we have a severe shortage across the country in primary care physicians. I'm sure some of you who are living in Ketchikan right now are experiencing that shortage in primary care. Um, behavioral health care professionals are in um, a huge shortage and taking care of behavioral health patients with needs is the highest cost and the most labor intensive um, patient population that we have. And there's a huge shortage. 65% of our rural counties do not have a psychiatrist. 47% don't have a psychologist. And 81% has no nurse practitioners for behavioral health at all. Um, so we just don't, we don't have the support across the country to help take care of um, our patients that are in uh, huge need. Um, another interesting statistic is 14% of our Americans face these um, shortages of healthcare services because of rural health care getting smaller and smaller. It's a big percentage um, of the population across the country. So some of the things that we can do to make some things better, I'm gonna put out some requests to our policymakers, i.e. our politicians. Uh, we need to focus on workforce um, across the board. We need to continue to work on telehealth flexibilities because telehealth has been an, an amazing resource for us as healthcare providers and for all of you as healthcare consumers. Um, telehealth has proved to be uh, an effective and efficient way to deliver healthcare. And we need to continue the, that ability and flexibilities to provide that type of care for folks. Um, increased reimbursements in several areas needs to be considered behavioral health support. Um, regulatory barriers are a huge cost. So if you look at the regulatory Healthcare is one of the most regulated industries in the country. And again, another really interesting statistic, when we look at regulatory costs, we spent each year $39 billion, that's with a B, is spent in healthcare on non-clinical, meeting non-clinical requirements. And a lot of these are related to the Medicare um, uh, regulations. So we really need to look into the future to see how we can be and more flexible, be able to change more on a dime and align our regulations with industry standards. $39 billion on reg trying to meet regulations alone. That's a lot of money we could be spending in investing in workforce over the next couple of years. So flexibility, not getting so locked in, I would ask the politicians and policymakers in the room to really consider those things. And Medicare expansion programs have been um, quite helpful. So that's kind of our industry as a whole, and it goes right back to workforce and the big focus that we all have in workforce. And I know that other industries have similar issues. So what are we doing here and what are we doing big picture? So. Ketchikan Medical Center, some of the things that we've been working on to try to increase our workforce, our mantra right now at the hospital is train our own, train our own, train our own. Experienced people are not falling out of the sky and on our front doorsteps. As much as we entice and beg and review and um, 
try to come up with different ways to get people um, here and to help support us in our uh, healthcare endeavors. It's train our own. We, we have finally come to that conclusion. That is pretty much our only tactic that we've got right now. Um, so what, what are we doing to do that? So we've developed some scholarship programs over um, at Peace Health. So another plug for all of you. If any of this sounds interesting to you or anybody you know, we are hiring. <laughs> uh, we do have some scholarships. Uh, we've got two physical therapists and a CNA uh, right now. And what we're doing with these scholarships is for folks that are telling us, I want to be a CNA, I want to be a physical therapist, but I don't have that licensing or I don't have that school and I'm struggling um, you know, to financially do that. I've been accepted into these programs. I just need some financial help. So we have these scholarships that um, were, oh, we've got a pharmacist that, uh, oh, that was loan reimbursement. So what, these people are not employed yet. They will sign a contract with us to work for us for a two-year period of time. And then we have a stipend that we can provide to them um, annually while they're going to school to help support that. So those scholarships are um, one of the things that we've initiated. And of course we have relocation assistance to try to bring people in from the outside. We have a loan repayment program and this was a, a state run program called SHARP that um, administers this program. I've heard in the past years, the state had actually also financially supported that program. But right now we are, um, Individually, Ketchikan Medical Center is supporting the finances on that. And the state is doing a great job um, administering to that program. So if we've got some employees that are um, working for us that um, have high student loans and they're in hard to fill roles, we have some dollars um, set aside for loan repayment. Um, and then the state administ administers it. If they get accepted into this program, we pay the state. The state actually pays the um, bank or um, loan that the individual may have. So um, that's a, a good recruitment or re retention program for us to be able to help support people because they'll stay longer if their loans are get help uh, getting paid off. So that's a, a something else that um, we started uh, using. We have tuition reimbursement for those that are already employed with us that want to um, advance their um, education and maybe change careers or do something different. So um, we have up to $5,000 a year there. We have on the job training for MAs, registration, EVS, dietary, we will train you and pay you to work while we're doing that. Um, and all of this is in our efforts, one, to increase the workforce, two, decrease our reliance on travelers, as Jared mentioned, um, the expense with, um, it, it's costly, financially to be reliant on um, temporary support. And it's also you know, people coming and going costs extra dollars for orientation as they come and go, because they still need orientation and training to the facility. Um, and then those people are trying to learn rules and regulations of every hospital that they go to. So that takes some time. So from a quality perspective, it's also better for us to not be reliant on a temporary workforce. We have caregiver recognition with various um, festivities and constantly reviewing our salaries to make sure that we are in the ballpark and not losing people because of salaries. One of the biggest um, efforts that we are attempting is working more and more collaboratively with the universities, both here locally in Alaska and out of state in recruiting people as they're coming out of school from training. That's RN, surgical techs, diagnostic people, social workers. Um, and how can we work with schools to make sure that they can be training as many people as possible for all of us, um, all of the hospitals throughout the state of Alaska? How can we work with them and partner to increase that output so all of us are able to take these new folks from the schools, train them and provide them with um, lifelong, life, lifelong careers. So just an example on how this affects you. I've thrown out a lot of numbers. Jared's thrown out some numbers, but just to kind of bring it back to home, if we don't have enough surgical techs coming out of the school system to be able to be employed by the hospitals, we don't have enough surgical techs, we're shutting down OR rooms. What does that mean to you if we're shutting down OR rooms? It's gonna take you longer to get your hip surgery, your knee surgery, your appendix out. 
we normally, if everybody normally runs off four to five OR rooms a day and you can't find surgical techs and we're running off one or two, that delays access and care for all of us. Uh, so that partnership with the schools to see how we really can increase the number of people that they can train per year to allow them to get into the workforce um, faster. That, that's one of our um, strategies for the year is, you know, how, how can we do that? Um, so that's where we are with workforce train our own, grow our own. We have, healthcare has got some of the very high pay for a lot of our positions, most of our positions, the benefits are all really good. So I have a hard time understanding, of course, I'm a little bit biased. Why don't people want to go into healthcare? It is a great profession um, and it offers so much and there's so much growth opportunities. If you come in on one position and you find something in healthcare that's different that you want to try everybody will help you make those career changes as well so i don't understand why this is just not a career everybody wants to go into um, so that's my story with healthcare very very informative thank you um how, how are those uh, i mean it sounds like a great set of incentives are you getting much response for that suite of support um it's a it's slow and coming we're not expecting any of this to be quick fixes for anything um this was it happened quickly but it's not going to be fixed quickly and are most of that training taking place through the university system or where is that training taking place um, the university system does have quite a few uh, training programs surgical techs included of course uh, registered nurses um and we are looking at other university systems out of state that might have other professions that they are, are training. So I've learned from another CEO of a hospital that there's a school in Idaho that is um, training quite a few social workers. And he goes out there every year and recruits. So you get them they, as they're graduating and you are hiring right on the spot pending or criminal background checks and all that good stuff. Um, Idaho is one of those places, weather-wise, is similar to Alaska, and Idaho's salaries are really low, so it's kind of easy to entice people to come to Alaska. But then that gets you back. Um, so I'm going to follow him, I yeah. think, maybe next time he goes out there. But then that circles right back around to the licensing issues, which... Jared, um, when that final set of talking pages uh, are ready for distribution, could you send those to us so we can review, uh, ask questions, and then ultimately support uh, moving forward? Yeah, absolutely. We, we appreciate that support. I mean, this is the type of thing where it's just common sense. We just kind of need to get out of our own way. Uh, so absolutely. You have our word. We'll do that. Absolutely. And then, um, you know, Dory had mentioned the regulatory costs. Is that something that has um, got its own set of position papers at the state level or where, where do you address those? I, one example I'd give, which is interesting to us, and we're, we're kind of getting in the weeds here, but it's worth it. But behavioral health. OK, I talked about that and Dory talked about it. I mean, having someone in crisis have to spend time in a hospital emergency department waiting for an inpatient bed somewhere else in the state for weeks, they're not safe enough to go home on their own. You know, that's bad care for that person. It's bad for the staff, the physicians, it's bad for everybody. And so we're all hyper-focused on, well, how do you improve that? How do you make that better? Well, one program by the, the state that they've been trying to do is called the 1115 waiver. And the concept behind that is, can you basically invest in and stand up a robust set of services at the community level so that when someone's in crisis there's a place for them to go other than the hospital so they can get the actual services they need well the problem is with the 1115 it hasn't been very successful and, and two reasons are number one the the state and uh, along with the federal government didn't set the reimbursement right so there's zero incentive for anyone to enroll and do it because it's not financially sustainable and then number two the administrative burden is, uh, for lack of a better word, it's insane. Uh, it's about filling out paperwork. You have licensed providers that have to then be registered a second time with the state. And I'm talking clinicians that are near impossible to recruit up here to begin with. It goes on and on and on. So we'll be putting out information on administrative burden. I suspect we'll tie a lot of it to behavioral health. And, and yes, we will share everything with you because 
these are, again, common sense things where we kind of just need to get out of our own way. So we're happy to share that. Infrastructure needs, how are you, are you able to house everything? You talk about behavioral health. Where, where, what's it look like for you going forward? Well, thank you for bringing up the housing issue. I'm sure everybody who lives here in Ketchikan um, is aware of the housing shortages um, across the board for everybody. Um, and when you are trying to bring people into work, whether it's increasing the availability of people to work in the hospital or increasing people that are available to work in the energy departments, um, you gotta have a place for them to live. And that's somewhat affordable. So we bring in folks that we have recruited successfully. And I get a phone call two weeks before they're supposed to start saying, I can't find a place to live. I'm going to have to back out of this. We just spent six months getting licensing and um, accreditation and um, orientation and getting them ready to come. And you get these phone calls two weeks before, and it's just devastating. So then we're all scrambling. Anybody got a house for rent? Anybody got a room this person can stay in? So we've got to have that housing. Not even was it not affordable housing. There was just no housing available in this um, situation that I'm describing. And it happens frequently. And then we're all scrambling to try to find a place for this person to stay while we look for something more um, permanent. So, yeah, I, I'd highly encourage, I don't know what the answer is for housing, but to be encouraging, incentivizing contractors and people with land, us, you know, be building uh, uh, houses or apartment buildings for people to go in, and that is a strategy we've got on the table at Peace Health right now. You know, I've been in healthcare; I'm, I have no idea. I'd be going into the real estate business. Uh, so we're looking for land, and how do we build? And how do we find contractors? You can't find contractors and people to do the work to build the houses. So I have no idea what the answer is to that, but it, it, it's certainly a barrier for all of us when we are. I'm bringing people over that want to live here and work here. All right. Well, thank you both for those insights uh, and information and updates. Uh, it's critical that uh, we all work. We we need you when we're in an emergency, but uh, it's nice to be supportive uh, and, and helping you out to, before we get there. So yeah. um, a round of applause for this panel, please. <clears throat> thank you. All right. So we have a real treat here, um, and it's not walking out, but if you need to step out, then you can do that. But uh, do we have Mr. Persley um, on, on the line there? He is going to uh, give us our, our legislative pronostication and uh, tentatively titled Back to the Past. Larry, um, how are you? I'm doing fine. Can you hear me? We can hear you just great. So thanks for joining okay. us. Okay. Well, I'm sorry I can't be there. I really don't like video presentations, but I got a COVID rebound case and finally cleared yesterday on the test. So I didn't think anybody would appreciate me coming down coughing in the room until then. Wise, wise choice. And uh, congratulations on being a double bonus round winner of the COVID sweepstakes. because so that's like twice this month, isn't it? Yeah, I, you know, I go almost three years, I don't get the stupid thing, and then I get it twice in three weeks. So I, I don't know what I did, um, but I'm sure, I'm sure I'm being paid back for some past sins in life. Uh, so speaking of past, we'll get into the presentation, if that's okay with you, R rather than talking about COVID, which is sort of depressing. Um, I guess in terms of back to the past, to me, that's the problem with Alaska. Legislators, governors, the public spend every year, it seems, reliving, re-arguing all the past battles that we're familiar with. And that's why people like me can get jobs without ever learning anything new with debating the same issues, the same issues when I came here in 1976, minus Tongas logging, which we're not debating anymore, um, unfortunately for Southeast. But I will say, even I sometimes have to acknowledge life has changed to a little sidetrack here. Uh, I had to get a new cell phone this week. So I, the kid, and I mean kid at the AT&T store was gentle. He said, well, sir, your phone is so old, it's not worth anything whatsoever on trade-in. In fact, he hadn't even seen one of the models that I had. Uh, so I got a new phone and it's 
my change for the week. One other thing before I start the presentation, I wanna share one other item with you. I have accepted a job as senior policy advisor to Congresswoman Mary Peltola. I leave for DC tonight. Um, row 24 on the red eye, on a red eye out of Anchorage, which just goes to tell you senior policy advisors have no clout whatsoever. Uh, but short notice and uh, I'm happy I could get a plane out tonight. Uh, I'm telling you that not as uh, about the job, not as a plug for the Congresswoman, not to promote the longevity of my career or my propensity to change jobs, but I wanna make clear that I'm speaking to you today not as a congressional staffer. These are my opinions, my comments, my views. To be honest, I don't even think the Congresswoman knows I'm talking today. She's so busy with other things. So uh, there are my, so with that disclaimer and making sure I don't lose track in my notes, I think what we need to think about or, or look forward to is kind of an optimistic term, uh, be aware of for next year is Alaska very well in 2023 could return to the past of sweating out oil prices. We've done it before, right? Sweating out oil prices at budget time and certainly smaller permanent fund dividends. This year's payout, which will go out starting next week, I understand from the Department of Revenue, it's an aberration. It's an election year and it was war driven oil prices. It's not like we solved any fundamental fiscal problem with the state. Uh, you know, I expect next year oil prices, the dividend state spending will dominate the session as it has many times in the past for us. Uh, actually, you know, most every session since the 1990s when, when state budget deficits started becoming as routine as birthdays and for many of us, another birthday is just not that welcome to begin with. You know, over the last three decades, when oil revenues came up short, we dipped into the reserves, the statutory budget reserve and the constitutional budget reserve. Well, the statutory reserve, think of it as the Taku, the fast ferries, the Malaspina, it's out of money, out of service. It's just not here. The constitutional budget reserve as of August 31st, had $1 billion in it. That fund once held as much as 16 billion. It's kind of like the Columbia, the Matanuska, it's still afloat, but it's really not that dependable anymore. And that's no offense to Alaska Marine Highway System em employees, but that constitutional budget reserve with its last billion may very well come into play in January, depending on oil prices. And there again, we'll be back to the past where we fought over the Constitutional Budget Reserve. This past session, under intense political pressure, the legislature approved the largest payout in history, $3,284 for every eligible Alaskans. But with that and other spending, we could find ourselves in this cash squeeze toward the end of the fiscal year. The combined cost of that $3,284 dividend energy relief check going out is about $2.1 billion. It's the largest single item in the state budget. It's almost double, double K-12 foundation funding from the state general fund. It's about equal to the state general fund dollars for K-12, the university and prisons combined to give you an idea how much that is. The really high oil prices help pay the bill. You know, that's the big variable in state revenues the annual withdrawal from the permanent fund earnings, that's pretty stable, pretty predictable as it should be. And the legislature to their credit has not broken the withdrawal, annual withdrawal limit from the permanent fund that was adopted back in 2018. The House Majority Caucus and half the Senate have really stood firm on that line of not overdrawing. It's the oil line we can't control. You know, that oil prices have crashed and spiked the past two years at extremes no one ever imagined. If you want to go back to spring 2020, the worst of the pandemic uh, impact on the economy and, and people didn't know what the hell was happening, North Slope crude sold for about 20 cents a gallon back in the spring of 2020. You know, it's by Christmas, it was up to a buck and a quarter a gallon, which is about $52 a barrel. 
even at that in Christmas 2020, you know, the state was still taking from savings. Again, we go back to that budget reserve. Uh, oil prices by June 2021 were up to 70. Still not enough. You know, better. Uh, by early this year, prices had crept into the 90s. The world economy was coming out of the COVID pandemic, the lockdowns. Uh, oil demand was growing and was outpacing supply, so prices had climbed up into the 90s. Then in February, Putin decided, I don't know what the hell he decided, he decided to start a war, essentially. Um, and the world lost faith and lost energy supplies from Russia, which at that point was the world's largest exporter of crude oil and refined products. So prices shoot up, right? You're worried about supply and you're paying more if you want to make sure you have it. Uh, Alaska North Slope crude, which is what we base our budget on or our spending, in early June crested near $128 a barrel, just unheard of prices. Uh, and if you think about that early June peak at 128, that's just after the legislature had approved the budget, just before the governor signed it, perfect timing in an election year to look at your checkbook and think I'm gonna have all this money. And all that money in this year's budget, uh, paid for the supersized dividends, you had some one-time help for school districts, a decent public works capital budget, first time in years. The legislature appropriated a couple hundred million dollars in back pay, as I call it, to, to pay back municipalities for the state share of local school debt reimbursement that the state had stiffed the municipalities on for several years. So it was, it was a good budget from the municipal sense. Uh, the legislature also appropriated a $100 million to cover a sizable number of the backlog, the long awaited major maintenance school projects around the state. Uh, the governor vetoed about two thirds of that money. You know, even with oil above $120, he had his reasons, his limits, I suppose, when he vetoed a lot of that. But you know that was then, right? That was June, July, high oil prices, 120s. There was, we could afford everything we wanted, except for vetoes. Uh, but then the price started to drop in August. The world started to figure out they didn't need all that much oil in a recession. And that's what started to scare people. Also, there was the expectation that with China continuing its factory and its city and its citizen lockdowns, China didn't need uh, lockdowns because of a zero COVID policy. China didn't need so much oil. And consumers were starting to cut back on consumption because prices were too high. They couldn't afford the damn oil or the natural gas or propane or, or um, uh, other, I don't know, I'm spacing out, so crude uh, gasoline. So as demand starts to slack off, prices start to slack off. It's, and it was quickly, it was like a fault line. You had an earthquake there by September 7th. The price for Alaska North Slope crude, which had been 128 in June, by September 7th, it was down to $92 a barrel. If you look at the Department of Revenue's numbers in mid-July, they said that rapid decline in, in prices uh, had shaved about a billion and a half dollars off expected state revenues for this fiscal year and the next, based on what they had thought it would be in the spring forecast numbers shifted that quickly. So look, we still have enough to pay all the bills, cover the dividends. If oil doesn't fall too much further, there's this line at $87. If oil for this fiscal year, and we're already a few, few months into it, but for this fiscal year, if oil averages less than $87, there's not enough general fund money to cover all the spending. The legislature, when they come back next year, is would have to, absent some else, go in there and take money out of the constitutional budget reserve to backfill the budget deficit. And that's really bringing us to the past because for many years, most years, there was always that end of session negotiations, political wrangling, bickering, trading. You need a supermajority three quarter vote to take money out of the constitutional budget reserve. Last year, we didn't need it, plenty of money. Well, if you've got to come back in January and take money out of the budget reserve to fill the budget, if it goes below 87, you're going to be back to the political fight over that three-quarter vote, which we've seen 
many years extends the session and, and becomes a, a real focal point. Uh, you know, but look, I live this stuff and nobody knows where oil's headed. You do have a lot of chief financial officers for some of the largest corporations, uh, most skilled investment managers. They say the market is moving up and down so rapidly among a changing world economy, what's going on in Ukraine, China, recession, Europe, uh, geopolitics. There's also speculation if the US and Iran are able to settle their differences on the nuclear accord, Iran is sitting on almost 100 million barrels of oil and storage, which they could bring to the market. So on any given day, depending on what someone thinks they know or heard, or someone told them, prices are moving up three, four, five dollars a day. It's, it's really hard to predict. In fact, it's interesting, the only growth in oil demand, or the most noticeable one, are power generators and industries who are saying, I'm switching back to oil. I was burning cleaner natural gas, but on an energy equivalent basis, natural gas is more expensive, particularly in Europe, than it is and in Asia than oil. So you're seeing some more demand for oil because Europe and Asia, in some cases, are switching back to oil away from natural gas. So look, if oil um, doesn't drop below 87, you know, still looking ahead, most analysts, the market, sort of see 80s, low 90s for the next year or two, subject to a lot of variables, right? How deep does recession go? Uh, does China get its act back together or do they keep locking down um, cities to what happens in Ukraine? But I think there's more likelihood next year of 80 or $90 oil than there is 120, which we had again, late spring, early summer which means less money flowing into the treasury, which means we're back to fighting over not just the dividend, school funding, school debt reimbursement, the moratorium on state reimbursement of, of local school bonds, capital budget, you know, was, was this year an aberration? We're not gonna see another one like that again. Um, I know people are still looking for an increase in the state foundation funding formula, which hasn't changed, I believe in five years, going on, on six. All that's gonna be tough and you think about state budget politics. If Governor Dunleavy wins re-election and if oil prices are low, if they get into the 80s, will he use it as an opportunity to revert back to the Governor Dunleavy of the 2019, his first year in office, where he really wanted to hack away at, at state spending? Um, you know, if South Central conservatives, fiscal conservatives, forget social conservative issues, but fiscal conservatives, uh, big dividenders from Anchorage, Kenai, Matsu, if they gain a majority in the legislature and cheer the governor on and oil prices are low, what's going to be job number one, the dividend or the rest of the state budget and public services left to fight over what's left after the dividend? So I think you got to get ready for uh, three quarter votes, fights over spending from reserves, lower dividends, uh, depending on how the election goes. I think a lot will come down. I'm almost done because I, I know you guys are running behind. A lot will come down to who controls the House and the Senate, which I think for Southeast means not much we can do, but sit and wait how the election goes elsewhere. Uh, I think moderate Republicans will join with Democrats in the Senate to form a coalition and one of the overriding, um, what, uh, pledge, uh, not pledges, one of the overriding factors in that coalition would be uh, to keep the dividend reasonable and not overdraw the permanent fund just for a, a big dividend. You know, the Senate last year was so closely divided. The Republican controlled Senate was close, so closely divided. It was like Humpty Dumpty. They just couldn't put themselves back together again. So I think it will split. You'll see moderate uh, Republicans or those who don't favor putting the dividend first, joining with Democrats, forming a coalition. House is a toss up, I think between the Democrats, Republicans, which one takes control of organizing it. So I would look to the Senate to be that blockage for overspending permanent fund or putting a dividend ahead of everything else, school debt reimbursement, public services, uh, state reimbursement, local jail expenses. So I think, I guess I would say it's in closing, it's, 
It's sad that the dividend has so divided Alaskans at every level that it just uh, consumes all the energy and dominates the discussions until we can figure out how to stop fighting over the amount of the dividend each year. It's hard to move on to anything else. Public services, schools, community aid, capital budget, it's all held in abeyance until the dividend is settled. And with that, oil prices. And I think we need to remember as Daniel Jurgen, who won a Pulitzer Prize for, for writing about history of the oil industry, recently said, oil prices always have the capacity to surprise, which is true. You know, my, my, so my advice is don't be surprised if next year prices are lower and we're back to the past fighting over a limited amount of money as opposed to this year, which was like gift from heaven, if you believe in heaven controlling oil prices. <laughs> well, I didn't want to offend anyone with that. So um, anyway, I want to get through that quickly. I don't know if you want questions, you need to move on to the next. So you're in charge, Robert. Thank you, Larry. We appreciate that. Uh, Frank Stark, Snark, look, um, Stark, Snark, Rob, Wolfman, probably. Um, no, your insights have always been appreciated. Uh, so you gave us a definitive. What? No mic. No mic. So you didn't even hear my, my Snark comment about the Stark. Uh, okay. Here we go. Okay, testing. One. Are we there? Are we now without? No, still not there. Okay. I can do this. All right, Larry. I was thanking you with the dead mic. Um, so, with okay, us, you know, there's so much money. You should have gotten a state capital grant for new mics. It, <laughs> it, it has to be made out of kelp and uh, oyster shells or something, I think. But we'll work oh, on. Oh, AmeriCulture mic. I like that. Yeah, it's. Uh, <laughs> so uh, you you gave us the definitive uh, choice that the house will either be organized by a Democratic Party or a Republican. <laughs> Yeah, that was a bold, bold uh, prediction on my part. So uh, let me give you an easier question. Um, you know, our mid-session summit is the first week of February. Will it even be organized by then? I don't know. I've heard some people say this could be like what we saw a few years ago where they took a long time to organize. The problem is, well, it's closely divided. The new election, I'm not quite sure how ranked choice is going to play out in in some districts, I don't think it's going to affect the House that that much. And you have at least one member of the House Republican who you really can't count on. You wouldn't want him to, Representative Eastman, to be your 21st. That'd be a very tenuous hold on order. So it, yeah, it's kind of messy. It is. So you're saying back to the past. Huh? Well, you're going to have to get somebody from the Republican side to join with the Democrats to give them 21, 22, or you're gonna have to have some Democrats move over to Republicans so they get 22, 23. Uh, yeah, I, I, no one's gonna come out in November with a clear solid victory, I don't think. Yeah. Well, we certainly appreciate it. I guess the, the last question I have is that uh, with uh, congratulations on your, your new job, but will you be allowed to take a lunch break uh, at our next during our next event, so you can uh, give your private sector yeah. uh, opinion on life. <laughs> you know, I'm not even sure they know I work for them yet. They are a little frazzled in that office uh, right now, as you can imagine. In fact, it it shouldn't surprise me, right? Uh, Representative Faltolo was sworn in yesterday. Already, the requests are coming in from people. I've got this project and this project and this legislation, and it's. Um, I guess that's our nature, right? To to get the requests in. We got we got to make make up for lost time. Right, right. But um, well, earmarks are coming back a little bit in Congress. It does appear so. I'm sure, certainly, with her seniority in her position, Senator Murkowski has done a very good job of making sure Alaska has gotten its share for a good project. So I'm sure the Congresswoman will work with the rest of the delegation to make sure that when you search a budget document at the federal level or a grant report at the federal level and do a, a word search in the PDF for Alaska, 
they're all going to work hard to make sure Alaska's in there. So we have an anonymous question from the back end of the room. So uh, can you hear me? There we go. Yeah. So I noticed some pants hanging up on the on a hook behind you. Are you or are you not wearing pants right now? Oh no, I am. Those, see, you know, I didn't even notice that. Those are the ones I have to iron to pack up. I haven't packed yet, and I'm leaving on a plane tonight. No, I'm wearing pants. <laughs> yeah, there's there's also a, a face mask hanging up there, drying out too. I, you know, I didn't even think of that. That's embarrassing. <laughs> Larry, thank you so very much. Best wishes on your, okay. uh, your next uh, job on a well-rounded career, uh, career resume as it is. Um, we always well, you taking the time. And as of next week, anyone can call me at the Congresswoman's office and I'll listen to the request and do what we can. All right, thank you. Thank you, Larry. Thanks. Okay. So do we have uh, Jackie Pata on, online? Uh, for the housing, and then uh, is and Myrna, are you here in the room? Yes. And Stacy. So we're gonna we're gonna talk about housing uh, issues. You just heard we've heard time time after time already uh, over the last day and a half. Yeah, we're 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 expecting uh, Jackie Peta to uh, to join us virtually. She was hoping to be here. Um, I can share this with you if you like, Stacy. Yeah, yeah, because um, I'm not the expert on this. You guys are. Nice to have you here. Thanks. So um, there she is. Good afternoon, Jackie. Glad you could join us. Thank you. And. Um, so we've got our, our local housing expert from KIC, and we've got our statewide, and we have our regional. So it's a perfect blend of perspectives. I uh, apologize that Stacy's name being put onto the uh, uh, the agenda printed here, but she's been a past speaker with us before and uh, in attendance here. So it's great to have uh, those three perspectives. So um, if you don't mind, we'll start to local with our host member, if you can. If you want to just introduce yourself and then kind of just take a few minutes to explain what the local scene looks like and what some of the solution sets might be that you're looking for. Right. Thank you so much. Uh, as mentioned before, my name is Myrna Cheney and I'm with Ketchikan Indian uh, Community as the housing director. So I just wrote down a few talking points so I can stay on task and not go too far into time. Uh, so... I'm sure everyone in this room is aware of some of the housing challenges we face, um, such as material costs, material availability, shipping costs, building land, and lack of infrastructure. There are times in our housing department that we wait weeks that turn into months for materials for simple repair projects, such as doors and window repairs. We have run into this issue of not being able to find a contractor and then the contractor being booked out for two to three months. We're changing internal policy to increase the amount we can spend on re repairs projects, repair projects because of the increase in costs. In the, the last year, Ketchikan's needs for housing has exploded to unsafe and crisis levels. There are no apartments to rent. The homes are selling quickly and for unbelievable amounts. Ketchikan homes are typically older homes with poor foundation and are that are more difficult to rehabilitate. Pre-qualified borrowers cannot find housing in the 250 to 300,000 range that do not require extensive repair. Our department, KIC Housing, is about to close a HUD ICBDG grant that was for home improvement. There, these were $50,000 grants and most of them were roof replacements. Uh, they all pretty much bid out at that $50,000 range. Our department is also about to administer a similar grant, which is the Treasury Homeowners Assistance um, Program that will offer the same grant repairs um, for making the homes habitable. Usually in our department, we plan about one new build every year um, or every other year, uh, but we actually haven't built since 2019. 
We do intend to build a planned project. It's gonna be a triplex. We have the land and we have established funding for this build. We are anticipating the cost to be higher, and, but as a result, we'll have three new units. Uh, this doesn't put a dent in our housing need, but we're always happy to increase our inventory. Currently, we administrate uh, a Alaska Housing Finance Stabilization and Recovery Program. This program rapidly rehouses the unsheltered homeless population. There is a difficulty right now finding affordable units and landlords to rent from, and staff has been busy establishing those relationships for, with the owners and landlords. This program is open to non-tribal members and tribal members. KIC Housing has an approved plan to purchase a building for the purpose of a navigation center. The navigation center, which we are calling Sina Hit, will offer services to all Ketchikan community members, tribal and non-tribal. The services will offer washers, dryers, showers, food, mental health, and social services. Staff will be available to connect with guests, meet them where they're at, and offer assistance. We plan to have classes at the Navigation Center to learn how to take care of home, your home, classes of how to rent. In, the, in these classes, our participants will be taught basic energy saving tips, cooking classes, budgeting, drum making, harvesting, gardening. We have lots of ideas. Staff has been in discussion with this project with First City Homeless Shelter, with Women in Safe Homes, and PATH, which is Park Avenue Te Temporary Homes. We have recently submitted a pre litech application, low-income housing tax credit application, to build a permanent supportive housing unit. Uh, the permanent supportive housing is safe and affordable community-based housing that uses housing-first, harm reduction, and trauma-informed care design models. Our PSH building will have 16 units with services on site. It will be staffed 24 hours and have the services similar to the Navigation Center. We have two undeveloped lots on the top of Jackson. This land is and development is a priority for our department. Our development, once developed, we will be able to build at least 30 affordable homes. This number will be varies based on what the needs are. To develop the land and the infrastructure that is required, we have been discussing and creating partnerships with IHS, ANTHC, BIA HIP program, utilizing our TTP funds, partnership with Rural Cap, and applying for HUD IHBG competitive. That made it very clear in order for us to grow and to focus on our vision, these partnerships are crucial and on how we will succeed. Staff have been very engaged with meetings, ideas, and simple conversations. The tribe through these partnerships has been feeling the energy, enthusiasm, and created creativity in our community. And we believe our community cares and housing is top priority. And that's pretty much wraps up my talking points. I hope I didn't go over. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> wow, I'm, just, I'm still trying to process what you said on the first page. That was great, great stuff. Excellent, thank you. So Jackie, thanks for for joining us. Uh, for those who don't don't not do not know her, she is uh, she's been uh, one of the most recognized housing authority uh, figures uh, and is the uh, CEO for the uh, Clayton Haida Housing Authority. Uh, she's based in Juneau, but uh, she has been often asked to speak and share her insights uh, across the country as well as the state. So thanks for joining us, and uh, please uh, share with us uh, the insights and and any solution sets that uh, you're, you're working on. So thanks. Well, thank you. And, and I sure wish I was there with all of you. I would rather, I would really enjoy it. And I, I really am thankful for the way that um, Myrna started out the session here today, because she's right. We're all feeling the same tension, just like somebody else earlier said, we're having a difficult time filling all of our jobs, but we're also dealing with the, the challenges of materials, um, accessibility, et cetera. One of the things that I found that was really the most helpful to us at the Housing Authority was for some reason, we did the right thing in 2019, right before COVID hit, and we did a comprehensive strategy plan with all of our tribes and our communities that we served. And that really helped us um, identify 
the priorities that each of our tribes have, each of their communities, and, and they were able to have conversations amongst themselves so that they were really clear about what those priorities were. And so it helped us take advantage of the funds that came available during COVID, but it also helped us be really focused on what were the priorities that each community needs. Now across Southeast from the communities that I work within, and there's 12 that I work closely with and another five, you know, three or so that I work um, uh, periodically with. And I think all of us are feeling the same thing. There's a need for affordable housing that's just not there and, and can't be met. And it shows up in other forms, whether it's homeless or whether it's just lack of workers housing. So there's not enough housing available. And, um, and I feel like the only way that we're able to challenge this is it, it, to be able to address this is to be able to look to see what new land could be made available and how can we take advantage of all the current infrastructure opportunities by partnering with tribes and with local um, governments and other nonprofit partners. That, I, that's the only way we're gonna be able to start to address some of those needs, to be able to expand the water and sewer into those newer areas for future development, to be able to look at can tribal transportation or other DOT transportation dollars help address the access ways and streets that are necessary. And, and, um, and then knowing that, just like Myrna said, the rising costs of construction, know that you can't sell that home or that unit at the cost of what's affordable. So you're gonna to have to really look to these grants to be able to help you know, offset some of those, um, those, those costs right now to be able to deal with can I create affordable housing to those that are low to moderate income in our communities and be very creative about doing that. Just to give you some ideas of the things that we've had to do, and, and we have been lucky during this time period um, at the Housing Authority, we were successful in multiple grants, um, you know, um, bringing well over you know, $30 million into the region in construction dollars, and mostly for small communities. Um, we've been able to have new construction in all of the villages that we serve. And it might be just, and we rethought how we we're doing it. So rather than the days of yore when, and when I was a housing director a long time ago, we'd bring in a construction team and we'd build you know, 10 homes at one time because we thought that made it affordable. We're actually coming with the mindset that we wanna be affordable, but sustainable, which means that we're building two houses at a time. And that means that we can actually create a local workforce with having the apprenticeship programs at the same time, trying to get the younger folks and other people the skills development, but also by bringing in that afford by creating that construction crew in the communities, it gives them um, year round work with our repair programs and our other programs. And those quite frankly are some of the first people who are able to buy our homes under mortgages through our community development financial institution. So that we were able to create a mortgage product. That's not quite what you would get from the bank, but it's a way to be able to still get a mortgage to those that are of, of moderate to low income and at, at a, a, a price, a monthly payment that they can afford to make. And being creative and doing that, you know, we wanted to have the options of home ownership that so many offer, so many developers offer. Here's a price point for these add-ons. And if you can afford them, you can buy them, but that's your choice. But we also added in things besides looking at down payment assistance programs and some of the other interest rate reduction um, ideas. We also looked at um, having them be able to do some of their own sweat equity. And that really made a difference in some communities. I, I think Angoon is like the one I like to talk about a lot because in Angoon, we had a solid structure uh, um, supervisor, superintendent, and a good strong crew. And they were able to work on their homes um, off hours and on the weekends. And they really reduced the cost of their um, construction. Now, still the houses, um, the cost of construction is greater than the appraised value of the homes, just because there's so few appraisals in the communities. And that's a challenge for us when we go to deal with the real financing, something that I think we're all gonna have to look at um, how we deal with a cost-based appro approach to appraisals to get a little bit more real realistic.
Um, and we want to keep continuing it. at that program. We call it hashtag success starts with me. I'm trying to make di differences with um, each community at a time. And we continue to do that. But in addition to those kinds of creative financing, new construction methodologies, we still are also trying to deal with being a good partner in our community with um, the homeless population housing authority. We have, we sit on almost all of the homeless coalition boards and have representation, but we also during COVID took the time to step out and try to address the youth homeless population needs. And I think that was a creative approach once again, not on our own, knowing that we couldn't do it, but partnering with CDJ because, and the Zach Gordon Youth Center, because they are the ones that have the experience and the day-to-day -day interaction with the youth. We had used, we lended our um, housing management and property management experience. And so I, I think that going into the future, those kinds of partnerships, looking where who can be creative partners makes a big difference. And so before I end my, my little 10 minutes that I had, I want to say that one of those big partners is AHFC. Um, and not just because Stacy's speaking next on the panel, but, <laughs> but because AHFC has really proven to be a great partner to, for us, particularly the tribes in, um, in Alaska. Um, there was no, no secret that AHFC led the nation in getting out the emergency um, rental relief programs. But they partnered with the tribes and they partnered with us as regional housing authorities so that we could have seamless operations. And that kind of creative thinking makes big differences. They're doing it again with the housing, uh, the home, um, uh, the home ownership um, assistance fund, but making sure that to the extent that any tribe chooses to, or any regional housing authority chooses to, they're there to offer their support in utilizing their portal and being able to help um, uh, process the applications as we need to get the, the information to treasury. So I would say if I had to give, um, be creative, look to all the partners that you possibly can, and it's gonna take multiple, multiple entities and grants to be able to leverage the opportunity to be able to make it affordable. I know I heard developers at recently at one of the CBJ assembly meetings talking about the challenges of the high cost of construction and the high cost of what it costs to build to the levels of that the you know the city's requirements are. And I think we have to look at all approaches um, in order to be able to address this. This is challenging times, and but it's not, um, but there's still so many opportunities. And I see this infrastructure opportunities as an untapped market for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. So we're going to pause this presentation to uh, let a car owner know that his car is asking for them to come and see them. If you own a gray Dodge Caravan license plate number LDB393, that car dearly would rather you move it than the shuttle bus driver who actually made this request. So if you go out there and move that, please, uh, the shuttle bus is having a hard time getting around it, and we'd rather it get around it than through it. So thank you for that. And with that, we'll turn back to our regularly scheduled program. So, um, Stacy, you got quite the shout out from the Regional Housing Authority. Um, so, the partnerships that resources that you have for both the local and regional housing needs, what you got? Well, the green light's on. Can you hear me now? Okay, we're good. My name is Stacy Barnes. I'm the Director of Government Relations and Public Affairs for Alaska Housing Finance Corporation. And Robert, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to join you today at the panel. Um, I absolutely want to talk about the partnerships that Jackie was mentioning. When COVID hit communities, we knew that Southeast was hit particularly hard, both in tourism and in fisheries. And we reached out to your local Convention and Visitors Bureau, and certainly we've had relationships with the regional housing authorities and started talking with them early on who received their own funding for emergency rental relief for Alaskans. And as part of the partnership, Jackie and her team working with Alaska Housing was able to get out $35 million in this region to 3,600 households benefiting more than 8,100 individual Alaskans. 
and you think about the impact that that had over the last two years, one of the decisions that we made was not to pay renters directly and hope that they would pay for their rent, but instead we paid the landlords and we paid the utilities independently so that we knew those obligations were taken care of. And of course, we use the federal funds that we received uh, in order to do this, but it's an incredible success story of uh, what's happened here in Southeast. And it continues because the homeowner assistance program that Jackie was talking about has actually been leading the way right here with First Bank of Ketchikan. That program received $50 million for distribution statewide to homeowners who were struggling as a result of COVID. And there are a lot of federal rules around how to distribute those funds through the US Treasury Department. Of course, we have to be responsible to those rules and those regulations. First Bank of Ketchikan said, we absolutely want to work with you, but we've got borrowers in distress. How do we do this quickly? First Bank of Ketchikan was the institution that got money out the fastest to every single borrower who applied for that program. And so I just like to acknowledge them and certainly acknowledge Myrna as well because of the work that we're doing together on homeless stabilization. As an independent state agency, AHFC works in the housing space from homelessness all the way through to home ownership. And so it's terrific to be with all of you here today and over the last couple of days and to really connect with one another and uh, share the successes that we've had. But it's also important to hear that there are so many more challenges related to workforce housing, to hear the challenges associated with hiring at your local hospitals, as an example. And I'd like to also credit the legislature this year, a little bit of a short story, if you will, Robert, I think we talked about 90 seconds in the hotel lobby the other day. I know that I've far exceeded that. That's just my lure to get you on the panel. <laughs> well, thanks for it. Because as I started thinking about Ketchikan, there was just more and more that I had to say and got really excited about. But uh, there just, there really is a lot that's going on here. And when it comes to uh, a program that has long been funded by AHFC using corporate dividends, the teacher, health professional, and public safety housing program, our board, which includes Commissioner Sandy, who was with you this morning, opted to include almost $2 million into our capital budget request that went to the governor and to the legislature. As our congressional delegation and local officials have heard the needs, uh, Senator Murkowski came in with a $2 million federal earmark to match the state dividend. Then when the infrastructure bill was passed, the governor included another $2 million in the budget and the legislature, Senator Von Himoff in particular, uh, increased that funding. And today I can tell you that the governor has signed uh, the capital budget with $21 million for that program. And so we have a commitment to getting funding out to communities to help in this teacher, health professional and public housing space. How can you expect to have children who are succeeding in school if their teacher is sleeping in the classroom after kids go home at night? It happens all over rural Alaska. And so I'd like to thank uh, Senator Keel, he's in the room, as well as uh, Senator Stedman and other legislators who supported that funding and have been longtime supporters of the programs. They've made a real difference and are continuing to make a difference. And I'm really excited about what this $21 million is going to do next. Awesome, thank you. Now, as uh, Mayor Weldon came up here to assist me with, uh, with phonetics, it came to my mind, I wonder if there's a community or two out there that's in the thick of this that has a comment about partnerships or direction. If I walked over there, would you have something to say about housing initiatives in Juneau? Ah, there's a, a mayor that's not afraid to speak up. And if thing, because since we, uh, we, we, we took the tree to work through our, 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 our break, we've got just a couple extra time to kind of hear about solutions and attempts anyway. Well, our latest thing, and this is why I know how Jackie Pater says her name, says her name, is just the other night at our assembly meeting, we looked at partnering with Clinkett and Haida for them to do a big development. Um, we have something called Peterson Hill, where we put in the infrastructure and we're selling the lots. And we were just going to our phase, Jack, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, 
phase one B and C, and they came in and said, hey, why don't we come in and we'll do half low income for tribal members and half moderate income for anybody. And so we're looking at that and I think we're it's probably gonna move forward. That's just my prediction, but I'm only one of nine, but um, partnership is gonna be the way we move forward on housing because as a city, we don't have enough money to do it by ourselves and we're happy to partner with Clink and Haida and make something move and because we just need housing and I'm sure we're not alone in the community. Thank you. And that sounds like a very creative partnership to make it happen. Just curious if there's another municipal or tribal leader out there that uh, wants to express some of the ways that they're grappling with housing shortages. Mayor Dow. So I'm not speaking for the assembly, but I'll give you my impression of kind of what the assembly's done recently. Housing has been a huge issue for the borough for a long time. and We realize that. Uh, recently, the assembly directed staff to pursue three separate projects. Uh, one's on the north end, uh, extreme north end, to get new lots uh, out to the public as soon as possible. Another one's by Lighthouse, um, and there's a potential for a subdivision back there. And then a third is uh, south of him. And then in addition to that, we've been meeting with the Coast Guard, trying to work on some cooperative relationship that perhaps we can use the Coast Guard to put utilities into an area or continue utilities and then have part of that for Coast Guard housing and part for the private sector. And then on top of that, we've put millions of dollars into a separate fund so that at some point, if we need to, we can just pull the trigger and hopefully build some roads, get some. Thank you. Robert, could I add to that partnership a little bit? When we think about the infrastructure bill, there was a lot of advocacy in Washington, D.C. about housing being infrastructure. And in fact, housing is not included in the bill. However, sewer connections, water connections, those kinds of things are included there. And so I absolutely encourage every community who's seen infrastructure dollars to come in to be thinking about your housing needs and to be thinking about how we can partner and leverage funds so that if you've got a, an improvement that might be made to your hospital or to other buildings that are coming in, can we also put some two by fours on that ship? and get uh, the, succeed from the economies of scale that happen with that. So it really is part of a much larger dialogue that I think we'll continue to have over the next couple of years. But there's a lot of opportunity that we need to be talking about specific to IJA and housing. So Ron, what do you think is the biggest barrier to success with the city of your tax? It seems like you've got a lot of opportunities lined up there. What is, what's the, best win that you're hoping for there? So right now, I would say just uh, funding is not being increased as, um, as you know, prices are rising. So, um, but, but we are being creative with the partnership. So I feel positive. We're, we're excited. Um, but I would say, and then, and then there's going to be land accessibility is probably right next down or under that. So. And are you already looking ahead into the next budget cycle? And are there things that maybe the region ought to be looking for or thinking about at the state level to advocate for? Well, thanks for that question, Robert. Um, every year our board leaves Anchorage headquarters and we travel to another community to hear about what the challenges are. And just a month ago, we were in Valdez. The conversation is very similar to that that's been taking place here over the last couple of days. So I, I wouldn't say that we have a specific ask, but I would invite all of you to keep us informed about what your needs are, because when we're sitting down with Senator Keel and talking about the issues that we're hearing about, it's much more compelling when we talk about what our budget request is to talk about how, if there is funding in the budget, how it may impact his community. And so the more stories like that we can collect, the better and more effective we can be in the conversations that we have. And, and to be fair to Senator Keel and the other legislators, more often than not, it's him saying to us, 
Did you know about, did you hear about this project? There might be an issue. So um, you've got a very strong delegation here who keeps us very well informed of what those priorities are as well. Uh, but the dialogue is certainly important. Excellent. And Jackie, it seems like uh, that's quite a, a, a promising solution set for the Juno market. Uh, do you have a, a particular a goal for other communities looking ahead? Is there anything that we could help support and advocate uh, as we take the, take a look at the next weeks and months ahead? Well, again, I wanna reiterate something that Stacy said. It was, we were really disappointed when the infrastructure funds got taken, the housing element got taken out of the um, infrastructure bill. And, and I don't think this is gonna be the last package that goes through Congress. And I think we need to keep reminding them that housing is critical to our economies and it's critical to our workforce. Um, and so we need to try to get that directed infrastructure back in there. Um, and, but I, you know, so I, I think that that is one of the challenges. Um, I, I really think that we just have to be very creative in how we are approaching situations and be open to a number of options a number of the federal programs that we've been able to get access to seem to always have some tweaking or some limitations given Alaska's unique con considerations. And I know we always say Alaska's uniqueness, but this time when we notice them, we need to immediately let the staffers in our congressional offices know so they can do something about it so that we, we can actually address them in real time too. All right, well, thank you. No, it's, it's, we, when we, highlight the issues it's not because we read something on the internet it's because uh, our membership tells us and especially when we do the 400 well i think it was 440 uh business leaders that responded and said um you know housing's a big deal you know, my 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 business my economic future is at risk because i can't find housing and so the same thing about child care which has not been traditionally a southeast conference issue um, you know, I was at a, at a statewide, I'm not sure if it was, state, it was, national, it was a national, and they were like seeing a very similar trend there. And I think uh, it was one of the odd things they attributed an anecdote uh, uh, about some of the, the corporate leaders. Was they were on Zoom with their employees, and it's like they didn't realize that their employees even had children because, until they saw them in the Zoom, uh, you know, jumping all around them in the back. It's like, oh, you have kids, huh? Well, that's the issue. So, um, that's amazing what Zoom will do for you. But anyway, uh, I want to thank you all for those insights. And it's going to be a regular part of our report card going forward and, uh, and, and our set of priorities. So do keep us posted as we get there. Jackie, thank you for beaming in. Marna and uh, Stacy, thank you so much for, for being part of the panel today. So a round of applause for our housing champions. Thank you. So... Uh, that gives us, we're actually now, now we're we have an extra three minutes we can give to uh, the university and our workforce development panel, which is, we kind of squeeze in the back. So if I could ask all of them to come forward. So Chancellor, if you would uh, come here ready to introduce um, President Pitney and gives you an extra minute or two to, to talk as well. And then Carrie Ann, if you could bring your panel up uh, here. And then that way, um, if we get an extra minute at the end of the of the panels, we can uh, allow for the setup for the for the banquet as well. But uh, you, yeah, yeah, I'm going to give you the, the mic here for for that introduction. Um, and neither one, neither one of these two uh, champions need introduction to Southeast Conference. Chancellor Kerry has been just a stalwart supporter for um, those she serves throughout Southeast and the university system, but also for Southeast Conference. So we really appreciate that, and I think a shout out for what uh, you all have done there for for the Mariculture partnership and the awareness and the conference, it's uh, its all in alignment that really makes it a win-win. So um, is President Pitney online, guys? Do we have her online yet? Okay, so we're, we're a minute or two away. As soon as you see her, because we're a little bit ahead of schedule, uh, do beam her straight in. And you've got the floor to, to, to talk about this jewel of Southeast called the University of Alaska Southeast. What? Chancellor Kerry. Thank you. I am Karen Geary. I am the chancellor at the University of Alaska Southeast. And Robert said such nice things about me, but the reality is, is the work that Robert and Southeast Conference do for the university is incredible. And especially the auction and dinner tonight. And I hope you will all stay and have a great time. It's always, it's a, it's a real highlight of this conference, I think. Um, 
I want to introduce a few people from the university. We've got Pete Traxler over there. He's the executive dean of our technical education center and Priscilla Schulte, who's going to be on this panel, who is our director here in Ketchikan. And then Paul Kraft is our director in Sitka. He needed to take off, but we had great representation here from um, the university. Talking about mariculture, as a part of that part of that 49 million, UAS is going to get just under 4 million to expand our mariculture training programs. And we're hoping to bring, right now we have a great program in Sitka, and we're hoping to bring that program over to Ketchikan as well as start a program in Juneau, because mariculture is, I believe, going to be the future of Alaska. In Ketchikan, we have a great maritime training program. If you don't know about that program, you can certainly talk to Priscilla. Uh, she knows all about maritime training, one ton, two ton, which she and I are learning together as we go. Um, but it's a great program. We were over and saw the simulator the other day, which was really, really fantastic. At our tech center in Juneau, <clears throat> we have done um, tremendous work with Hecla Greens Creek as well as Coor Kensington, and they have been great supporters of the university. We have a new building that's coming online. Our, uh, our It's gonna be a building for our environmental science programs, which will include things in marine biology, um, mariculture, and they have been great supporters of that and they are looking at helping us furnish that building. And then behavioral health was mentioned earlier. We've got a great program, um, an OEC and occupational endorsement at our tech center in behavioral health, which we are really hoping to expand. Um, is Pat on yet? Nope. So at the University of Alaska Southeast, we have been talking about the three C's. Does anybody know what the three C's are? The compact, consolidation, and COVID. And they have had a great impact on us over the last uh, five years, really. But what is really great right now is that our campus is really vibrant. They're so it, It's so great to see everybody back on campus Students are there, faculty are there, staff are there. And it's the first time in about three years where we've all been together and it feels like a campus again. Our numbers are good. We feel really positive about where we're going. And I think depending on how things move forward, if we can maintain the budget that we have right now, we will be able to continue to have stability at the University of Alaska Southeast and across the University of Alaska. I know there are a lot of alumni here in the room, not only from UAS, but across the system. And we are working very closely together, as you heard earlier about our marine policy program. We have a joint fisheries program with UAF, and we are looking at expanding more joint programs across the state because we are a big state. And each of the three campuses and our community campuses have different roles to play. And the more that we can work together, the more we can make sure that our students across the state get that education that they, um, that they really are hoping for. So I am always happy to answer any questions. You can always reach out to me. I am hoping that this is not my last Southeast conference. Um, I am going to be retiring on June 30 of 23, but I plan, if I can, to keep attending Southeast Conference because I get so much out of it and it's so interesting and you meet such great people. So thank you and we'll just wait a minute to see if she's on yet. The demands you guys have, I mean, you're supposed to make everything work magically. So. We heard about the recruitment uh, challenges for workforce. Are you starting to see those numbers pick up or what do you think can be done to, to encourage more applicants to uh, be ready? Well, we're looking at expanding the programs um, and looking at when we can offer those programs. So we know that a lot of people that are in the workforce, they may wanna come and upgrade their skills. How can we offer a program 
you know, on the weekends and have three weekends or some such thing where they can get the skills and the training that they need. We were talking yesterday about looking at doing things like introduction to elect elect to be an electrician because students go people the you know people in in the um, in the electrician field are looking and students come in and they say I want to be an electrician but they don't know anything about about it so if we can do some introductory classes like that at the most basic level and then work with people in the field who would be willing to take these students on in an inter internship kind of experience it would be very beneficial both for businesses and for the university. So trying to look at how we can do things differently than that traditional semester program that we've always offered. Our uh, maritime training program does that with the Coast Guard, very successful program because they can come in, do classes on the weekend, and they can go back out and, and complete the training that they need. Well, thank goodness for Brian Holst and uh, Julie Decker because they did they did most of the work. But that conference was really well attended. We held it in Juneau. We had to keep putting it off because of COVID. But we had people from all over the world at that conference, and we are really looking forward. And I really hope we can do it again because there's so much interest in mariculture, um, especially in Southeast and. Um, going to be talking to Brian about whether we can do that again. I see President Pitney on now. And I will just say that one of the reasons I believe that the University of Alaska has reached a point of stability is thanks to President Pitney. She has brought us together. She's made us stronger. She believes in all three campuses, um, as well as our community campuses. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate her and what she's done for us. So, Pat, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Karen. Sorry, we had a little bit of a technical difficulty. I was signing in from Butrovich 202, and uh, I could, I was on, I could hear all of you and see all of you, but I couldn't get my camera to come on. So I, I've, I've switched to a different. Uh, to a different medium. Um, I'm sorry I, I can't be there. We had our, our foundation, UA Foundation board meeting today. Um, it was, it's always, it's always a good day when you're talking about fundraising and um, our campaign to date has, has uh, raised over $203 million. And so we're we're going to continue going and hope to get to to 250 million here in the next year and a half. The uh, so that that was good news, but we really have a a great group and Brian Holtz, who I think was trying to multitask potentially with all of you, was on our board and he was zooming in. So I appreciate uh, Brian your your involvement on our on our board of or on our foundation board. The, uh, the weather here in Fairbanks is, uh, feels a lot like Ketchikan. So I hope you're getting Fairbanks weather instead. I'm, I know I looked at your agenda and I know you've talked about mariculture and I see the panel that's coming up is gonna be talking about the maritime careers I, I can't tell you how proud I am of Southeast Conference, of the partnership we have with Southeast Conference and with all, all of the communities in Southeast for uh, securing the, the grant, the EDA grant for Mariculture. I look at the one of the slides that was put up, uh, the amount of funding secured for, for us to get maricult that mariculture industry off the ground and running. And 
we, we have the opportunity to get to commercial grade, not to commercial grade, but to scalable uh, industrial mariculture production um, and, and have that as a sustainable industry for Alaska. And you know we're small right now, uh, but there's so many bright, bright spots. There's so many young businesses. I recall the, um, the conference that Karen was talking about, which I, I'm in to do another one. So if, if those, the organizers can do one, maybe, maybe we don't do it this fall, but we do it next fall or ne not this spring, but maybe ne next fall. The average age in that conference room was like 35, maybe 40. You go to any other con conference for any other industry, the average age is 55, 60. Um, this is a young industry. This is young people are in this industry. There is so much energy around it. And, you know, I think about what the Sitka campus is doing on their, their workforce training for the mariculture. I look at what Sea Grant is doing to extend the best practices throughout the state. I look at what the College of Fisheries and Ocean Sciences is doing on the research in terms of uh, the, the different products and the um, and how to, how it grows, how it grows in which waters, how the how how the water affects it. Um, But it's the partnership in this, and the partnership is mature. And so I think it's a model. And I, I, I think at, at our next commercial industry that, that the state is trying to grow, and that is in the area of unmanned flight, the drones, use of drones. Um, just think when we, when we get Alaska as the first state in the nation to be able to have both manned and unmanned aerial, or manned and unmanned planes in the air at the same time, how that opens up so many other industries. And we're, we're We've been working with the state, we've been working with the federal delegation, we've been working with FAA and FCC to work the safety protocols, but also the technology uh, to have drones fly safely alongside um, the um, manned air, air flight. Literally, we can do this in two to three years having Alaska be the first place that drones are able to fly side by side. But imagine now a, a kelp operation that's remote. What if you can get um, food and supplies dropped off by a drone rather than having to have it come in on a float plane? It changes the, the economics of the operation. It changes the efficiency. Uh, up north, we think about it in terms of how do you, what if, how, how would you supply a mining camp? So, where Alaska can go with new industries is is pretty open, but it takes the partnership uh, with the current industries. So the current people in, in the industry, industry, but also the um, with the university and the state agencies. And I think we're, we're finding some alignment there. That's great. And I'm really looking forward to the maritime panel to, to hear uh, some of those, some, some more of those partnerships. Going on to where we're at as, as the university, 
our our enrollment we anticipated it being um down another year and yes it's down but it's only down like two percent and more importantly our new student enrollment is up across the board our number of first-time freshmen entering our university is up and up significantly um, and that bodes well because now we have bigger incoming classes uh, that are counteracting that are counteracting the uh where we we've had bigger graduating classes that, that have gone through uh, more importantly we're we're finding more and more partnerships with individual businesses um, all of us are strained for workers and i've been talking to the board and the, and the foundation board as well, uh, testing the concept. And I'd, I'd be interested in how this room is thinking of this concept. But in the late 70s and early 80s, when we had a serious workforce shortage, the state used, used the university and leveraged the university to attract students to come as students and then had a, a loan payback arrangement if they stayed up to five years post-graduation. By the time somebody stayed in Alaska five years after graduation, they've kind of made it home. And I don't know if any of you in the room hey, came back on that, uh, that loan, loan payback in the, in the late 80s, the last the last year they did it was in 89. Um, but I think we can leverage the university and attract more people from out of state because the, the fact is our, our demographics aren't working in our favor. We have a much smaller working age population, 30,000 fewer, and we have uh, our high school graduation numbers are going down. We have fewer people in high school than, than we've had in the past. And so I think this is a way that we can um, attract people, but, but they demonstrate that they wanna stay and, and work in Alaska. So I'd be interested in how people feel about that as an incentive, but then we use the university as a leverage point for the workforce that we need. The, um, there are so many different things I wanna talk about and I, I wanna capture just a couple and I'm sure somebody, I'm sure Terry Cothran's in the room and I'm hoping she's had an opportunity to talk about the uh, Yamaha partnership that we did recently and uh, so Yamaha will will provide engines and and a train the trainer so we can do small small engine repair and they'll provide engines at, at their cost so that we can partner and have small engine repair across all of our locations um, that are coastal and they don't even necessarily have to be coastal we could do that in Anchorage and Fairbanks as well but the, the campuses that have been engaged in that partnership are coastal. Those kind of partnerships that link um, that supplier with the university, with the community is, is uh, pretty tremendous. And the other things that industry can do that can help the employers, but also help the university and help the state is number one, talk about the, the graduates you have hired. And, you know, what I get reported to me is Alaskan companies want Alaska graduates. They stay they're well qualified, they're committed to their community. And 
the more employers talk about their UA graduates and, and how they contribute to their, their whole, it helps us. Secondly, as we're going through this workforce shortage, we're going to need to hire people and they may not be totally skilled. Uh, an employer who supports their workers in finishing their degree or uh, adding to, to their degree uh, through the university helps. I think a, th a third way is to have to, to reach out. I've asked everybody in the university system to start reaching out to their community partners, to their employer partners, and understanding their needs. I would ask the employers to do the same thing. Reach into the university. Uh, find, find the class that is the most likely to be the class that aligns to your work and go talk to that faculty. Uh, find out how many students are coming through. Find out how you can connect to those students. If you don't get a, a responsive answer the first time, go ask a different person. Um, the more we connect at the individual level, the the faster we're going to create these partnerships, the more aligned our curriculum is going to be with your employer needs. Um, so I'll just say again, thank you for, in, for supporting the university. And uh, I am so excited about the auction that's coming up and the, and the, uh, the scholarship fundraiser dinner. I, I wish I was there. I was there last year at the Haynes one and it is fun. And uh, so please enjoy yourself tonight. Please remember that the students today are your employees tomorrow. And with that, I can uh, follow up with any burning question or turn it over to, to the panel that you have coming up next. Excellent. Thank you so much, President Pending. You know, I think that uh, interaction with the uh, private sector is, is uh, excellent. And I think that perhaps maybe next spring when we revisit our business climate survey, that might be a question we can slide in there to also help reinforce those communications, see what's being sought, maybe from their mind, what might, what might be missed. Um, just real briefly, can you uh, comment on the future of mariculture and the educational track, especially if it's... Uh, is woven into the, the Southeast campus structure. You know, I'm hoping Joel is there from Sitka. Oh, we've got Priscilla here. Pr Priscilla's there from Ketchikan. Um, so on the Mariculture track, the uh, there are a number of faculty being hired. Um, that range from uh, instructional courses. We, all, we will leverage our existing maritime courses and add to them as needed. Um, we also have faculty coming in on the Sea Grant program and the, the Sea Grant program is, is that public service mission of the university. So we're taking what's happening in the research labs and what's happening in the instructional labs and taking it directly out um, either through workshops or through one-on-one -on -one engagement with um, people who have their, uh, you know, have a mariculture operation going on. And so I think the big thing is it's, it's expanding faculty capacity uh, in, in all three of those areas, the, the, the uh, Marine Advisory Program, the instructional side, and I, a lot of that's happening in Sitka, but it's also gonna be happening in, in Juneau. And um, Karen, when Karen Carey and I were talking the other day, she said, I think we need to do something in Ketchikan as well. And then uh, lastly is the, uh, the, the research side, 
how do we how do we get the most out of what we're growing all right well thank you and i totally concur with chancellor Kerry's remarks of uh, your leadership and being such a light uh, for the university system, bringing them out of a dark, dark place and uh, providing stability and a, and a, and a bright, brighter future. So thank you one more time for President Pat Pitney. Thanks for having me. So to round out the day, we don't, again, if we told you, we'd spend the whole time talking about the, the depth on this bench, but we wanted to show the, the complementary side of the workforce development and some of the resources so that some of these faces like Carrie Ann's that we see on, on a regular basis, you get to know a little more personally so we can network, understand the resources that they bring forward and access those and, uh, and make that this just a, an introduction to a much uh, a larger conversation later. So Carrie Ann is gonna facilitate this conversation, these introductions, and I just turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. So I was looking at my notes here and I realized that the first line of my notes makes it sound like I'm opening on a joke. So Julie Decker, Doug Ward, and Chris Neuros walk into my office. <laughs> um, but seriously, like about eight years ago, those three came to see me in Anchorage uh, and talked to me about uh, the maritime workforce development uh, issues that they had seen and identified when they put in the work to develop the maritime workforce development plan for Alaska. Um, my organization at that time was called the Alaska Process Industry Careers Consortium, or APEC. We got rid of that. Thank you. <laughs> we are now the Alaska Safety Alliance, so I just kind of wanted bring those dots together and, and kind of explain how the Alaska Safety Alliance is important in workforce development. Our organization was founded uh, as a workforce development agency uh, or, or in a nonprofit of 501c3 uh, for oil and gas, mining, and other process industries. And we've been fairly successful in that task, um, putting together the process tech program that is at, offered at two of the campuses of the university system. And we also manage uh, some health and safety and training for the North Slope and site-specific and operator-specific, owner-specific training for health and safety and environmental. Um, <clears throat> so anyways, these three, they walk into my office and, and, and along with others in the maritime industry, they had put together this workforce development plan. And they came <clears throat> to talk with us uh, about our experience working with industry. And Doug knew me through his service on the Alaska Workforce Investment Board. Uh, and they came to talk, how can we join forces with an organization like APEC that um, was having some success as being an industry-driven workforce development organization. Uh, so in 2019, as I mentioned, APEC was renamed the Alaska Safety Alliance. And though our name has changed, the organization's main purpose is industry-driven workforce development. And our mission is to ensure the availability of a highly trained workforce sufficient to staff Alaska's industries, all Alaska's industries, safely and competitively now and in the future. We work closely with all of the training providers that you see up here and that have talked uh, earlier today. Um, and we do that to try and connect our industry members. So we are a member-based organization and industry members in oil, gas, mining, maritime, and construction make up our membership. Um, and so we, we like to connect those pieces together. And I'm gonna kind of switch a little bit my tone now that you have a little bit of the history and talk, we talk a lot about partnerships. We've heard the word partnership and partners a lot today. Um, and that's very common across workforce development. And recently initiatives like the Good Jobs Challenge and Build Back Better have created an even greater need to work collaboratively and are encouraging that we expand upon these existing collaborative relationships. Um, here at Southeast Conference, we've heard the same message across the board from all industries, and that is we have a worker shortage. Um, that these, for years, we've known that, we've been in business for 25 years, we know if there's a worker shortage, that there's, there's a, a ready trained workforce issue in our state, um, and we're working to help fix that to be part of that solution. Um, so for, for years, you know, we've been hearing that and now we're struggling um, with greater worker shortages and it's gonna get exacerbated by all of these projects that are coming to light uh, with the infrastructure bill. 
So long before these incredible opportunities that have been come out of um, the, the issues that we had with the pandemic, uh, Alaska's education and training providers and been working with nonprofits in the state of Alaska, I see Kyla's over there, um, to, and organizations like ASA uh, have come together to have these partnerships and train Alaskans. These established partnerships are sharing resources like instructors and curricula, uh, identifying the unique capabilities of each individual training partner uh, and what that partner brings to the table, and to develop and deliver quality training programs to Alaskans to support Alaska's critical industries, including the maritime sector, which is the focus of this panel today. And I'm very pleased to join our partners in this initiative and to have this opportunity to share with you all the great work that they're doing to train Alaska's maritime workforce. And <clears throat> I'm gonna ask our, our panel some questions. And the first one is, how are you collaborating to address Alaska's maritime training needs? And how did the partnership between Abtech and UAS come together? It's my cue. I'm Kathy LeCompte. I know many of you because I spent 11 years here in Ketchikan as the uh, campus director for part of that time in faculty at UAS Ketchikan and did some time in Anchorage at UAA and in 2016 landed at Avtech. Avtech is the Alaska Vocational Technical Center. It is a division of the Department of Labor and Workforce Development. And as such, we are owned and operated by the state of Alaska. So I like to say that Avtech is your training center. We offer a variety of trainings, um, 90 and 100 day, 80 day immersive training, but we are, um, and you can go to our avtech.edu and see all those. Um, in the interest of time, I wanna jump right into when I landed at Avtech in 2016, um, where the uh, home of the Alaska Maritime Training Center is, I was delighted to learn that we were working with UAS Ketchikan. Um, I was very happy because then I could come back to my roots because uh, I consider Ketchikan my Alaska home. Um, but in 2017, uh, there was some legislation that came about and uh, it was driven in part by the late Congressman Don Young, and it was to create centers of excellence for domestic workforce development in the maritime industry. And it just made sense for Avtech and the Department of Labor to partner with the University of Alaska to create a domestic center of excellence in maritime training. And so we got together and created a charter and started the organization that we lovingly call AMEC or the Alaska Maritime Education Consortium. And our focus is on the MOSI section of the, of the uh, Workforce Development Plan, which is the Marine Occupations and Support Industries. And our charter has a mission to collaborate um, to prepare Alaskans for a float and a shore careers that will support and strengthen the maritime workforce. And we do that by increasing awareness, access to a shore and a float careers. And by combining those efforts, we hope to provide training across Alaska. And I'm gonna let Priscilla tell you a little bit about how Avtech and UAS came to be partners. Okay, well, thank you. My name is Priscilla Schulte. I'm the director of the Ketchikan campus, and I'm looking right at Doug Ward, and I remember when I became campus director, and he's going, why is a professor of anthropology becoming a campus director? And Doug said at the time, because she can listen. I've, I've listened a lot, and I've learned a lot more about maritime and Coast Guard approvals than I ever even knew existed. But beginning with the partnership at Abtech, one of the first questions I would get is why do we need two maritime centers? And I saw right off, well, first of all, we've heard over and over today that Alaska is a huge state, but we also do different things. I also found out that there was some cooperation that already existed, as Kathy mentioned. We have a DAVIT, and that's I found out the structure where we raise and lower lifeboats as part of the training. Well, after the Davit was built, we didn't have a lifeboat that fit the Davit. And so apparently somebody from Ketchikan talked to somebody at Avtech and we got a lifeboat that fit the Davit. But our partnership has really built many, many, much more since that time. 
And one of the things I've also learned is in Coast Guard approved training, and Mike Labarge will talk more about that, there's a requirement to have a number, a certain number of instructors per student for a particular event, whether it's in the life, if, whether it's in the fire field or if we're at the pool. Well, sometimes we don't have enough instructors. So we can call Avtech and they'll send us some ins an instructor to assist for that activity. That might only be a four or five day class, but we can also send an instructor to Avtech. So sharing instructors has been a wonderful way for us to be able to do more, more efficiently, and serve the people in whatever locality they might be. Same thing with curriculum, Coast Guard approved curriculum. We're able to share curriculum. Um, and I also began to realize the connection between things. And I also would like to have Mike Labarge talk about our full bridge simulator. But it became clear to me that we needed to do more for this area, particularly the kinds of things we could do with our simulator. And I saw this season when we had cruise ships back that the pilots need to use a simulator to upgrade and keep their licenses. And so when I see the cruise ships coming in, that's part of the piece that we can help by having a simulator local that they can go in and use. I could go on and on about the partnership between Avtech and the UAS Ketchikan campus, but I, it, it has really helped to energize the faculty, they can call each other up, they can get ideas. So it's, it shows what we can do when we really uh, share our resources. And one more thing I wanted to mention, thanks Priscilla, I um, enjoyed, I've worked with Priscilla when I was here and working with her again, and it's just been a lot of fun to do that. I just wanted to say, say two things that I, had, that I left out of my comments. With our partnership um, and in this legislation, it identified specifically maritime training centers and community and technical colleges. And so it was a good fit for us to join forces and create this charter and create AMAC and apply for status as a domestic center of excellence, which we were awarded and recognized in 2021 as the center of excellence for domestic maritime workforce training and education. And we are in the process of reapplying for that status again. Now, when we first heard about it, there was resources attached to it, but the resources have yet to materialize. But that doesn't matter because just the fact that we can work together and figure out how to work together, resources are always nice. But when you work together, you can make things happen, whether you have a lot of resources or not. And again, resources are nice. I'm not saying I don't need we don't need resources, but it's been really great to work together again. And we have an action agenda that goes through 2025. And in that action agenda, you can read about, and you can Google it or see it on the ASA website. You can read about what our plans are and it's to expand across Alaska. It, you heard President Pitney talk about the Yamaha training. We're in the, in the beginning stages of figuring out how we can get as much of that training out as possible possible. There are 13 dealerships across the state of Alaska, and a lot of folks have those types of engines. And so stay tuned for more partnerships and more good things to happen between the university and Avtech. Thanks, Kathy. Hmm. So what is the value of having instructors working together across the training institutions? And specifically, how does that benefit your organization, your programs, and your students? Yeah, so I'll, uh, I'll take that. You heard a little bit about it uh, from Priscilla Schulte. Uh, my name is Michael Barge. I'm one of the uh, faculty members in the Maritime Transportation Department uh, here at UAS Ketchikan. And in fact, uh, the reason that I'm late to getting to the table is because I was sitting in the full Mission Bridge uh, ship simulator with a couple of pilots and training pilots uh, right up to the very last minute, providing them with training on mooring and unmooring uh, cargo ships. Um, as well as uh, docking local cruise ships here. So, uh, you know, the collaboration that we have with Avtech, with other vocational technical providers, you know, really benefits our student base um, because we're able to send instructors to remote communities, remote locations, uh, and house them there and teach our curriculum, teach those Coast Guard approved courses um, in the communities uh, that those people are going to be serving. 
And sometimes those are pretty remote places. It's also sometimes not cost effective to bring all of our students to our facility. Uh, much easier to send one instructor, say to Sitka, which is where I'm headed on Sunday to teach a captain's class uh, for a couple of weeks than it is to bring um, the entirety of that student body um, here to catch a can, house them, feed them, so on and so forth. Um, being able to share curriculum, being able to collaborate, being able to share ideas with other maritime instructors is, is incredibly valuable because we have a depth of experience um, that we can then bring to our students. So I'm a limited tonnage um, person. I came from work boats, from tour boats, and I regularly collaborate with people that have sailed you know, deep sea um, on large vessels. And having that experience available to me and knowing how to serve that type of mariner uh, really you know, provides a uh, service to our students that's unparalleled uh, without that type of collaboration. Um, Priscilla wanted me to mention just kind of a little bit about the Class A simulator. We have one of um, two simulation facilities in the state of Alaska, the other one being uh, housed at Avtech. Um, if you think of this full mission bridge simulator, it's a, uh, everyone's sort of familiar with flight simulators. It's a flight simulator for ships. Um, we can simulate everything from a cruise ship to a Lund skiff. Um, we can put people anywhere in the waterways of Alaska or anywhere um, around the world, give them different situations to handle um, before they have to encounter it right in the real world. Um, and because this facility is incredibly expensive to install and maintain, we're also able to collaborate with other instructors um, from across the state, have them come to our facility, um, teach courses, run simulations for, uh, for various folks, whether that's tugboaters, sea pilots, uh, commercial fishermen, and so forth. Um, so really the collaboration um, with other training providers is, uh, is about our students and about the communities that we serve. And that's where the value is. And Chaz, did you want to? Thank you. First of all, I'd like to say it's great to be back at Southeast Conference. I, years ago, I was on the board of Southeast Conference and good to see some Alaska Workforce Investment Board uh, members as well sat on that board uh, 10 years ago. My name is Charles Edwardson. I am from Ketchikan. Uh, I'll address the question, but I just, uh, you gave me the mic, so I'm going to go for it. I do have <laughs> uh, collaboration. I really appreciate that aspect of it. And in fact, the first call I made was to Priscilla. I was a adjunct faculty member. I taught construction technology, kind of evolved into workforce development. Uh, for our small regional training center, I'll give you a little background. Uh, Prince of Wales Island, you guys are all familiar with Prince of Wales. We have a vocational training center out there. It's a small regional training center and the, the partnerships that we've been talking about are essential. We have a very limited budget. A workforce development is hard. A lot of us are in it because it's what we love to do. It's not for the money. The region that we have all heard is uh, very short on workers. We, have, we all have our theories on that. I will go back to a couple of notes uh, and I'll take about eight minutes. So you guys, uh, the labor shortage that we are now experiencing was predicted. It was predicted about uh, 14 years ago by the Department of Labor. It was called the aging of the workforce at that time. It was foretold uh, by the state, and it was predicted accurately on what professions that we'd be um, uh, short on, and that was the trades. All the trades across the board, we we're going to have uh, the aging of the workforce would be there, and we're now here living in that time. So, at the, the problem is at the same time that we're the prediction of the labor shortage was happening. We all knew it was coming. In the secondary education system in our state, we kind of veered off the CTE and vocational training in our secondary high schools and uh, junior high schools. So until that's addressed, workforce development is going to be a very hard thing to accomplish for Alaskans. So I just wanted to put that out there. We can all work together, but what we have to do actually 
is address it at the secondary level first. Um, so back to your, uh, I do have a couple more notes. A lot of attention has been paid to collaboration and uh, economic development. And I'm a firm believer that economic development really cannot happen without workforce development. Economic development is such a broad issue and every, every profession that we've discussed today needs a workforce. But not a lot of attention is paid uh, to how we're gonna fund the workforce training. Uh, I know the University of Alaska, her full-time job is to get funding. Avtech's full-time job is to get funding. We need help from the state and the federal level to build all this infrastructure, to get, give more of an emphasis on regional training centers, on how we can access funding to help operate the centers. So it's not quite what the question was, but I just wanted to take this opportunity to say that uh, we have a tough road ahead. And if we don't start addressing the workforce needs with true workforce development, with local Alaskans, we're going to miss the boat on economic development. Let's, so, uh, Chaz, I think you kind of ju you jumped ahead on us because we were going to ask that question next, which was, "What are your workforce development challenges?" And then, um, what what is it that you need from your communities, from your state, uh, from employers uh, to be successful in workforce development? And maybe um, if Kathy or, or Priscilla want to address that. Well, if I, I've got the mic now, so just give me a second here, because he said secondary education, and I needed to just jump in and say um, that one of the things that we're trying to push out and into the different regions is a high school class called Introduction to Nautical Skills. He's absolutely right. Secondary school, I heard somebody today say students in, as young as kindergarten start to eliminate what they think may not know what they want to be when they grow up, but they know what they don't want to be when they grow up. Mm -hmm. So we need to get into the secondary school. So our attempt to do that is to offer this introduction to nautical skills. It's a six week course. It's offered via webinar uh, two days a week, or it's offered in a one week intensive. Students learn all about the maritime in, uh, career path. They get to tie knots, they get to work with charts, they understand what it's like to live on a boat. And then when they're done with that, if they're interested, they can either come to Ketchikan and do some basic training, or they can come to Avtech depending on, you know, where they live and what their situation is. But those are the types of things that we need to do a little bit more of. Now, it's, we're a post-secondary provider, but because we have a partnership with the Department of Education for Perkins money, which supports secondary training, we were able to do that. So I needed to jump in on that secondary thing because we're trying our best to make that work. And, and I, I think I'll try and wrap a few things up. Uh, one of the things that really struck me, I'll tell a quick story, is walking down the hall at our Maritime Training Center and a student came up to me and he had just gotten out of our uh, QMED, also known as the Euler class. And he looked at me and he said, Larry changed my life. <laughs> And, you know, it's like, wow. And, and it's that that has really touched me because he found something that was really exciting. This happened to be diesel engines. And uh, I know nothing about diesel engines, but I understood that he saw something that really excited him. And that has been his career. And he's making a good living on the Alaska Marine Highway System as an oiler. But it's expensive, and those are one of the problems. It's, it's, first of all, finding good instructors. It's usually professionals that we need, somebody who has been in the career and that will take the pay that we pay for faculty, which is not as high as you can make if you're out in whatever business you might be. Um, equipment and maintaining the equipment is expensive. Uh, and we also can, it's a limited capacity. If I have 12 welding booths, I can only have 12 welders at that time or welding students. So the, those are some of the uh, issues that we face. And I know Chaz is going to face that building your program over in uh, Prince of Wales. Uh, so that's, again, why I think we need to help each other out and provide resources when we can. Thanks, Priscilla. 
And I'll just wrap it up because I know we're running a little bit long, but by saying that there are some career uh, informational resources on the alaskasafetyalliance.org website um, that can be used either for in the classroom or just to find um, training at the post-secondary level. Those, they're linked right to it. And so if you need more information about either maritime construction, oil and gas, uh, or other careers, there's lots of materials available there. Thanks for the time, Robert. Sorry, we ran a little long. No, good stuff. <laughs> um, come on. So um, we do have to move along. So um, if you have a question, tackle them after we um, take off here. Um, I recommended that tourism be a curriculum with the UOA, and I heard nothing back. I sent all the way up to the chancellor and then Ms. Schultz. This is something that everybody has said in this city and Southeast tourism needs to be a subject taught in the university. And, and just a quick response it is being developed through UAS and Juno. All right. So the good news is. The buses will be circulating. So if you need to make a, a quick trip back to your hotel, great. Um, you have an opportunity to volunteer. If you're here more than 11 minutes, which is what the time you have to clear the room, then you can volunteer to help uh, set up so that the beverage stations are functional at six. Food will be served at 6.30. And one of the new auction items is gonna be a mysterious pair of earbuds that are contained within this case, unless the rightful owner comes and describes them to me Thanks, everyone. See you shortly. <laughs>